To anyone who is seeing this series for the first time, this is not going to be an AI voice placed over a still image. All these hours of video are fully voiced and edited to the best of my ability with images and clips and music and attempts at voices and sometimes sound effects. The first part is definitely not that well edited, but everything after the first 10 to 15 minutes of the video is of much higher quality, I can assure you. And this series did span over a year, so I would like to think it gets better over time. Also, just a heads up, I actually remade the second part of the series after the series was already over because of some problems the original part 2 had. So beware, there will be some inconsistencies between the new part 2 and the rest of the series, mainly whenever anybody brings up Orochi, but these instances are quite few and minor. The new part 2 is also a bit more on the fanfiction-y side due to me wanting to make it more interesting than it previously was, but hey, all what-ifs are fanfiction at the end of the day. But, with all that being said, this is my love letter to Boros and One Punch Man as a whole, and the culmination of over a year's worth of work. So sit back, relax, grab some popcorn, and enjoy the show. Hello everyone and welcome to another random video on the internet. Today we'll be looking at a scenario that I personally find very intriguing. Now some of you may have rolled your eyes when you saw the title of this video and I don't blame you, Boros turning good is a pretty outlandish scenario. When would he? Why would he? But hear me out on this one. It's not as unlikely as you think. With only a couple seemingly pretty small changes, I think the scenario can be realized without seeming too unrealistic. First of all, let's establish the point in time that this could happen. I feel like the best and pretty much only time Boros could convert is when Saitama serious punches him and they have their conversation. In this timeline, let's say that Saitama puts just a little bit less effort into his punch. Enough not to kill Boros, but still seriously wound him and deflect the collapsing Star Roaring Cannon. Or maybe Saitama punches a little to the left or to the right, so Boros doesn't get hit with the shockwave head on, but instead just gets grazed by it. It's not that Saitama doesn't want to kill Boros or anything, but it's just that he misses slightly or thinks that he needs less force to kill Boros than he actually does. Either way, Boros survives with great damage sustained. He and Saitama have the same talk that they did in the original. Boros declares that Saitama is too strong, however this time, knowing that he's going to regenerate soon, Boros asks Saitama a question. Do you think, given enough time, I could ever catch up to you? I don't know, but I do have some advice. If you want to have fun, you shouldn't get any stronger. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. You're the only satisfying opponent I've found in decades. Say, are there any more people like you on this planet? Ones who would be fun to fight? As far as I can tell, I'm the strongest one here. Every monster I encounter dies in one hit, even the biggest ones. You're the first to survive a punch. Although I haven't faced any heroes, maybe some of them might be strong? Heroes, monsters, seems this world might have something to offer. Maybe you just haven't run into some of the stronger foes here. Maybe. Say, if you're not planning on killing me, would you mind if I stayed on this planet for a while? I have nowhere else to go seeing as you destroyed my ship. Saitama tilts his head and thinks for a moment. As long as you don't go around destroying stuff, I don't see a problem with that. Just don't make me punch you again. Now, I know this might sound a bit forced and unnatural, but Saitama is a very laid-back guy. He genuinely doesn't register dangerous individuals as a threat a lot of the time. I'm pretty sure that if Boros promised to live peacefully, he wouldn't have many problems with it. But surely an alien monster like Boros walking around in a populated city would be considered a threat by the Hero Association, right? 
Well, there just so happens to be a certain abandoned city that only Saitama and Genos live in. It's already considered to be overrun by monsters and adding one more wouldn't raise anyone's suspicions. The problem is getting Boros there without having any of the S-Class heroes present notice him. But I feel like if Saitama just pointed Boros in the direction of Z-City, he could just jump there from the top of his ship. It's certainly within his capability and the S-Class didn't notice the collapsing star roaring cannon going off, so I'm 100% certain that a simple jump wouldn't be noticed either. I feel like Boros might want to just come down and fight the S-Class right away, but at the same time, he's already just had a satisfying battle and the S-Class finding out about his presence on Earth immediately would complicate things a bit. So let's just say that Boros retreats to Z-City while Saitama goes to get Genos. Their interactions with Tatsumaki remain the same. Meanwhile, Boros arrives at Z-City and starts looking around. Everything on Earth and I mean everything, would be completely new to him. The architecture, the streets, the interiors. One thing to remember is that Boros is 2.4 meters tall, so he'd almost be a giant in human society. All the doors would be too short for him, all the beds, all the tables, the chairs would collapse from his weight when he tries to sit on them, plates would break upon even the slightest touch of his fingers, He'd accidentally pull off plenty of door handles while trying to enter any building and so on. What would make this even worse is that his armor is broken and as far as we know he doesn't have a spare, or at least not anymore now that his ship's been destroyed. So all this time, Boros would be in his released form. Imagine released Boros radiating lightning and energy trying to stay in a normal human apartment. Boros spends a couple hours looking around and trying to adjust his power, which is extremely hard without his armor. Saitama and Genos then arrive and the Caped Baldi introduces Demon Cyborg and the Dominator of the Universe to each other. Genos would of course be concerned about this, but we see numerous times that he wholeheartedly believes that everything Saitama does is the optimal course of action. Genos might be on guard, but he wouldn't attack Boros or anything like that, and Boros would probably be a little interested in the level of technology on this planet now after seeing Genos. We also see that Boros has the capability to judge a person's power by looking at them. I think Saitama was just like above his sensory capabilities, so that's why he couldn't sense a limit to his power, but otherwise he should be able to evaluate most characters in the show somewhat accurately. So he'd probably see that Genos is pretty powerful and has potential to grow a lot stronger and know that in the back of his head. After the introductions are over, one of two things could happen. One, they all just go hang out in Saitama's apartment, which Saitama wouldn't like at all since Boros would destroy everything on accident. And two, Genos might actually challenge Boros to a fight. I imagine Saitama would have told Genos that Boros survived a few punches from him and is the strongest person he's ever encountered. And we know Genos never passes up an opportunity to test himself and see where he's at compared to his master. And Boros is not going to turn that offer down. I feel like the chances of this part happening are pretty great, so let's make it happen. Genos takes Boros and Saitama to the wasteland where he fought Saitama originally and the fight begins. Boros tells Genos to attack him, wanting to see what level the cyborg is at to know how much power to use. The following battle is similar to Genos' par with Saitama, except Boros pretty much never dodges and always takes everything Genos throws at him head on. He tanks through all of Genos' punches, kicks and beams. The fight ends with Boros one-punching the cyborg. Since it's super hard for Boros to control his power apparently, he probably deals significant damage to Genos' body, somewhat akin to what Goketsu did to him. Maybe even a little worse. This means that Genos gets his start of Season 2 or G4 as some people refer to it upgrade sooner than in the original because his current body isn't capable of functioning anymore. Kuseno probably makes Genos more powerful than he was at the start of Season 2 because of the extra data that would have been gathered during the Boros fight. He might be on par with his post-Goketsu self at the start of Season 2, so he's considerably stronger as stated by Kuseno himself in the original. 
After this, Boros would try to get adjusted to life on Earth, attempting to suppress his power, learn to use human equipment, and so on. Luckily, he has plenty of abandoned buildings to practice in. A few dozen apartments later, he might be able to adapt. Maybe. Boros also soon learns of the hero ranks and the threat levels, probably from Genos. Another thing I want to cover is the VGS, Virtual Genocide System. For those of you who don't know, in an audiobook, Dr. Kuseno creates a headset that can simulate battles between the wearer and the monster data stored in the VGS. Genos receives this headset before Season 2 and trains with it, even inviting some heroes to join him as well. I'm not going to go over the entire plot of the story here, so if you don't know about it, I suggest checking out a video explaining it before continuing with this video. I'll give you 5 seconds to pause this video and do that. Okay, so now that everyone's on the same page, I'm pretty sure you know where this is going. Genos will upload released Boros into the simulation since he's fought him. Though this simulated Boros is going to be a lot weaker than real Boros, because Boros held back against Genos in their fight. So, after Darkshine defeats Carnage Kabuto with high difficulty, he asks if Genos has any other monsters for him to fight. And Genos' answer is a resounding yes. He uploads Boros into the system and Darkshine bumps his fists together, ready for another bout. Now, normally I would say that released Boros annihilates Darkshine, but this is a suppressed Boros who didn't even kill Genos in a single punch, so the fight is fierce. A rushdown brawler fighter versus an unstoppable tank. I believe Darkshine would win this one, but only because Boros was massively suppressed against Genos. The fight is vicious, with Darkshine having the clear power and durability advantage, but Boros' speed, relentless attacks, regeneration, energy blasts, and ferocity make the battle last a long time. Eventually, Darkshine is able to pull out the victory. He's satisfied with the fight. If only he could fight a monster like that in the real world. Genos considers telling him about the real Boros, knowing that the alien would definitely enjoy this as well, but without Saitama's permission, he doesn't say anything. Other than that, the VGS continues like it did originally. He might try to give the headset to Boros, but I feel like he would try to give it to Saitama first, and then Saitama would just break it. Now the question is, what happens next? Well, Boros very quickly gets bored of laying low. He runs into wolf and tiger level monsters occasionally, but they don't interest him at all and he kills them with utter ease. Though I feel like Boros might try asking them where they come from and if there's any strong monsters around. Eventually, he's bound to run into a member of the Monster Association. Let's say he spots Awakened Cockroach at some point and approaches him. The bug, thinking that Boros is a monster who hates heroes like any other monster, tells him about the Monster Association. About how they are planning a war with the Hero Association, how they have several threat level dragon cadres, and how Orochi is supposedly the strongest monster on Earth. Hearing all of this, Boros becomes excited, but keeps his cool and smirks. So, this Monster Association is essentially the gathering of all the strongest monsters this planet has to offer, right? Weird phrasing, but essentially. Very well then. Take me to your leader. Boros follows Awakened Cockroach to the Monster Association hideout. Along the way, he sees many monsters and gauges their power. Just small fries for the most part. Though he walks past a few decently strong monsters too. At least by Earth standards. Pure Blood, Senior Centipede, Royal Ripper, Bug God. All of the monsters look at Boros with a curious expression. They can tell by his appearance, by the way he carries himself, by the power radiating from his body. This guy is new here, and he isn't like any other normal monster. They decide to follow him to the main room, curious to see how things will go. Once the Bugman and the Dominator of the Universe enter the main room, the alien gets his first look at the main attraction. The Monster King Orochi. 
a creepy looking giant. He smirks to himself and looks around, seeing many monsters, hundreds of them in fact, but a few immediately get his attention. A tall, ugly looking humanoid, a ball like monster with a giant gaping mouth eating the remains of what appears to be another monster. A small, black, mean-faced guy with a weird appendage on his head. A cat-like humanoid. A seemingly normal-looking human radiating a strange energy. A very big, four-eyed humanoid monster. A giant hound that looks like it came from the depths of hell. A big, fleshy, one-eyed creature. And of course, the towering monster king. Boros can also vaguely make out another presence, and a massive one at that. But he can't see it for now, so he focuses his attention on the monsters already before him. What do we have here? Awakened cockroach, have you brought us a new recruit? I have indeed. This one seems to have potential. Giragura fixes her attention on Boros. She can tell that this monster is strong far above most of the association. She estimates him to be a threat level dragon, and a strong one too. Well then, what are you waiting for? Introduce yourself, new guy. Boros takes a step toward Gyoro Gyoro and Orochi. My name is Boros. I once led a band of thieves known as the Dark Matter, and I arrived to this earth from outer space. I am the man behind Sidier's destruction. The monsters start whispering among themselves. Of course they know what happened in Sidier. Due to the power radiating from the alien, the monsters take his claim seriously, even the cadres. At least, most of them do. Awakened Cockroach bursts out laughing. If you're truly who you say you are, what would such a powerful monster be doing hanging around in an abandoned city without purpose? You come in here acting like the boss, despite never having proven yourself once. You didn't even kill a single S-Class hero when you attacked City A. Not to mention that all the monsters who were there were listed in the Hero Association datebooks, and you were nowhere to be found. Did you just hide away somewhere while your crew was getting slaughtered? Boros flicks a finger in the direction of Awakened Cockroach, and the generated shockwave blows his head clean off. What an annoying bug. Some of the monsters are left speechless, but the cadres and some of the stronger demons are still confident and look down on the visitor. Some start shouting at Boros. Quiet down, all of you. I need to have a chat with our new guest. A chat? About what exactly? We are planning to go to war with the Hero Association, and we currently have approximately 500 soldiers in the ranks of our organization. There's a similar number of heroes employed by the Hero Association. We have the edge necessary to emerge victorious as we are now. However, we could still use more fighting power, just to be completely safe. Seems like you are quite strong, Boros. By my estimation and the speed and power you've just showcased, you are a clear threat level dragon. I would like you to become a Monster Association executive. An executive right off the bat? Sure seems like you're playing favorites. He's strong and he's looking for revenge against the heroes. Boros here is the perfect candidate for an executive position. The alien smirks. Who said anything about revenge? Excuse me? I don't care about the conflict between heroes and monsters in the slightest. I don't give a crap about revenge either. All I want is to have an exciting battle. And I have been informed that all of the strongest monsters this planet has to offer have all gathered up right here. Served in front of me on a silver platter. Gyoroguro's eye narrows. She doesn't like where this is going. What are you implying? Isn't it obvious? All 500 of you and me, right here, right now. Boros lunges at the nearest monster, that being Bug God, and kills him with a single punch. 
immediately following the first hit up with a second one, aimed at Royal Ripper. The psychopathic monster tries to defend himself, but before he can even raise his arms, his top half is disintegrated by the punch. Gyorogyoro realizes that there's no reasoning with the alien, and orders all the monsters present to kill him. With pleasure! Your ugly shouts as he jumps down from the stands, followed by gums and dozens of other monsters. Boros welcomes the challenge with a smirk. Come at me! All of you! Fear Ugly goes in for a face-caving punch, and Boros responds with a punch of his own. Their fists collide, and Fear Ugly looks on in shock as Boros's hand smashes straight through his own arm, crumbling the bones and tearing the flesh. With a single attack, Boros blows off the Ugman's arm. Ugly screams out in pain as Boros slaughters the monsters around him. Gums tries to swallow the alien whole, but he's not nearly fast enough. Boros evades his jaws and gets under the creature. He places a hand on the cadre's lower jaw and rockets it upward, smashing the lower jaw into the upper so hard that Gums' teeth pulverize into dust. All the monsters are surprised, some shocked even. Two cadres humiliated with one blow each. All the demon level monsters and below start retreating. Except for a couple. Pure Blood and Rhino Wrestler step up to fight. Gyro Gyro looks over to Orochi. If this goes on, we will lose a significant amount of fighting power before our war with the Hero Association can even begin. Something has to be done. Enough of this. Everyone retreat. We cannot afford to lose fighting power before even engaging the heroes. I'll take care of this personally. The big boss steps up to fight already. Orochi looks at Boros with a gleeful expression and thinks to himself. I can feel it with every single monster cell inside me. This man is the perfect sacrifice for my resurrection. Boros, I am pleased to meet you. I would like to have a word with you, but not here. As he says those words, a few of Orochi's horns rocket out of the ground around Boros, who just stands there and lets it happen for now, wanting to see where things will go. The Monster King's appendages shatter the ground beneath the alien and he falls down to a lower floor of the Monster Association's base. The horns break through that floor's ground and Boros falls deeper. This continues for dozens of floors. Orochi gets up from his usual spot and makes his way down to Boros's location, making sure to block the pathways he's just made after he passes through them. He wants this talk to be private. I shall lead you inside. Soon, the two beasts fall into a cavern full of molten lava. Boros ends up splashing into the burning hot liquid, but shrugs it off. He's been through worse on his home planet. If anything, this is a nice and warm bath for the alien. He steps out feeling a little refreshed and sort of nostalgic. This place reminds him of home. Boros looks around and sees some ancient ruins. He's confused but also intrigued. Seems like molten rock doesn't affect you in the slightest. I would expect nothing less from you. Welcome to the stage of my resurrection. What is all this? Some sort of ancient ruins? And what's this resurrection you speak of? This is an ancient shrine I discovered. Only I am aware of this place. I see. Before we fight, tell me your name. I want to hear your story before I crush you. Very well. But in exchange, you must tell me yours first. <laughs> Fine. Allow me to introduce myself properly then. I am Boros, dominator of the universe. I come from a planet with the harshest environment ever discovered in any galaxy in our universe. 
My species has evolved over thousands of years to reach the pinnacle of human beings. I, in particular, possess recovery, physical ability, and latent energy that far surpasses any other. I used my power to conquer planets one after another. I fought many opponents along the way. Heroes who've slain great evils. Villains who've made their schemes a reality by using overwhelming power. Famed assassins who had never failed to hit a target before. Unmatched champions from numerous worlds. However, none of them could challenge me. No one in the universe was left to face me. My power had come with a price. Soon, I came to know the torment of insufferable, all-encompassing boredom. But then, a great seer said that I could enjoy a challenging fight on this planet. That was over 20 years ago. It took time to get here. But it was worth it. On this Earth, I found foes more exciting and powerful than on any other planet. And I believe you are one of them. So I'm hoping you excite me. Give stimulation to my existence. That is what I came here for. Orochi's horrifying smirk grows wider and wider as Boros explains his story. He's becoming more and more certain that this alien before him is the worthy sacrifice the ancient ruins refer to. A fascinating tale indeed. I am the Monster King, Orochi. I used to be a normal human, but under Guru Guru's tutelage, I was selected from the strongest to be put through extensive fusion, experiments, and battle testing. I overcame death many times. All of this led to my unconventional growth into a monster. Through sacrifices, I became powerful. However, eventually, the sacrifices my master had to offer were not enough to satisfy me. One day, I instinctively began venturing further into the Earth's depths in an attempt to drain energy from the deepest parts of the planet. I found this place seemingly by accident at first, Though I would soon learn that it was fate that had led me here. These ancient ruins have been here for centuries. And yet, the monster depicted on the mural looked exactly like me. Even more mysteriously, though the ancient text should have been indecipherable to me, I was somehow able to read it. Crossing the vast expanse of time, our God shall resurrect on this earth when, on this altar, a worthy sacrifice is offered. I was awakened to heaven's will. I, who had changed into a monster through experiments, was actually destined to become a god. Since then, I have put up a front of obeying Yorogyoro while I slaughter sacrifices. Searching for this so-called worthy sacrifice. Until today, that is. Fate has led you all the way here to be my sacrifice. Now fight me like all the other battle trials and offer me your flesh. I shall give you the fight you are seeking. And in exchange, you shall begin my resurrection ceremony. As he shouts these words, Orochi's body morphs into a truly monstrous creature. Numerous dragon heads come flying at Boros, who smirks and lunges right at them. Let the battle begin! He exclaims and punches the dragon heads one by one, making them explode. Orochi responds by attacking Boros while he's in midair with dozens of dragon heads on all sides. The alien avoids them by using the heads themselves as footholds. He darts around the air, kicking and springing off of the appendages, but when he attempts to punch one of them, his fist gets redirected somehow. Unbeknownst to Boros, Orochi has taken part in many battles, some of which were against skilled martial artists such as Goketsu. 
Due to the Monster King's adaptive nature, he has been able to perfectly memorize the techniques of those martial artists and is now applying those skills here. Boros tries to attack again, but again his fist doesn't connect and the dragon head slams into him with its jaws, sending his body crashing into the rocky wall of the massive cave. The dragon's mouth starts glowing and fires off a massive energy beam at point-blank range. Boros takes it and grips the lower and upper jaws of the head with his fingertips. He then tears both of the jaws off in a brutal fashion and jumps up to avoid a few more beams launched at him by the Monster King. He runs on the wall at great speeds as numerous horns start to keep up and pierce him through, all while dozens of dragons fire off more and more lasers. Boros runs across the cave for a fifth time and changes his tactics. He sprints to the ground into Orochi's feet. The alien attempts to punch one of his legs, but before he can, the monster jumps into the air. His dragon-headed appendages bite into the walls of the cavern and hold him suspended in the air above the giant lake of lava. Dozens of other dragon heads then turn downwards and shoot massive beams and walls of fire that cover the entire bottom half of the cave and inevitably engulf Boros. But the Dominator of the Universe tanks through it all and jumps up at his opponent from below, being hidden by the beams until he gets to one of the dragons. Boros grabs onto the appendage and springs off of it, straight at Orochi's face. The Monster King dodges to the side by using his tentacles, forms a giant fist and launches it at the alien. Boros gets hit directly and is sent flying into the ceiling. Orochi shoots more beams at him, driving him upwards. The monsters above can hear and feel the tremors from the battle, even if they are far from the actual battleground. They wonder what might be happening. Even Psychos is unable to watch this battle. Suddenly, the room gets warmer. Gurugura figures that it's probably just the heat from Orochi's beams and fire attacks. She considers telling the monsters to evacuate just in case, but decides not to. After all, Orochi is her loyal, brainwashed guard dog. He would never do anything that could cause harm to her or her plans. Or so she thinks anyway. Little does she know that Orochi, having found his perfect sacrifice, does not care about anything other than his reincarnation anymore. Meanwhile, Boro smirks in excitement. This is rather fun. The beams may not do any damage to him, but figuring out how to actually hit Orochi is the real puzzle. He flips around and plants his feet firmly on the rock that he's being driven into and jumps off of it, pushing back against the beams and getting back into the cave. Seeing this, Orochi stops his beams before he can drill into the main room of the Monster Association's hideout. I am pleased by your performance so far, but will you be able to keep up when I condense my power? Orochi's body starts morphing again. The tendrils and dragons wrap around each other and form new limbs. Orochi's body condenses into a more humanoid shape, and even more fire starts emitting from his flesh. Boros looks on in amusement, noting how similar this new form Orochi has taken is to his own release date. I see. You've been holding back on me this entire time. Good thing I didn't go all out and kill you from the start, otherwise I would have missed out on this. Above ground, Saitama and Genos feel the tremors. They think it's an earthquake at first, but when the rumbling repeats again and again, they realize it must be something else. Genos suggests going to the sewers to check what's happening underground and Saitama agrees. Back in the underground cavern, the two beasts battle each other fiercely. Boro zips around the cave like a flash of light as Orochi tries to keep him at bay. Boros is physically far stronger, faster and more durable. However, Orochi's many appendages and wide area of effect blasts make him hard to hit. Orochi uses his many powers to keep himself in the battle. Using the various martial arts he's witnessed over his many battles, the Monster King is able to divert Boros's attacks and hit him in many hard to predict and skillful ways. The dragon heads on his tendrils provide Orochi with extra eyes, allowing him to see everything around himself, leaving no blind spots. He drills his horns into walls and attacks his foe from unexpected angles. 
The monster even uses the various laser attacks at his disposal as flashbangs in an attempt to blind Boros. Though he quickly realizes that that particular strategy is ineffective due to the alien's ability to sense energy. Either way, Orochi fights fiercely. The alien charges at the monster king over and over again, but Orochi pulls himself out of the way or knocks his foe back every time. Boros is not taking any damage, but he's not able to deal any damage either. At least, not as he is now. After a while of fighting this skilled and tricky opponent, he eventually gets bored. This isn't a real fight. This is a puzzle to solve. Normally that might interest Boros, as this type of opponent is rare, but when he can just power up and end the battle at any time, there's no stakes involved. Which means no excitement. There's no point in continuing this battle. Boros grunts slightly as he powers up further. The aura around him turns blue and more intense. It spikes up and lightning starts radiating from his body. Orochi takes notice and realizes that now his opponent will have the edge. His physical ability will be enough to make up for any difference in technique. The Monster King realizes he's in a tough spot and can only think of one solution. He begins growing a tail to shoot into the ground, with his plan being to absorb energy directly from the Earth's core and strike his opponent with his ultimate attack, the Gaia Cannon. Let's see how you stand up to this. Orochi declares triumphantly before suddenly feeling a sharp pain in his shoulder. From the corner of his eye, the monster sees a figure charge past him and land on the ledge behind him. A moment later, Orochi's arm is severed from his body and falls into the lava below, making a huge splash. The Monster King's eyes widen as he realizes what happened. Boros must have lunged at him and punched clean through his shoulder. Orochi couldn't even react to his enemy moving. He quickly turns around, visibly shaken. Uh, how? Boros looks up at the creature with a bored look in his eye. So this is the extent of what the supposed Monster King is capable of, huh? How disappointing. I came here looking for a worthy challenger. After the spiel you went on, I was excited to face you. And yet, since the start of this battle, you haven't even scratched me. You're skilled and versatile, but you lack basic power and speed. I had fun at first, witnessing all the tricks you could pull, but I could have ended the fight any time I wanted. I restrained myself, thinking maybe you'd show me something new. Maybe you'd show me something actually threatening. But of course, you provided none of that. And now it's clear that you can't even keep up with me at all. This battle is as good as over. If you have anything else you'd like to show me, go ahead. Hit me with all you've got. And then I'm ending your life. Orochi can't believe what he is hearing. He, the great monster king, isn't a worthy challenger to this alien? It sounds unbelievable. But there's no reason for Boros to lie and he just clearly showed that he does have the power and speed to finish this battle whenever. A realization suddenly hits Orochi. The man behind him has both the intent and the capacity to actually end his life, and that realization awakens something in him. A long-forgotten, primal feeling arises in the Monster King. Fear. Fear for his very existence. Fear that everything he's done up until now, all the trials he went through, all the experiments, all the sacrifices, his goals of rising into godhood, it's all crumbling. All of it meaningless in the face of true terror, in the face of death. Boro sees that internal fear seep onto the monster's face. His expression shifts into one of fear. His eyes no longer hold the murderous glee they once did. Instead, the alien sees the eyes of a scared animal, 
desperately looking for a way to escape a dangerous predator, despite being completely cornered. Boro sighs. You have no idea how many times I've seen this. Proud warriors reduced to pleading, crying messes the moment they realize they're about to die. It's pathetic. The alien takes a few steps toward Orochi. If you have any last words, speak them now. You will not get another chance. He clenches a fist as he says these words. Orochi stares at the alien wide-eyed. This is it. His end is nearing. There's no escape. He's going to die. He's going... to die. That thought flashes in Orochi's mind over and over and over again, consuming his entire being. It edges itself into the monster's mind. His body begins trembling. But not from fear. Orochi is a prodigy nearly on the same level as Garo, capable of mastering advanced techniques at a glance. He is extremely adaptive, having been faced with death many times and having had to evolve to overcome said death just as many times. Having gone through monsterization of the highest degree, Orochi's cells are very unstable and prone to adaptation. Faced with the prospect of death once again. Actual death, not in a controlled, experimental environment that psychos used to create for him to grow. For the first time in his life, Orochi feels genuine terror. For the first time in his life, Orochi is actually about to die. His already adaptive nature is forced to push him beyond the limits of his body once again resulting in explosive growth. The Monster King shakes and twitches. His muscles start pulsing. Boros notices a sudden shift in his aura. He feels intense energy swell up in the monster's body. And then, without warning, Orochi's skin ruptures and explodes. The Monster King is torn apart. A disgusting mass of flesh quickly engulfs the entire cave. Boros is swept up in a repulsive tsunami as it expands further and further, breaking down the walls of the cavern. Above ground, the earth starts trembling. A ginormous earthquake rocks the abandoned Z city to its very core. Stores, apartments, and office buildings all collapse and crumble into tiny pieces. A wave of flesh mixed with various organs, bones, and animal body parts suddenly erupts from the ground and starts spreading through the ruins of the city. Tendrils made up of this revolting mixture wrap themselves around the remains of buildings and muscle tissue floods the streets. Boros explodes onto the scene from below and observes this strange phenomenon as he hops from tendril to tendril, keeping himself on the surface of this disgusting mass. He frowns. The grotesque visual is one thing, but the energy coming from all this flesh. It feels so twisted and repulsive, so dark and empty. Even the heartless alien, who's killed billions in his past, feels a shiver run down his spine at the mere presence of the creature forming around him. Underground, psychos can feel the massive earthquake and wonders what's going on. But as she tries to use her psychic powers to look at everything in the surrounding area, she suddenly realizes that she can't. It's almost like some sort of protective shell has formed around the entire monster association, trapping every single member inside. The walls of this shell are so full of energy that it's disrupting her psychic perception and preventing her from peeking outside. Just what in the world is going on? That is also the exact question that Boros finds himself asking on the surface. What the hell? What happened to Orochi? What is all this? The alien mutters. At the same time, the flesh finally stops erupting from the ground, having flooded almost the entire Z city. A few moments later, dozens of mouths and eyes start forming all around the landscape. 
All the jaws open up simultaneously. A blood-curdling laugh erupts from all directions at the same time. Boros, you are indeed a worthy sacrifice. So worthy that it seems my resurrection began early. I can feel it. My body merging with the terrain around me. This is my true destiny. I shall devour you, the Monster and Hero Associations, along with every other life form on the planet to grow my power. And then, I shall become one with the very Earth itself. Orochi declares, he figures that subconsciously, he must have known this all along. After all, the only reason he found God's mural in the first place was because he instinctively traveled into the depths of the Earth to absorb its energy. Bending the planet to his will has always been Orochi's one true purpose. Now, let the feast begin! A deafening scream comes out of the many mouths at once. The flesh that is covering the entire area begins squirming and twitching. Boro sees this and immediately jumps into the air. Just in time, too, as the ground below him morphs and dozens of tendrils lunge at the alien from below. Boro's eye widens as he realizes these things are way faster than Orochi ever was. The alien expels a surge of energy from his feet and quickly rockets away from the attack. But to his surprise, the tendrils start following him like heat-seeking missiles. At the same time, tens of dragon and snake heads erupt from the flesh in front of him and charge at him, ready to chomp down on the alien. Boro starts ducking and weaving around, maneuvering himself in the air just to barely dodge all the attacks thrown his way. He starts punching and kicking all the appendages around him, and blowing them into pieces. However, whenever he destroys one tendril or dragon, five more appear to replace it. Boros isn't making any progress at all. Laughter comes from all directions. Shut up already! You sound disgusting! Boros shouts as he shoots a beam of concentrated energy at one of the many mouths. However, instead of burning away the flesh, the beam just gets absorbed by the mass and nothing happens. You're not getting rid of me that easily. More and more mouths and eyes start popping up all around Boros, surrounding the alien. They all open up and start glowing. Here, have this back times a hundred. The Abomination declares and fires hundreds of lasers at the alien from all directions. Boros quickly puts his hands together. He gathers up a large amount of energy and forms a sphere around himself to block all the monster's beams. As the lasers collide with Boros's makeshift barrier, the alien is left completely unable to see anything going on around himself. And due to the immense amounts of energy drowning the entire city, he's unable to use energy sensing to track Orochi's movements either. Suddenly, the ground below the alien's feet splits open and a massive tendril shoots at him from behind. Its sharp tip punctures Boros's shield and slams into his spine. The Dominator of the Universe feels a sharp pain in his stomach and tilts his head down, only to see a giant spike piercing his body. At the same time, the Evolved Monster King stops firing lasers at the alien. The light around Boros's form clears up, and he looks around. The dozens of mouths that had just been firing at him let out a deafening, monstrous laughter. The Dominator of the Universe coughs up a bit of blood. He clenches his teeth and grips the tendril impaling him with one hand. He yanks it out of his stomach and throws it away, healing his injury instantly. The alien floats in the air as the mouths around him keep laughing. Boros can't help but smirk. Well, you're certainly much more of a worthy foe now than you were a few minutes ago. But it'll take a lot more than that to kill me. He says before powering up more. Ha 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 
<laughs> you can't possibly think that's all I've got. I'm just getting started. The eyes and mouth suddenly disappear and the flesh surrounding the alien starts melting. The tendrils, dragon heads, everything around Boros liquefies into a disgusting mush. The alien feels a shiver run down his spine once more. A few seconds later, the mass beneath him starts forming into a huge shape. Boros flies off into the sky and observes what's happening below. Orochi's body morphs into a truly gigantic and monstrous entity, the size of a mountain. At the peak, a ginormous reptile-like head forms. This form is truly something to behold, don't you agree? Now, come at me, Dominator of the Universe! Boro smiles. Now things are getting fun. This time, I'll go all out! The alien's blue aura spikes up and lightning erupts from his body. He charges straight at Orochi and winds up the strongest punch he can. Orochi, in turn, lunges his massive head at Boros and opens his jaws wide, intending to swallow the alien whole. The two titans collide and a massive explosion rocks the entire continent. Orochi's mouth closes up on Boros' body, but a mere moment later, the force of the alien's punch blows the massive creature into pieces. Chunks of flesh scatter into the air all around the alien and quickly morph into dragon heads of various sizes and unleash a barrage of energy beams on Boros, who swirls around in the air and starts punching the heads one by one. While he's doing this, the flesh in the city below him starts rising and forming into a huge, vaguely humanoid form. The creature grows several razor-sharp blades for arms and starts swinging at Boros. The Dominator of the Universe raises an arm to stop one of the blades, but to his surprise, it cuts straight through his exoskeleton and chops his arm clean off. Boros discharges some energy from his feet and flies backwards to gain some distance before shooting an energy beam at the towering giant. You fool! Orochi grows a giant mouth on the chest of the humanoid form, which quickly swallows up the energy blast. Boros frowns. He thought that maybe this thing had a limit to how much power it could absorb and he could overflow it, but that was a full power blast and it did nothing. He can't risk feeding this thing more. The alien's thoughts are interrupted by a bellowing shout from the flesh below, and the humanoid monster detaches its four blade arms from its body and launches them at Boros. They quickly break apart into hundreds of smaller blades and surround the alien from all directions. Boros tries to summon up some energy to repel them, but the blades pierce right through his aura and sink into his body from all sides. The alien lets out a pained grunt. He wonders how this could have happened, before realizing that the daggers absorbed his energy just as they collided with it, and that's why they were able to get through his shield so easily. He frowns. This is bad. It's like the monster specifically evolved to counter him in every possible way. The blades then suddenly start moving around and dicing Boros up. The alien's body swells up and splatters into dozens of pieces. The giant Orochi laughs out loud. <laughs> How pathetic! The great dominator of the universe reduced a little more than mincemeat for the monster king to consume. Boris's body starts gathering and forming back together, but Orochi sees this and sends even more blades his way. The alien can't focus on his regeneration with this many shards of flesh metal trying to cut him into bits. Boris's regenerating body gets shredded and torn apart multiple times, but the alien simply reforms over and over again. His regeneration is far too strong and fast for the blades to be able to stop him. But he can't do anything to harm Orochi either, seeing as the monster absorbs all his attacks. He can't just punch a hole in this giant thing because it'll simply close back up and the alien will have wasted energy. For the first time in his life, Boros is at a loss for words on how to kill an opponent.
Orochi continues laughing as his body gets destroyed over and over again until finally, Boros has had enough. SHUT UP! Boros yells. His blue aura flares up and lightning sparks around his body. A massive surge of energy is released from his form and the blades and chunks of flesh all around him are blown back. They absorb a good chunk of the released energy, but it's still not enough to negate the push and the alien manages to put enough distance between himself and Orochi to fully regenerate his body. He pants a few times. <laughs> <laughs> now this is what I'm talking about. I'm actually in trouble here. It's been ages since I've had a fight this thrilling. Orochi, you are an amazing opponent. But you will not defeat me! The alien shouts and his power surges. His eye starts glowing and a massive aura is released from his body. The atmosphere is distorted around the alien, who's now grinning widely and using all of his latent energy to boost his power to the maximum. He pushes his body to its very limit, just one inch away before he would activate a meteoric burst. The dominator of the universe is at his full, maximum output and ready to unleash the full extent of his abilities. And he knows what to do. He's been trying to figure out how to kill this new form of Orochi ever since the moment he transformed. And at first, Boros was completely clueless about how he should go about doing that. But now, having forced the newly formed Monster King to use his powers a bit, the alien uses his sensory abilities and picks up on a pattern. Every time Orochi uses his energy, it always comes in waves from somewhere deep below ground. Somewhere down in the earth, there has to be some sort of core. Maybe even Orochi's original body. That's the only explanation. That is where the energy originates. Now he just needs to reach it. That's easier said than done though. Orochi is still extremely powerful, and despite Boris' incredibly vast reserves of energy, there's a limit to how much he can let Orochi absorb. Boros knows that he'll have to plunge into the depths of the earth, where he'll be completely surrounded by his enemy on all sides. If he runs out of energy down there, it's all over. But this is a gamble he must take. Boros lets out a scream and rockets down to the ground. He breaks through the layers of Orochi's flesh and buries himself into the earth, leaving the surface and the massive form of Orochi far behind. Boros goes deeper and deeper, passing layers of flesh and rock. He needs to reach the bottom and find the source of the energy that Orochi has been drawing on at all cost. It's his only chance. Soon, the alien breaches some sort of wall and falls into a giant cavern made up of nothing but flesh and organs. It would be pitch black, but Boros's own energy lights up the cave and allows him to see around himself. Suddenly, hundreds of eyes and mouths form around the cavity. Congratulations! You have made it into your tomb, Dominator of the Universe. As Orochi's voice echoes throughout the cavern, the matter around Boros starts shifting and many disgusting tendrils and heads emerge from the walls, floor and ceiling. In all my days of conquest, not once have I met anyone anywhere near as repulsive as you. Boros jokes before getting serious. The final charge is about to begin. Quickly, the alien kicks off of the floor of the cavity and lunges at the heads. The dragons, snakes and other weird monstrosities all open their mouths and fire a barrage of energy blasts at Boros. He swerves and dives beneath them, evading most, but some hit him in the shoulders, legs and side. The alien tanks through the pain and reaches the nearest monster. He grabs it by the neck and swings it into the air, bashing another incoming projectile with the appendage. Boros then uses the dragon as a club and starts swinging it around to bash and block incoming lasers, beams and attacks. 
He's slowly making his way toward the back wall, but the attacks aren't letting up. The alien struggles against hundreds, no, thousands of attacks coming his way. Insect legs, laser beams, giant mouths, stingers, hands and more all press Boros and start pushing him back. The dominator of the universe grunts as a tendril collides with his body and sends him crashing into the ground. He quickly recollects himself and stands up before noticing a giant head rapidly charging at him from the side. Boros tries to punch it, but the creature's jaws open up wide and it crashes into Boros before chomping him in half. The alien coughs up blood and quickly propels his upper half into the air before regenerating. He looks around. Various horrifying monsters surround him on all sides. From above and below, too. On top of that, he can feel his energy being drained just by being here. After all, he is inside of Orochi's body. Things are looking bad. Even if he used Meteoric Burst now, it would expel so much energy that the form wouldn't even last a second before being absorbed. Boros grits his teeth and decides to do something stupid. He can feel that he's close to wherever he needs to be. The energy here is far more dense than anywhere else in the creature, so he might as well try. The alien starts focusing. All of his energy begins pulling together into a massive sphere of power. The alien's muscles twitch and veins pop out as he gathers every last ounce of his power and forces it into one singular point. His right foot. The alien's body starts trembling. Blood splurts out of his pores and his eye turns bloodshot. He's not quite at the limits of meteoric burst range, but it's damn close. This will have to do. Boros lets out a primal roar and thrusts his foot back before unleashing the built-up energy. A giant wave of power bursts out of his leg and the force of it propels the alien forward like a missile. Orochi's bodies and heads try to stop him, but they are all blown apart by the blast. Boros charges at unimaginable speeds through the monster's insides, breaking down everything in his path. Hundreds of mouths and tendrils get in his way and rip chunks of his body off, but despite the blood and the pain, Boros rushes forward. It's a suicidal charge as the alien loses more and more body parts, more and more blood, until all that's left of him is a chunk of his head, his left arm, torso and right leg. However, he also feels himself getting closer and closer to the core. The energy here is so strong, so dense, this has to be it. He's almost there. Just a little more. Suddenly, a mouth appears right beneath Boros, and with a perfectly timed bite, chomps his leg off. The alien, propelled only by the momentum he's built up, barrels through the cavern and smashes painfully into the ground. He rolls a few hundred meters before stopping. Now all that's left of him is his torn apart torso, his banged up arm and his head. His blood-soaked hair sticks to his face, making it hard to see much. The dominator of the universe groans as he notices a few mouths, tendrils, slowly approaching him. Gleeful smirks appear on all of them at once. Boros curses under his breath. He raises his head and sees a tunnel before himself. Not a metaphorical one, but an actual tunnel. He can feel intense energy coming from it. This is it. The path to Orochi's core. The alien, having spent most of his energy, can't regenerate. And yet, he refuses to give up now. Not when he's so close. Not when his pride is on the line. With his one remaining hand, Boro starts pulling himself forward and enters the tunnel. Surprisingly, none of the heads around him try to stop him. Look at you, the dominator of the universe, slithering on the ground like a pathetic worm. Boros ignores the monster's words and simply pushes forward. After a few minutes, he finally reaches the end of the tunnel. He sees a large cavern open up before him. To his surprise, it's the same cave where the ancient ruins are. Of course, that's where this entire transformation occurred. 
This is the center of it all. In the middle of the room, Orochi's body floats in the air, attached to hundreds of strands of flesh. He looks pleased with himself. You should have finished me off when you had the chance, Boros. But I am grateful. It's thanks to you that I have been able to achieve these heights. Once I devour you, I shall complete my ascension into godhood. Shut the hell up. Boros mutters through gritted teeth. He pushes himself up with his one remaining hand and looks up at Orochi. You will not defeat me. <laughs> Look at your situation, alien. What can you do in the shape you're in? Orochi asks and the tendrils and dragon heads around Boro start shifting around, as if to remind him that he's still completely surrounded. However, in response to this, the alien smirks. I may be in rough shape, but you made one fatal mistake. You allowed me to reach your core. Boros declares as he raises his one remaining hand into the air before clenching it into a fist. The eye on his chest lights up as Boros floods all of his energy into it. Lightning erupts from the alien's torso, and he points his eye at the ground. With a large roar, Boros unleashes a giant shockwave of pure power at the flesh beneath him and the force of it knocks his body into the air and toward Orochi's core. The Monster King's eyes widen and he quickly sends many dragon-headed tendrils after Boros, but the creatures are just a fraction of a second too slow to react, and the Dominator of the Universe appears right in front of Orochi's chest. He redirects all of his power into a fist, and winds it up. With momentum from his earlier stunt, he punches the Monster King's core with all of his might, Boros screams as he drives his fist and his entire body through Orochi and blows a hole in him. The monster roars in agony as the alien collapses to the ground, now truly, completely spent. Orochi writhes in pain and turns to Boros. You... you... I will end you! He bellows, but before he can follow through with his threat, the Monster King feels his body swell up. He looks at his hands. They're glowing. What's going on? Orochi's body starts disintegrating. Without the core, there's nothing to hold the creature together. He screams in pain as the flesh roots connecting him to his evolved frame tear apart and the monster falls to the ground. The entire cave made up of the Monster King's flesh starts squirming and shifting around. Suddenly, it all begins glowing just like Orochi's body before disintegrating. Like a wave, the decay spreads from the center cavern onto the surface. All the flesh that Orochi had used to cover City Z starts slowly disappearing. A few minutes later, Boro sits on a rock in the cave, leaning against the wall. He looks over at Orochi. The creature has fully reverted back to his original form and is slowly dying. You bastard. How did you do this? I evolved specifically to counter everything you had. You were completely out of power. I sensed your energy reserves run dry after I severed your leg. You had directed all of your energy there. So how? How do you still have power? Boro smiles. Indeed. If we had a straight up brawl, you would have won. But I'm not some brainless beast. I noticed the mouth you used to chomp my leg off at the last moment and redirected my remaining power from my foot into my hand in an instant and concealed it. Then I crawled my way to your core before unleashing that energy. But that was a reckless gamble. You could have been done for if I had just decided to kill you. Perhaps. 
Had you decided to kill me when I fell to the ground, that would have been it for me. But you allowed me to go through the tunnel and reach you, because you wanted to see me struggle, right? You wanted to see my life fade with your very own eyes. Your hubris got the better of you, Monster King. Boros declares, Orochi is left speechless. He turns to the altar where their fight first started. A god. That was what I wanted to become. And like a true god, I was invincible. You did not have the power to defeat me. In the end, I can at least take solace in the fact that it was my very own self that killed me. The Monster King closes his eyes. A few minutes later, Boros is able to recover enough energy to close his wounds and regenerate his lost limbs. The walls of the cave start cracking. The force of the impacts of Orochi's final transformation and Boros' final punch shook the room enough to make it unstable. Chunks of rock and debris start falling from the sides and ceiling of the cavern. The wall around the ancient ruins crumbles down, revealing a full picture of the mural. The alien stares at the drawing in surprise. Well, would you look at that? Seems you interpreted your fate incorrectly, Orochi. You should have dug deeper. In the end, it seems that you were the sacrifice for some other entity. Our god is what you told me you read from the altar, right? Maybe I can someday meet this so-called god of yours. The cave starts collapsing completely. Debris buries the altar, leaving Boros as the only one who would ever lay his eye on it. Once the cave-in finishes, the alien sits down on the rubble and sighs. The battle left me worn out. I shall take some time to rest before I go back up there and face the other monsters. Though I doubt any of them will be able to provide me with a better challenge than this. Boros leans back and looks up at the ceiling. Orochi, the Monster King. You were a worthy adversary. I shall never forget our duel. In the Hero Association headquarters. We're detecting an unusually high tectonic movement underneath Z City. What? How can this be? It's geographically not possible. We have reason to believe that it's some kind of monster, sir. The city has been abandoned for quite some time and several monsters have been spotted leaving and entering the area of this tectonic activity. We have a report of King entering the neighboring city not too long ago, sir. He should be close enough to detect the tremors and go to check them out. Hmm. Call every available S-Class hero right away and have them come here. We will organize a unit to check things out. But sir, if King's already there... He might need backup. Besides, we do not know if he will go or not. Like I said, call every available S-Class hero here right away. Boros looks up. I've killed a leader, but that doesn't mean that I can't have any more fun now, does it? There are still plenty of monsters up there for me to fight. Maybe all of them at once could actually make me exert myself a little more. As he says those words, Boros powers down to conserve his energy and to make things more challenging for himself in this upcoming battle before crouching down and jumping up. He plows right through the ceiling and emerges in the main room of the Monster Association. Gyoro Gyoro looks at him in shock. Y you're alive? What happened down there? Where is Orochi? I killed him. The battle was quite fun, but in the end I didn't get what I was after. So now it's all of your turn. Try to make this exciting for me, would you? Wasting no time at all, the alien dashes at Gyorogyoro. 
She tries to activate her psychic powers, but before she can, she's blown to bits. The monsters look on in shock. Some of them start fleeing, while others jump down to fight the intruder. In particular, Black S, Overgrown Rover, and... The ground beneath Boros quakes as two giant claws shoot out from underneath the alien. Boros jumps up to avoid them, but that proves to be a mistake as Elder Centipede erupts from the ground and smashes into Boros mid-air. The insect monster drives the alien into the ceiling. It keeps pushing the alien further and further. Soon, it blows Boros out of the ground and onto the surface. The alien rolls off of the centipede and lands on the street of the abandoned Z city. Soon, monsters who still want to fight emerge after him through the tunnel Elder Centipede has made. Black S, Homeless Emperor, Pure Ugly, and Gums wanting revenge, Overgrown Rover and Pure Blood, as well as some other lower level monsters who don't know their worth like Rhino Wrestler. Goketsu, being intelligent enough to know when to fight and when not to, decides to sit this one out. He had a great deal of respect for Orochi, having experienced his power firsthand. And if Boros has beaten even him, then there is no point in facing the alien. The martial artist retreats into one of the tunnels. Black S begins to multiply as Homeless Emperor and Rover start blasting Boros with energy attacks. Boros simply shrugs the explosions off. Orochis were way stronger, and even they couldn't deal any damage to the alien, so what hope do these two fools have? Don't tell me this is the best you lot can do! Boros charges at Rover and begins pummeling him with powerful blows. The massive hound howls in pain as the alien finishes the combo with a devastating kick which sends Rover flying through several buildings. Homeless Emperor looks on stunned at first, but then begins charging up the most powerful sphere of energy he can muster. Seeing this, Boro smirks and decides to let the man prepare his attack. Maybe this one could at least make him tickle a bit. So in the meantime, the alien figures he'd settle things with Gums and Ugly first. He begins walking toward the two of them, but Black S gets in the way. Or rather, a million Black S's get in the way. The dominator of the universe is a little surprised, but soon figures out that this is S's ability once he sees one of the clones clone himself. I see. A cloning ability. Quite interesting. It's not so much cloning as it is multiplying. I can increase my number to several dozen trillion. Think you can take down that many? It doesn't matter if there's a thousand, a million, a billion, or a trillion. A weakling is still a weakling. The alien lunges at the army of Black S and starts plowing through them. Each and every single one of his blows generates shockwaves that wipe out dozens, if not hundreds of S's in an instant. But the tiny terror keeps multiplying and soon, an entire tsunami of Black S crashes down on Boros who simply smiles before letting out a surge of energy and blowing the entire wave back, disintegrating thousands of black ass. However, the wave is rejuvenated by a few more million copies and soon washes up on the alien again. Still think you can win? I am a countless number of me. It doesn't matter how you strike, blast, tear or twist, I'll keep multiplying. And yet, the more you multiply, the weaker you become. You'll never be able to hurt me. And I can keep going for weeks. Boros retorts before kicking one of the S's so hard that the generated shockwave disintegrates several hundred black S. Among this wave of bodies, Ugly and Gums attempt to reach Boros. Further away, Homeless Emperor is done charging his attack. The sphere he has created drowns the area in a bright, white light like a miniature star, blocking out the actual sun. Take this! All the power given to me by God! Homeless Emperor screams as he lowers his hands, dropping the ginormous bomb on Boros, and, by extension, the army of Black S as well as Gums and Ugly. The energy sphere explodes, nuking the entire battlefield and wiping out everything in a radius of several kilometers. The city around the battleground is completely vaporized. 
The only things left in the area are Homeless Emperor, the Downed Rover, Elder Centipede, and a few black ass clothes. S immediately starts yelling at Homeless Emperor for blowing up most of his army, but the man simply shrugs. You were a perfect distraction to keep that alien in one place. I simply used the chance you gave me to get rid of that parasite. Get rid of who? The rumble in the center of the explosion suddenly bursts open and Boro stands up. He dusts himself off and smirks. That was a nice one. I actually felt a slight sting. Still, nowhere near enough to be satisfactory. Seems like I got my hopes up too soon. Orochi, and now all of you. None of the monsters in this association can give me a challenge. Saitama remains as the only living thing on this planet that could make me break a sweat. Boro states before seeming to remember something. Oh, and by the way, you there with the energy spheres. Boros points a finger at Homeless Emperor. You mentioned God before. I would like to have a word with you about that when I'm done with the others. Homeless Emperor looks at Boros in shock. There's no way the alien actually survived his strongest blast, is there? And he wants to know about God too? Why? How does he even know about God's existence? Boros begins walking toward Homeless Emperor. No! S stay away! The man screams, terrified, and begins to fire off hundreds of blasts at the alien, desperately trying to keep him at a distance. Unfazed, Boros simply walks through the assault, tanking the shots head on without sustaining as much as a scratch. Please, your strongest blast did nothing. What makes you think this will be any different? Boros emerges from the explosions right in front of Homeless Emperor and pulls back his fist. The alien punches the man in the face and his head is blown off of his body, instantly killing him. Boros' eye widens. What? I could have sworn I held back enough to keep him alive. Knowing how powerful the energy spheres are gave Boros an idea of how much strength to use to not kill Homeless, but still put him down. However, he didn't know that underneath his light powers, Homeless Emperor was just a normal human and ended up killing him. Meanwhile, Black S is furious. Can't give you a challenge, huh? Don't look down on me! If a challenge is what you want, then that's what you'll get! Black S begins to multiply rapidly. Soon, he covers the entire area. Not just the area. Half of the entire city is soon plunged into a sea of darkness as the dwarf continues to split. What follows is an absolute massacre, as Boros powers up a bit before initiating a barrage of blows so intense that each one of them generates shockwaves wide enough to kill tens of thousands of black ass. And the alien fires these punches off faster than a machine gun could fire bullets. Within minutes, literal millions of black ass are destroyed. And yet, the monster keeps multiplying. Why are you telling me to wait? I already told you, we need to wait for the other heroes to arrive so we can form a proper team to go check the situation out. If there's a monster out there that can cause tectonic movements, then I am the only one who can face him. Any others would just get in the way. Besides, we don't know how much time we have before the creature makes its way to other, more populated cities. Stitch sighs. As much as he hates to admit it, the number 2 S-Class hero is right. If there is indeed a monster in Z-City capable of emitting the kind of energy the association picked up earlier, there are very few heroes who could actually ever hope to take it on. There is always Blast, but there is no telling if he'll show up for something like this. And King hasn't responded to any of his calls. There is no telling what his status is. So Tatsumaki is the only one who could be tasked with something as large scale as this. Alright, you can go. It's not like I could stop you anyway. Just please be careful out there. Tatsumaki pouts. Have you forgotten who you're speaking to? I don't need any warnings from you. 
Boros punches away a few more thousand black ass. He's been at this for several minutes now, and as entertaining as the seemingly never-ending army of dummies to destroy has been, it's getting old. Fast. Without any prior warning, the alien suddenly stops fighting, confusing the one monster army. I'm done. Huh? What? I'm done fighting you. Oh, I get it. You're running out of stamina, aren't you? Was you saying you can go for weeks just a bluff? Well, too bad, cause I'm not done with you yet. Not until you're begging for mercy. I'm bored. What? You're boring me. I had some fun at first, punching thousands of you out of existence. But now it's just repetitive. You're no challenge for me. If I wanted to, I could wipe out this entire area with one single blast and eradicate every single one of you. It doesn't matter how much you can multiply if there's nothing left to multiply. If every body of yours is gone, then there will be nothing left to make more of you. You're easy. All that talk and yet, you're not even worth killing. I let the heroes have their fun with you. I'm sure there's already some on the way. Veins pop out of Black S's face. Why, you little... His body shakes with rage. I'LL KILL YOU! Suddenly, all of the Black S bodies begin merging into one. Boros looks on confused as the S's keep piling into each other. Whatever you're doing, bring it on. Boros! So far you have killed 173,896,753 of me, and 65,999,826,175,000 is the current number of me inside me. Can you defeat us all when we merge? Let's go, guys! 66 million ultimate combination! Going golden won't be enough! We'll rise further! Oh, I see. Fusion. Boros smirks. The spark of excitement returns to his eye. He crosses his arms and awaits for his foe to be formed. A brilliant light engulfs the entire city as the ground shakes. Far below the ground, Psychos can sense the immense energy up on the surface. She figures it must be one of the cadres, but can't figure out which. She didn't think any of them could be capable of this level of power. However, right now that's not what matters. She continues to search for Orochi. Meanwhile, several kilometers away, Saitama and Genos make their way through one of the tunnels of the Monster Association. They faced a couple monsters on the way, but nothing really serious. The thick walls of the hideout make Genos' radar pretty much useless, so the two heroes are left completely lost. Above the ground, another presence makes itself known. During the chaos, Phoenix Man makes his way onto the surface and attempts to sneak away. Boros notices him, but doesn't bother to pursue the small fry. And so, the bird monster is successfully able to escape the battlefield. At the same time, Rover stands up and shakes off the rubble he'd been covered in after crashing through several buildings thanks to the alien's attack. It notices Boros and, trembling with fear, runs away. Huh. That thing is pretty durable. Might make a good pet for me. I hope you enjoyed your time at the top, because it ends now. Suddenly, Platinum S lunges at Boros and plows his fist right into the alien's face. The Dominator of the Universe lets out a big grunt and is sent flying backwards. Furious at the alien's trash talk from before, S doesn't waste a second and charges at Boros again. He catches up to him and delivers a furious elbow to the eye on the alien's chest, shoving Boros into the ground with enough force to blow away several nearby buildings. Platinum then grabs Boros by the face and runs at top speed, dragging the alien through the ground for several kilometers before throwing him into the air. 
S jumps up after Boros and knees him in the back before punching him back down to the ground. Not done yet, he rockets at the alien and lands his feet on his stomach, creating a huge crater and making the dominator of the universe cough up blood. Satisfied for now, Platinum S jumps back and lands gracefully a few meters away from Boros before crossing his arms and putting on a sinister smirk. How's that for a challenge? At the same time, deep below the ground, Psychos continues her search for Orochi when she spots a pile of flesh, which begins making its way toward her. Boros lies motionless on the ground for a couple of seconds before letting out a massive laugh, which confuses Platinum S. The alien slowly gets back up to his feet, wiping the blood off of his mouth. Yes, that is more like it. You are the opponent I've been seeking. He laughs again in pure joy before loosening the grip on his power and letting his aura run wild as he powers up. Seeing this, Platinum S gets into a fighting stance. Very well. This is going to be the perfect chance to test out my new power. I just hope you last long enough for me to stretch my muscles. Suddenly, the standoff is interrupted when Elder Centipede rockets out from under the ground and lunges at Boros. The alien had almost forgotten this thing was still here. He prepares to defend himself, but the insect suddenly freezes. A green glow surrounds his body and begins crushing it. What is going on here? The green-haired Esper descends from the sky, having just arrived to the battleground. She clutches her palm and at that moment, the force crushing Elder Centipede increases greatly. Its armor starts cracking and soon its entire body is condensed into a ball the size of a small building. The monster dies almost instantly. Class S, Rank 2, Tornado of Terror. What a surprise. Class S, Rank 2? That means you're strong, right? The second strongest in the Hero Association? This must be my lucky day. Things just keep getting better and better. Before anyone can say or do anything else, a massive wave of energy bursts out of the ground nearby, destroying a huge portion of the city. The ground shakes as massive tendrils emerge from the Monster Association hideout and dig into the earth. A giant Psychos rises out of the ground, followed by the ginormous monster portion of her body. Tatsumaki, S, and Boros all look on in shock. Where in the world did this thing come from? Boros feels something familiar about the creature. The energy coming from that thing resembles... Orochi? Boros! Where are you? We have a score to settle! Sairochi shouts out. The fusion between the two monsters seemingly having kept Orochi's memories well enough to hold a significant grudge against the alien. Well, sure seems like someone has a target on his back. Platinum S smirks while looking at the newly formed entity in the distance. He turns to face Boros again, but just as he does, he feels the alien's fist crash into his cheek. Here, let me repay you for earlier. Boros laughs as he starts pummeling the monster and sends him crashing into a building. He prepares to follow up his attack, but before he can, a green aura surrounds him, freezing him in place. Tatsumaki points her finger upwards and lifts Boros high into the air. The Esper prepares to start crushing the alien. Further away, Sairochi is still looking around. Suddenly, she spots the alien floating in the sky a couple kilometers away from her. Taking this opportunity, she extends both of her hands in front of herself. Found you! She shouts as he fires off a massive beam of energy. Hearing this, Boros attempts to turn around, but to no avail as Tatsumaki is still holding him in place. He tenses up his muscles, lets out some energy and breaks free of her hold. He then turns around to look at Sairochi. Once he does, all he sees is a ginormous energy beam quickly approaching him. Realizing that he can't dodge an attack this wide in such a short amount of time, the alien raises one of his arms in front of himself. The beam crashes into the palm of his hand at full force. Boros grunts as he attempts to block the entire blast. 
He feels his hand getting singed and lets out a roar, pushing back against the energy. Tatsumaki watches from the side, amazed that the alien can take so much energy head on and not be instantly disintegrated. Her amazement is quickly interrupted when Platinum S bursts out of the building he'd been launched into and lunges at her. With no time to spare, the Esper dodges to the side and counters by picking up several buildings with her telekinesis and sending them flying at Platinum S, who smiles and punches them all into pieces before resuming his attack on Tatsumaki. Sairochi stops firing her beam. As the dust settles, Boros is revealed with his right arm missing. Pretty impressive, but now it's my turn. He regrows his arm, lands on a building and jumps off of it, aiming to get closer to his new enemy. At the same time, Tatsumaki flexes her psychic power by pushing Platinum S back and launching him at Sairochi. Psychos grow several dragons from the base of her legs and begins rapid firing lasers in Boros's direction, destroying huge parts of the city below. The alien speeds up until all that can be seen from him is a flash of light and dodges all the beams. However, Platinum S, unprepared, almost gets hit by one of them. What the hell? Aren't we on the same side? He shouts to Psychos, who can't hear him over the sound of her beams destroying everything around her. Fine! You wanna be another bug I squash on my way to become the Monster King? Be my guest! Tatsumaki realizes that Sairochi's attacks have enough range to reach other cities and figures that she needs to deal with her now. Meanwhile, deep below the surface, deeper than even the Mural of God, something awakens. A creature far larger than anything the Hero Association has ever seen. It receives an order from another worldly presence and begins to make its way to the surface to fulfill it. Psychos, seeing that all three of her foes are now trying to attack her specifically, figures that she needs to create as much wide-scale destruction as possible to hit all of them at once. And so she fires off her biggest laser yet, aiming to hit all of her enemies with it. Tatsumaki can sense the energy being built up and is able to get out of the way right as the beam fires. Boros and Platinum S don't have that luxury, but their speed is enough to get them out of the way as well. The laser slices through the crust of the Earth and shaves a continental disk off the face of the planet. The power on display shocks Platinum S and Tatsumaki, who begins questioning where all this power could have come from. It even shocks Psychos herself and she begins to marvel at her own ability. The continent crashes back down onto the ground, causing massive tsunamis and shaking the entire northern hemisphere. Boros is elated. Yes, this is more like it, he shouts as he jumps up, aiming to land a punch on Psychos. Before he can follow through with his attack, the ground starts quaking as a massive creature shoots out of the earth. An absolutely monstrous centipede rockets straight at Boros from underneath the planet's crush and smashes into him, sending him flying back to the ground next to Platinum S. Elder Centipede? No, I am Sage Centipede. I have been sent here by our father, the Earth, to help you destroy the abominable fist that's turned against God. God? You know about him? I know more than you, but that's not what matters right now. The two of us are to destroy the alien that's been giving you trouble. Hearing this, Platinum S lets out a chuckle. Man, you have a talent for making enemies, don't you? The more the better. Boros laughs as he gets back up to his feet and dusts himself off. He looks up at the two behemoths before him with a wide grin on his face. I do not know where you creatures keep coming from, but I won't complain. This planet is so much fun already. And you do not belong here. This planet is about to erase you from existence, alien. Without wasting any more time, Sage Centipede begins rapidly marching at Boros, and by extension at Platinum S as well, who is standing right next to him. Hey, Boros, 
Let's team up for now, shall we? Take out all these clowns interfering with our battle and then have a glorious 1v1. What do you say? Boros turns to the monster. You really think I would take an offer like that? The alien suddenly punches us in the face, sending him flying. A moment later, he turns to the charging centipede and extends both of his arms in front of himself. He opens the palms of his hands and plants his feet firmly on the ground. You're not even going to dodge? The insect monster charges at the alien at full speed and swings its massive mandibles at Boros. The dominator of the universe smirks. He catches the enormous blades with his hands as Sage Centipede smashes into him. The speed and momentum of the charge pushes Boros back several hundred meters, but the alien stands strong and soon he's able to stop the march. The insect grunts as he attempts to close his mandibles on Boros' waist to slice him into two. But try as he might, the alien doesn't budge an inch. What's wrong? This can't be all you've got, can it? You insignificant insect! Boros prepares to counterattack, but just as he is about to make his move, a giant beam of energy crashes down on him from above and knocks him away. Sairochi has lent a hand to her new ally, but she is soon forced to turn her attention elsewhere when Tatsumaki lifts several giant rocks into the air and hurls them at the monster. Suddenly, Platinum S jumps up at the Esper from the ground and wraps his head tentacle around her leg. He spins rapidly and throws the Esper down to the ground before lunging at her with a kick. Tatsumaki, using her psychic powers, is able to stop herself from crashing into the city below. She notices the monster's attack rocketing at her, and, at the last second, is able to fly out of the way, leaving S's kick to smash into the ground. The force from the kick cracks the ground in a several hundred meter radius, and whatever buildings are still there crumble. If that kick had hit her, Patsumaki shudders at the thought. She raises her hands to attack S, but notices Sairochi launch a massive beam at her from the side. The Esper is forced to put up a shield to protect herself, but at the same time, Platinum S lunges at her again. Enough! Tatsumaki shouts out and a massive green aura surrounds her. She raises both of her hands into the air and everything around her begins rising. The Esper puts all her power into one massive feat of power. Buildings crumble and the ground shakes as the entire city is lifted thousands of meters into the air. All the debris and the sheer force of the move knocks Platinum S and Sairochi's beam away. The effects of the outburst can be felt by Sage Centipede and Boros as well, as the ground there is also not spared from the number two hero's rampage. Tatsumaki doesn't stop. She continues to show off her power as the ground rises further and further. The city is sent dozens of kilometers into the air, creating a bulge in the earth visible from space. What the hell is going on? Tectonic movements? It's as if a new mountain is forming. You shouldn't ponder on such things in the heat of battle. Boros punches the centipede in its face, cracking its exoskeleton. The monster growls in pain but soon regenerates and attacks the alien with a centipede grand march, hitting the alien with his arms hundreds of times over. The attack actually makes the dominator of the universe feel a slight sting. Finally, he's feeling something while actually exerting a decent amount of power. Progress is being made. Meanwhile, Tatsumaki finally stops her rage-fueled outburst. In the end, a new Mega Mountain has been formed. A mountain that's as wide as a small continent and as tall as multiple dozen Everests stacked on top of each other. This new Mega Mountain shifts the face of the planet. The Esper lets out a sigh. She pants a bit and lands on the ground. This should make things a lot easier for her moving forward. She will not have to worry about stray attacks hitting other cities, as now the battlefield is high enough that stray beams will most likely end up flying into space harmlessly. However, she doesn't let her guard down. The Esper knows that her enemies are not down yet. She'll need a more direct attack to actually kill them. 
As she thinks that to herself, Sairochi bursts out of the newly formed Mega Mountain. You're really something else, aren't you, Tornado of Terror? You certainly live up to your name. A sweat drop makes its way down the monster's face. At the same time, further away, Sage Centipede emerges from the surface with Boros following suit. Finally, Platinum S emerges in the middle of the two battlegrounds. He looks around. What incredible destructive power. I'll be better off leaving those two espers to duke it out and tire each other out. In the meantime, I might as well finish my fight with Boros. And so, the monster makes its way to the alien, who is fighting the giant insect monster. Boros keeps destroying parts of the creature, but it keeps regenerating. The battle is flipped on its head when Platinum S jumps into the fray by attacking Boros. The two of them get into an exchange of kicks and punches, which is soon interrupted by Sage Centipede charging at both of them. The two warriors jump up and land on top of the massive creature's head. They then proceed to run down the centipede's back all while clashing with each other. Understandably, the sage isn't happy about his back being used as an arena and begins to rotate rapidly, shaking the two humanoids off of himself. Platinum S and Boros continue their battle on the ground. They dart around at faster than light speeds, kicking and punching each other with enough force to shake the whole area. Sage Centipede watches on in awe. He struggles to even keep up with the two warriors. Soon, he gets annoyed at that. Stop jumping around, you fleas! Centipede Grand March! He sends his entire body crashing down on the battlefield and moves it at great speed, punching everything with its 6,666 legs as it goes along. The attack reshapes part of the battlefield by launching huge chunks of rock into the air while digging craters into the ground with all the punches. With an attack as large scale as this, it's bound to eventually hit its targets. However, Boros and Platinum S are able to avoid the march for the most part and continue their fight. This only serves to agitate the centipede even more. Just then, a stray laser collides with the insect's back. He turns around, furious, only to see Sairochi clashing with Tatsumaki a good distance away. What are you doing? We are on the same side, you moron! Sairochi, just noticing what she's done, also becomes mad. Who are you calling a moron? It's your own damn fault that you're such a big target that even a stray blast can hit you. Sage Centipede growls in anger. Besides, I do not need you to deal with that worm, Boros. Tatsumaki is clearly a bigger issue. If you want to make yourself useful, then get over here and attack her. You'll make for some good bait. That is the final straw. You're dead! The insect charges at Sairochi at full speed. She prepares to attack him, but is interrupted by Tatsumaki psychically binding her arms. The green-haired Esper lets out a small laugh. Seriously? Picking a fight with your own ally? You're just giving me an even bigger advantage. Sage Centipede reaches Psychos and begins wrapping his body around hers and peppering it with thousands of blows. Sairochi grunts in pain and rage. How dare you! I am a superior life form chosen by God himself! She yells as she puts all her psychic power to use. She exerts herself to the limit and blasts the centipede off of herself, launching its entire body into the air. At the same time, Platinum S and Boros clash nearby, and the monster sees an opportunity. He jumps up toward the insect and grabs a hold of the end of its tail. He grips it tightly before swinging Sage Centipede's entire body at Boros. The insect lets out shouts of confusion as the alien giggles in amusement. Quite the bat you found there, isn't it? He laughs as he punches the centipede in the face, stopping its momentum and shattering its exoskeleton. S lets go of the creature, letting it fall to the ground. The insect grunts in pain, but it regenerates his armor and is now more furious than ever. He looks at Boros, his eyes blazing with anger. How dare you! I'll show you what happens when you make Father Earth mad! 
Let's see how you deal with all 6,666 of my legs working in tandem. 6,666 leg grand drill! The insect connects its two large mandibles, forming a sharp point, before lunging at Boros while spinning at great speed like a drill. The alien smirks, welcoming the challenge. He stands his ground and once again extends both hands in front of himself. Give me everything you've got! He catches the drill, but the sheer momentum, speed, mass and ferocity of the attack overwhelms his stance and the drill starts pushing him back. Boros can barely keep the tip of the drill from reaching his chest as he's driven down the side of the mountain at incredible speed. Platinum S watches on as the two monsters rocket down the mountain. He realizes that the two of them will likely reach the foot of the mountain if the drill doesn't stop. And so, for now, he turns to see what the two espers are up to, but all he can see are two massive tornadoes of psychic power clashing with each other. S runs over to check things out. Meanwhile, the drill reaches the foot of the mountain and slams Boros into the ground. Why won't you just die already? Because you're not strong enough. Just how much further do you plan on pushing me anyway? I'll drill into the core of the earth if I have to. As much as I would love to test that, I'm afraid it might do too much damage to this planet. And I'm enjoying myself far too much here to allow that to happen. As he says those words, Boros's body begins to radiate even more energy. Lightning surrounds the alien as he powers up to his full power. The raw intensity of his aura starts disintegrating the centipede's mandibles. Boros leans back, winding up a punch. This has been quite fun. Thank you for entertaining me. Goodbye, insect. He rockets his fist at Sage Centipede's head. The punch makes contact with the creature's face and completely destroys it. The force of the impact travels throughout the insect's whole body, vaporizing the entire creature from head to tail, including his regeneration core. Boros jumps out of the crater the centipede had drilled him into before suddenly remembering something. Wait, I completely forgot to ask him about God. Oh well. I know that whoever God is, he's aware of me. He's bound to send more creatures my way. I'll just ask one of them when they come. For now I should get back to the battle. Don't want to miss the rest of the fun. The alien monologues before getting an idea. Still at full power, he walks over to the foot of the mountain Tatsumaki had made. Let's see if this works. He leans back and punches the bottom of the Mega Mountain. The entire continent-sized construct blows over. At the peak, Tatsumaki, Sairochi and Platinum S can feel the impact as the mountain is pushed several hundred meters. Everything rumbles and shakes. Just what the hell is going on down there? Boros grabs the bottom of the continent and, pulling all of his energy into his arms and back, throws the entire thing into the air. The mega continent rises into the stratosphere, and then higher, and even higher as Boros jumps up and crashes into its bottom, pushing it even higher. In mere moments, the whole entire continent is launched into space. Tatsumaki holds her breath as the two monsters begin to panic. Then, Boros, still holding on to the Mega Mountain, starts to lean forward while keeping a tight grip on the continent, dragging it along with him. Soon, he flips the whole thing over. Tatsumaki is the first to realize what's about to happen and starts to fly as fast as possible, hoping to get out from under the continent. The second to come to his senses is Platinum S, and he attempts to do the same. Sayorochi, being the least mobile of the bunch, splits off a small part of herself, which transforms into a jet and begins to fly away, leaving the rest of her body behind. 
planetary devastation impact. Boros screams as he kicks the continent with all of his strength, sending it crashing down into the earth. Just barely, Tatsumaki manages to fly out of range of the collision and makes it out. But the two monsters aren't so lucky. The impact causes massive tremors as the entire earth shakes. The power of the crash vibrates throughout the planet, causing gigantic tidal waves, enormous volcano eruptions and earthquakes never before seen on any other planet of the solar system. On the other side of the Earth, a long-forgotten, sunken continent is pushed out onto the surface by the force of the coalition. Boros lands on the decimated ground. A literal 2,000 kilometers away, an exhausted and battered Tatsumaki lands on the ground as well. Even if she didn't get hit directly, the shockwave from the blast dealt some serious damage to her. Not to mention her being low on stamina after an extended battle. The green-haired Esper looks around in shock and horror. Just what in the world is that monster? How can a creature like this even exist? To launch an entire continent into space, flip it upside down and then crash it back down onto the planet. It's completely insane. She has to try to take it down. She must. She's the only one who could. However, the girl collapses from fatigue and the damage that she's been dealt. She tries to pull herself together, but in the end, passes out. Meanwhile... Boros closes his eye and lets out a sigh. It's over. Boros! Huh? The alien opens his eye and is shocked to find that the world around him has completely changed. Instead of the barren wasteland he was in a moment ago, now Boros finds himself in a completely different realm, with a ginormous structure similar to the surface of Jupiter looking at him. What the hell? What is this place? Boros! You wanted to know more about God! Well... Here I am! A cold chill runs down the alien's spine. The power he's feeling, it's far greater than his own. The sensation of the superior presence starts to overwhelm Boros. Are you scared? No need to be. I do not wish to kill you. Not yet, at least. Though this might change depending on your answer. What answer? You wish to fight strong opponents. The ultimate foe to you right now is the fist that has turned against me. But you are far too weak to take it on as you are now. What are you talking about? I thought I was the one who turned against you somehow. That centipede said as much. That is true. There are two fists that have turned against me. You and the body. Sooner or later, I will deal with both of you. It is only a matter of time before I find a vessel capable of holding enough power to kill you. That's why I'm giving you an offer. Become my vessel, and in exchange, I shall give you power far beyond your wildest dreams. With it, you will be able to match and defeat Saitama. The resulting battle will surely satisfy your urge to fight. It is a deal that would benefit the both of us. Boros considers the offer for a moment. 
All this is a lot to take in. A sweat drop makes its way down the alien's face. This is the first time he's felt genuine fear. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. I am Boros, dominator of the universe. There is no way I would accept such an offer. He powers up. A blue aura surrounds the alien. Send any assassins you want my way. I'll take them all down. And after I do, I'll come for you as well. Insolent fool. Have it your way. Your final hour is approaching. At that moment, Boros returns to the real world, like nothing ever happened. The alien drops to his knees. He lets out heavy, ragged breaths as cold sweat covers his face. What was I thinking? Challenging that thing to a fight. It's stronger than me. Much stronger. If I want to have any chance of victory, I'll have to train myself, just like Saitama did. The alien's body trembles as he slowly gets back to his feet. However, even as Boros' body shakes, a grin creeps its way onto his face. The existence of a creature like this, a creature that Boros would need to grow stronger to defeat. It excites the alien. He begins looking forward to eventually facing him in a fight. After doing some training, of course. Suddenly, a blast erupts from the ground and two figures emerge. Saitama and Genos. Finally, we're out. My scanners picked up on an impossibly large change in our altitude, and then everything flipped upside down. For a moment, there wasn't even any gravity. Then our altitude suddenly went back down to normal, and a massive crash occurred. Finally, I picked up a life signal right above us and blasted us out. Just what in the world happened? Genos murmurs to himself. Ah, Saitama. You missed out on a lot. You can tell me about it later. Right now, I just want to go back to my apartment. Saitama answers, clearly not interested. A realization suddenly hits Boros. Saitama's apartment, along with the entirety of the city, is currently buried dozens of kilometers underground. The alien gives the two heroes an awkward look and rubs the back of his head. About that. In the end, most members of the Monster Association ended up dead from the impact of the continent. Gums and Fiorugly died to one of Homeless Emperor's blasts. Hellfire and Gale weren't in the Monster Association base that day, so they weren't affected in any way. Elder Centipede was killed by Tatsumaki. Sage Centipede was killed by Boros. Goketsu managed to escape unharmed. Overgrown Rover managed to escape unharmed. Phoenix Man managed to escape unharmed. Psychos and Orochi were killed by the planetary devastation impact. Evil Natural Water's tank was destroyed by the planetary devastation impact, but the creature itself managed to escape unharmed. And Platinum S. A hand emerges from the ground at the edge of the impact area of the fallen continent. A tired, battered and cracked Platinum S just barely makes it out of the rubble. Damn you, Boros. Just a second longer and I would have escaped unharmed. But as it happened, I was at the edge of the continent's impact. Had I been just a little closer to the center. <sighs> Damn you, Boros. I swear I'll come back stronger than ever. And when I do, I'll kill you. A couple thousand kilometers away from the raging monster, Tatsumaki lays unconscious when a figure walks up to her and taps her shoulder. Hey, are you alright? The green-haired woman slowly opens her eyes to see King. King? What happened to the monster? Did you kill it? 
What monster? Later that day, the Hero Association receives a report from Tatsumaki, stating the important events that happened that day. The report finishes with King defeating the monster that had flipped the continent. The entire association breathes a sigh of relief. Leave it to the strongest man on earth to get the job done, I suppose. Are you an idiot? Saitama shouts as he delivers a punch to Boros's stomach. The alien's eye widens and he's sent flying for several hundred meters before crashing into the ground and rolling for 50 more meters before finally coming to a halt. The dominator of the universe clutches his stomach with one arm and coughs up comedic quantities of blood. Saitama begins walking toward him. You went ahead and fought a bunch of bad guys under my apartment? And then you destroyed the whole city? Where are we going to live now? And what about all the money and the discount coupons I had stored up? I can't pay to build myself a new house? Saitama exclaims, horrified. Genos looks at Boros stunned as well. You mean you actually flipped over a continent? Did you even consider what kind of devastation your actions would cause? The alien stumbles back to his feet, having mostly regenerated the internal damage Saitama's punch had dealt to his body. I did, and that's why I specifically held back from pushing it too far away from Earth. I lifted it only a couple thousand kilometers into space, so that when I kicked it back down, the continent wouldn't have time to build up momentum. If it did, things would have gone much worse. And how exactly is that meant to make up for blowing up my home? Yes, Master Saitama needs a place to stay. I implore you to get him one right away. What do you want me to do? I'm not a builder and I certainly can't get you any money. Surely your own S-Class hero's salary should be enough to buy a house somewhere. Being an S-Class hero pays well, but not that well. I'd need to save up money for a couple months for that, which is way too long. You're the one who got us into this mess, so you should get us out of it. And how do you suppose I do that? If you've got any ideas, I'm all ears. Why don't you try to become a hero or something? I'm a giant blue one-eyed alien. Yeah, the Hero Association, meant to kill monsters, will surely accept me into their ranks. Wait, that's actually a brilliant idea. Geno suddenly exclaims and Boros rolls his eye. I was being sarcastic. And I wasn't. I have an idea. We'll get you into the Hero Association. With your power, I'm sure you could become S-Class. With both of our salaries, we could get a new apartment built in no time. Again, how are you planning on getting the heroes to not want to kill me on sight? Or maybe you want me to just walk up to them, beat them all up and demand that they accept me into the association as a hero? I'd be taking on all the heroes at the same time. To be honest, that could be fun. No! Saitama exclaims as he slaps Boros hard enough to send the alien crashing into the ground. Follow me, you two. I need to introduce you to someone. Boros and Saitama, having no idea what to expect, proceed to follow Genos to another city. One that... hasn't been completely leveled yet. The unlikely trio arrives at a large building, which, as Boros notes, seems to look like a fortified lab of sorts. The group stops in front of a big door. Well, Boros guesses that it's a door. In actuality, it looks more like a vault. And his guess is proven correct when Genos gives someone a short call and the door to the building opens. The cyborg walks through the entrance and his companions follow him inside. Boros looks around curiously as the trio walks through a wide corridor. So, mind telling us what this place is? To put it simply, it's a laboratory where the genius scientist who made my body does his work. A place of technology, huh? In truth, I was interested in learning more about Earth's advancements in this department ever since I saw you for the first time. 
I guess this is as good a time as any. You've come to the right place then. Here you'll find some of the most advanced technology on Earth. The trio approaches a door at the end of the hallway. Genos opens it and everyone walks into a very large room filled with all kinds of machinery and robotics. Welcome everyone. Genos informed me that he'd be coming over, but he didn't mention any guests. Dr. Cruseno greets the group. Good day, Dr. Cruseno. My apologies for failing to tell you that I wouldn't be coming here alone today. This is my master, Saitama, and an acquaintance of ours, Boros. Boros, master, this is Dr. Cruseno. Genos introduces everyone. Oh yes, Genos has told me plenty about both of you. Kuseno takes a few steps closer to Saitama. So, you're Genos' mentor, correct? I've been waiting to meet you. He shakes the baldy's hand before looking over at Boros. And you must be the alien Genos told me so much about. I've been quite eager to get a chance to talk to you as well ever since your sparring match with Genos. Such fascinating opportunities to learn more about space don't come up often after all. He extends a hand to Boros as well. The alien looks at the scientist a little awkwardly before putting on a small smirk. The feeling is mutual. I am quite keen to learn more of this planet's technology. Perhaps I'll even ask for a favor or two. There have been a few ideas floating around in my mind ever since first meeting Genos. Though, uh, I'll have to decline the handshake. It's very hard for me to control my strength without my power-restricting armor on. I wouldn't want to accidentally crush your arm. Saitama leans closer to Genos and whispers into his ear. If only he'd been so considerate before deciding to drop a mountain on City Z. Genos nods in agreement. Oh, I see. Well, I'm looking forward to exchanging information with you, Boros, the doctor answers. With the introductions out of the way, Genos tells Boros to thoroughly explain his battle and the group's current situation to Kuseno. Meanwhile, in another dimension, a tall, muscular man wearing a cape and shades takes a seat on a luxurious couch and looks at a recent report he got from the Hero Association. The emblem on his chest reads, Blast. I couldn't believe it at first. A continent flying into space is not something you see often. To think that monsters such as this could exist on Earth. I thought I'd have to step in for sure. The idea of such powerful hostiles suddenly appearing on this planet is worrying to say the least. Though I am glad to know there is still another hero out there who can take on threats of this level. I can rest a bit easier knowing that King is looking after Earth. The man lets out a sigh of relief. Guess I'll get back to work now. I'll trust the S-Class to take care of Earth for now. Though I should keep an eye out, just in case. At the same time, Platinum S limps his way to a certain location. He walks slowly, as his body is heavily damaged. The cracks on his platinum skin are deep. One wrong move, and he could fall apart. Almost there. Just a few more kilometers, and I will reach them. I will heal, get stronger, kill Boros. The monster murmurs to himself. The only things holding his body together are an immense will to live and an unrelenting hatred for the alien. Back in the lab, Kuseno nods as Boros finishes his explanation. The alien mentions everything with one exception. He doesn't tell the group about God. He figures that he'll take care of that problem himself. And in truth, Deep down, Boros wants God all for himself. If Saitama took care of the entity first, the alien would miss out on possibly the most exhilarating battle of his life. And he doesn't want that to happen now, does he? So, you want me to get you into the Hero Association? 
And how do you suppose I do that? That's the exact thing I was wondering myself. Boros glances at Genos, clearly waiting for the cyborg to explain this idea of his. And it doesn't take long for the man to begin talking. I was thinking of asking you if it would be possible to develop some sort of appearance-altering technology to make Boros look like a human. Something that could let him pass as a hero, perhaps. Everyone's eyes widen. You really think that would be possible, Genos? It's an interesting idea, for sure. Would you actually be able to make something like that, Doctor? Hmm. I could try. But creating a device that would alter your entire body and make it look human would be very difficult. The old man rubs his chin in thought. Boros then comes up with an idea of his own. Would it be easier if you only had to modify my face? Certainly. I take it you have something else in mind for what to do with the rest of your body? I do. And it's something I've been thinking about ever since my first day on this planet. You see, I used to wear power-restricting armor before it was broken in my battle against Saitama. Without it, I've been having quite a hard time adjusting my strength for daily activities. I've certainly gotten better at suppressing myself, but it's still a hassle. If you could make me a set of power-limiting armor, it would make controlling my output a lot easier. And it would mask the rest of my body. I see. This way I would only have to mask your face and the armor would cover the rest of your body, as well as serve other purposes, like making you look like a real hero. Wait a minute. The hero exam requires the participants to dress down to their underwear. Armor would go against the rules. Boros could be exposed. What kind of stupid requirement is that? Just tell them you're a cyborg and the armor is a part of your body, and that it can't be taken off. I'll make sure to make the suit x-ray proof, so that they won't be able to tell you're lying. Alright. This is getting interesting. Let's get to it then. Boros, please lay down on that table over there. The man points at a nearby surgeon's table. I'll begin by examining your body proportions. Afterwards, I'll need to look at your energy levels and determine how much to limit them. I'll also have to find a material durable enough to withstand as much damage as possible from the wavelengths and neurogenesis you and how to readjust the amount of your body to actually suppress your mass to change your wavelengths and neurogenesis or if it should only be an illusion which your body would be the most optical and practical for you. Saitama turns around and begins walking out of the room. Where are you going, Master? You and the old man can take care of the science stuff. I'm going for a walk. I'll come with you, Master. What happens next is the first episode of Season 2, with Saitama meeting King and Genos battling the robot G4. The only big changes are that Saitama is always in his hero suit, since his regular clothes are in his apartment which is buried deep underground and completely wrecked, and that King never goes to Saitama's apartment for the same reason. Genos finishes his battle with G4 way faster this time due to being a lot stronger, since he has fought Boros before and got a lot of extra data from the battle, which allowed him to be upgraded a lot easier and better than in the original. The cyborg takes a part of G4 back to Kuseno's laboratory. He sees that the doctor is working hard on creating the things Boros asked of him and decides to just lay back for now. His own upgrades can come after the alien's tech is completed. At the same time, the Hero Association attempts to deal with the consequences of the planetary devastation impact. One of their top heroes, Tatsumaki, has been hospitalized for the foreseeable future thanks to her battle against four Dragon Level Plus monsters. Several cities that were neighboring City Z have suffered severe damage. Tens of thousands of people were left homeless, and many more were injured due to shattering glass, debris, and shockwaves. Incredibly strong volcano eruptions and earthquakes have brought global travel to a halt. The association desperately tries to control the situation by putting every single hero at their disposal to work. In addition to fighting off monsters, heroes who are B-class and below have to help with repairs to infrastructure and buildings. 
and every hero who is A-class has to help with the evacuations from damaged areas. Needless to say, the Hero Association is in a tough spot. And so, they call upon the criminals of the world to help them out. A meeting happens, just like in the original story. And, just like in the original, Garo makes his big entrance by defeating three A-class heroes with ease and decimating all of the criminals before leaving the building. With the Hero Association being on the ropes already, they put out an immediate hit on the man, publicating his face all over the continent and ordering all heroes to bring him down on sight. This only serves to motivate Garo more. And he actually doesn't run into Saitama like he originally did, as Saitama was shopping for a wig at the time and here he has no money so he wouldn't be out shopping. Days pass. Garo faces and defeats Tank Top Master, as well as several A and B class heroes, just like in the original story. Metal Bat is still assigned to guard one of the Hero Association's biggest funders and his son as they go hang out in a sushi restaurant. Since the Monster Association has already been dismantled by Boros here, no monsters show up, and the lunch isn't interrupted. Another change is that Garo doesn't fight Metal Bat. Originally, Garo found Metal Bat because of an announcement of a demon level threat appearing and Metal Bat being on the scene. With no monster, there is no announcement, and so Garo doesn't track the hero down. However, he still goes on to fight Watchdog Man and gets beaten up. Saitama also never learns about the Super Fight Ornament. With all his current problems, the Baldi doesn't have the time or motivation to seek out this hero hunter guy. Sure, he overhears Genos and Kuseno discussing him sometime, probably, or a king could mention Garo to him, and the Baldi is a little interested, but he's got bigger problems to worry about at the moment. This results in Saitama never participating in the Super Fight Ornament. And so, Garo doesn't run into him and King. Without sustaining damage from Saitama's kick, Garo is still in relatively good shape. In the original series, when he woke up from being kicked, Garo saw the A-class hero Death Gatling, but chose not to fight him because he was in bad shape. But here, he never even passes out, so he's already left the area by the time Gatling arrives. This means that Garo isn't anywhere near as injured as he was in the original, and he continues hunting heroes and growing stronger along the way. Since there is no monster association here, the Super Fight Tournament isn't interrupted by Goketsu, and Suiryu goes on to win with ease. One more change is that Haragiri, the Council of Swordsmen member who got killed by Atomic Samurai, never reveals himself as a monster here because, once again, the Monster Association is gone. So he's a monster in hiding, pretty much. In the original, Atomic Samurai was going to go after Garo before Haragiri's betrayal caused him to switch targets. But here, the samurai has no such distraction, so he, his disciples, and the Council of Swordsmen all split up into groups to go after Garo specifically. And of course, Bang and Bomb also scour the streets searching for the rogue martial artist. All this time, Boro stays with Kuseno, since the old man needs him around to perform checks and tests on the armor and face mask that he is creating. On the rare occasions when Kuseno doesn't need his assistance, Boro spars with Saitama. And when he does, he often finds himself on the wrong end of a beatdown as the Baldi takes out some of his frustrations on the alien. However, Boros can feel his power gradually growing with every sparring match. Eventually, he asks how Saitama managed to get the strong, and Caped Baldi gives him the answer. The alien doesn't know what a push-up, sit-up, or squat is, so he asks Saitama to demonstrate and then tries out this workout routine. He effortlessly completes the workout and looks at his sparring partner unsatisfied. R really That's all you did? It's ridiculously easy. Eventually, Kuseno finishes the technology and has Boros properly put it on before inviting Genos and Saitama to check out his work. The Master and Disciple make their way to the lab, unsure what to expect. They enter the room and are greeted with an impressive sight. Genos' eyes widen. Boros? Is that really you? 
The resemblance is strong, but you could definitely pass as a hero now. Yes, I believe I could. And this armor is perfect. It's much easier to suppress myself with it on. So, is the face just temporary, or did you get some surgery and change it forever? Because it's kinda creeping me out. It's a face mask of sorts. It's made of a thin layer of a special shape-shifting metal. He can take it on and off at will, so the change isn't permanent. Alright, now all that's left is getting you into the Hero Association. Should be easy enough. Even with this armor, I'm still more than strong enough to be considered a threat level dragon. And if I'm not mistaken, I only need to be demon level to get into S class, right? You certainly have the power aspect covered, but that's only half the marks on the hero exam. And what is the other half? The written exam. Now sit down and listen. You have to get into the S class, so I'll be teaching you all you need to know to pass. Listen closely. I agreed to become a hero to make up for the continent flip. I didn't sign up for a studying session. Saitama walks up to Boros and looks at him menacingly without saying a word. A sweat drop appears on Boros' forehead. Uh, when do I start studying Genos? Meanwhile, in the Hero Association headquarters, a meeting is being held between the highest ranking board members. The repairs have been coming along relatively well, but the Hero Hunter still hasn't been caught. We also haven't been able to contact several B and C class heroes. We've tried calling them, visiting their apartments, contacting their families, and so far we've got nothing on them. It's as if those heroes just disappeared off the face of the planet without a trace. Think Garo got to them? That was my first thought as well, but after thinking it over, I seriously doubt that this is his doing. Garo claims to be a monster, but he's never once killed a hero as far as we know. He just beats on them and leaves. Kidnapping or killing isn't his style. Every hero attacked by him so far has been found within a day of the assault happening. But these heroes have been missing for days now. So you think someone else is responsible? Someone or something. Right now, we don't have enough information to make any conclusions. I suggest we continue to monitor the situation closely. Indeed, this is quite worrying. If the heroes continue disappearing like this, we're going to have to take drastic measures. Boros and Genos walk through the street of a highly populated city. The two of them are on their way to the facility where the next hero exam will be held. I have to say, the doctor did an excellent job with his disguise. People actually don't find me suspicious at all. I told you he's one of the best mechanics and inventors this earth has to offer. I can only think of two others who might be on his level. But never mind that. Don't forget, you have to pass this exam with perfect scores all across the board. Do you remember all the theory I taught you? Oh, come on, have some faith. You and Saitama had me study for the last five days straight and I'm no idiot. I'll definitely pass this stupid exam and get into the S-Class. I'll hold you to it. The two warriors arrive at the location of the test and Genos leaves Boros to participate. Of course, Boros does not register under his real name and instead uses a fake name he and Genos had come up with beforehand, Kenji, meaning strong. While the exam is going on, the cyborg heads to the room where all the examiners are stationed and puts in a good word for Boros. In the end, Boros passes with a score of 99 out of 100, because he made a few grammar errors. Hey, cut him some slack, he had five days to learn all the basics of the grammar of the English language and how to be a hero all while Saitama was looming over him menacingly. With a nearly perfect score and a recommendation from Genos, Boros becomes S-Class, rank 16. Just above Tanktop Master and Puripuri Prisoner, but below Genos and Metalbat.
and almost immediately after getting his status, he's assigned on a mission. The Hero Association is working overtime at this point, so as soon as they get a new pair of hands, they put them to work. With his power-limiting armor, Boros is around the same level of strength as Darkshine, so he's easily capable of dealing with most monsters, dragons included. And, knowing all the theory and rules of being a hero thanks to Genos, the alien does a pretty good job from the very start. Unlike C, B and A class heroes, S class still gets some special treatment, and they don't have to work on rebuilding and evacuating cities, which leaves them free to handle monster attacks. So Boros spends his days simply patrolling the streets. He walks everywhere with Genos at first until the cyborg is convinced that Boros knows how to interact with people and eventually agrees to let Boros patrol on his own. The alien, for the first time since arriving on Earth, is able to observe the daily life of regular people. He sees shops, apartments, office buildings, markets and so much more. This is his first time experiencing human culture properly, so it's a lot to take in. Of course, Genos made sure to educate Boros on the theoretical side of things, but hearing about something and actually seeing and interacting with it firsthand are two totally different things. The alien feels a bit awkward at first, but is soon able to adapt to society and plays the role of hero well. However, not all is well, as Garo is still running around hunting heroes. He steadily grows stronger as a result of this, but facing mere B and A class heroes isn't enough. After he fully recovers from his battle with Watchdog Man, the human monster begins to search for his next S-Class target. And Garo is soon able to find one in the form of Puripura Prisoner, who he beats pretty handily. Little does he know that his exploits catch the attention of a certain bird monster, who begins keeping a close eye on the hero hunter from afar. After an uneventful week of dealing mostly with disaster-level wolf weaklings, Boros finally hears an interesting announcement sound off across the city. A monster has appeared nearby, and it's estimated to be a demon-level threat. Alright, finally something a bit more interesting. Boros smirks before running over to the monster's location. Once he arrives, he sees a young woman with a curvy figure and dark green hair, in a green dress and a white fur coat presumably a hero. However, the alien is a lot more interested in the monster the woman is facing. A giant hound with six eyes. Boros recognizes the dog instantly. Hey, this thing was with the Monster Association. I remember it managed to survive some attacks from me. This is going to be the perfect test for my new armor. The alien becomes quite excited. Meanwhile, Fubuki stands before Overgrown Rover, terrified. What the heck is this thing? Nothing I do even phases it. That damned announcement was wrong. This is clearly disaster level dragon. The Esper thinks to herself before noticing the dog monster's mouth begin to glow. Her eyes widen as Rover shoots a massive energy blast at her. Fubuki desperately puts up a shield to protect herself, but is unsure if it will be enough. At that moment, Boro swoops into the scene, grabs the B-class hero and carries her out of the way of the attack. He lands on a nearby rooftop, lays the woman down and jumps back to the street to face the monster without saying a word, leaving Fubuki quite confused. Who is that? A hero? I've never seen him before. Is he new? The alien lands right in front of Rover and waves a hand at the creature. Long time no see. How you been? He asks with a grin on his face before getting ready to fight. If I remember correctly, last time we met I considered taking you in as a pet. Let's see if that idea holds up. Rover looks at the hero suspiciously. This guy... He reminds him of someone. But it couldn't be him, could it? The dog monster leans forward a bit and smells the alien. Suddenly, it recognizes the scent. There's no doubt about it. This is the guy who beat him up a while ago. Rover's eyes go wide. He turns around before dashing away in fear. The hero from outer space looks on confused. What? Why are you running? Hey, come back! He runs after the creature. Noticing this, the dog monster becomes even more terrified and starts running away faster putting all its best efforts into escaping the alien, 
school in order to keep up increases his own speed to the maximum. Hey, hold on! Are you scared of me or something? Boros shouts as he's just barely able to close the distance between himself and the monster and grabs onto Rover's tail. This action gets a big reaction out of the dog monster. His eyes widen and he begins thrashing around, shaking and jumping all over the place in an attempt to get the alien to let him go. However, Boros holds onto the dog monster's fur and even begins crawling up the creature's back until he reaches the top of Rover's head. Stop thrashing around, damn it! You're causing damage to the city! Boros shouts as he punches the monster's head repeatedly with all the power his armor allows him to output. Rover howls in pain, but doesn't stop. Instead, he suddenly jumps into the air, flips over and lands on his back and head, crashing the alien into the ground as well. Boros grunts, but refuses to let go and punches Rover again. The dog gets back to his feet and shakes his head violently. The S-Class hero glances at his armor. It seems to be holding up fine, no cracks or anything like that. The doctor really did a good job, didn't he? But still, if this goes on, I'm not sure how much more of this gear can take. Hey, animal! You want me to let you go so badly? Fine! He jumps into the air above Rover, before rocketing at his head and crashing into his skull with a massive kick, forcing the monster to the ground. Boros lands right in front of the hound. Now stay down, he orders the creature. Rover responds by opening his mouth wide before attempting to chomp down on the alien. Boros raises his hands to catch the jaws, following his natural instinct to take attacks head on. However, right as the monster's teeth are about to make contact with the palms of his hands, he remembers that he should probably avoid damage as much as possible to keep his suit intact. So at the last second, the S-Class hero jumps back and avoids the bite. Almost immediately after he does, Rover opens his mouth again and without warning shoots out a giant blast at the alien, who's still in the air. Due to the armor on his body, Boros can't simply release energy to propel himself out of the way. He can't dodge. He puts up his arms and legs to protect his body and takes the attack head on. The energy explodes on his body upon contact. No! Buki shouts, still watching the battle from the rooftops. She becomes worried that the hero may have died from that last attack. However, as the explosion dissipates, the Esper sees the man still standing. His armor is a little singed up, but other than that, he seems unfazed. Boros himself looks at the armor in surprise. Whoa! Only a slight burn mark from a blast like that? This armor is really something else. It might even rival the durability of my previous power limiting set. Maybe. He marvels before turning to face the dog monster again, who has taken this time to stand back up. Rover growls before opening his mouth to shoot another blast. Alright, that's enough! Boros shouts and lunges at Rover again, ready to dish out a pummeling the dog monster wouldn't be forgetting anytime soon. A few minutes later, Rover's body hits the ground again, and Boros presses his head down to the ground with both hands while staring directly into Rover's eyes. Listen up, you stupid animal. I am not going to hurt you anymore if you just calm the hell down. But if you don't, I am going to have to kill you. So either you accept my offer, or I will be forced to leave your brain splattered all over the place. Now choose! Rover growls a bit, before his voice softens into a whine. He stops resisting, which makes Boro sigh. Finally! Took you long enough to submit. Though I will say, I like that fiery temper of yours. You'll make for a good pet for me. He says with a satisfied smirk. Pet? What do you mean, pet? You're not going to kill this thing? Fubuki shouts to the S-Class hero, having floated herself down from the rooftop she was on before. Why would I do that? This monster is acting exactly like a dog. He can be trained. 
Don't worry, I'll teach him some manners. Perhaps he can even help the Hero Association from time to time in dealing with other, less trainable monsters. Are you insane? The Hero Association would never allow this. The Esper objects instantly. Huh. <laughs> Shows how much they understand. Monsters aren't all as unreasonable as you people think. Boros retorts before turning to Rover and petting his head a little. All right, boy, stand up. As if on command, the dog monster rises to his feet. Oh? Do you really understand my words? Uh, sit. Again, Rover complies and sits down. Boro smirks and turns to Fubuki with a smug smirk on his face. See? It's all a matter of discipline. This one acts like a dog, so you've just gotta train it. Fubuki looks on in pure shock and disbelief. Anyway, this boy won't be very useful in cities. His size alone is enough to cause destruction. But I'll keep him somewhere. If there's ever a chance, I'll have him dispatch of some monsters. Boros says before jumping onto Rover's back and sitting down. Alright boy, time to go. Wait, who are you? Fubuki shouts. Boros looks down at her, still smirking. I am the Class S, rank 16 hero, Kenji. While Boros works on taming Rover, an A-class hero, Death Gatling, takes interest in hunting down the Hero Hunter in order to get more recognition from the Hero Association. He gathers a team of A and B-class heroes, and this time around, he has more time to find more people for this operation. So instead of 8 heroes, he gathers 15 and sets off to search for Garo. Such a large group of heroes walking around the streets, of course, gets a lot of attention from the public, and the hero hunter soon hears of it. One day, Garo confronts the group in broad daylight. This fight is quite a bit different from the one in the original series. Obviously, there's more heroes this time, but Garo is also stronger, and by a good margin too. He's been hunting heroes for longer, and he's in top shape, unlike in the original fight. The hero hunter would likely also take the time to read up on the group hunting him before facing them, so he'd know all of their special moves and abilities, and their weaknesses. All this leads to Garo defeating the entire group within minutes. It's a bit of a struggle, but he succeeds and gets out of the area way before any stronger heroes can arrive. From a nearby rooftop, Phoenix Man watches on, quite pleased at what he's seeing. He's quite strong. Definitely powerful enough to be of use for me as a partner. Though I don't like that he keeps leaving his prey alive. Well, that can be worked through. I'm more concerned if he will actually be willing to cooperate with me. Later that same day, Sitch meets up with the bearded worker in Senegar in the Hero Association headquarters. He speaks up first. Any news regarding the CNB class hero disappearances? Yes, but they're not good news. Seven more heroes have disappeared since our last meeting and Senegar has stumbled onto some very concerning info that might be related to our current plight. What is it? Local wildlife has been vanishing all around the continent. This started at around the same time the heroes started disappearing, and I believe it's no coincidence. If animals began vanishing in only one area, we could reasonably assume that a monster of some kind has established a living spot there and is devouring them. But this is different. All kinds of animals are going missing all over the continent with no rhyme or pattern. This cannot be the work of some mindless monster. To add on to that, if this is the work of some entity, it has to be extremely intelligent. It's making sure we can't track down its location by targeting areas all around the world. Furthermore, it would have to be ridiculously fast to be able to get from one part of the continent to another in such a short amount of time. Either that, or we're dealing with not one, but with many threats at the same time. What should we do, Sitch? Is there any report of an A-class hero vanishing yet? 
No, there isn't. Perhaps whatever is causing these disappearances is afraid of going up against the higher ranked heroes? That would indicate that it's not very strong, or at least that it doesn't want to get our attention. I recommend sending a few A and S class heroes to investigate all the areas where people and animals have vanished. And please inform every hero of what's going on. Have them form teams and take measures to protect themselves. All right. In Kuseno's lab, Genos lays on a surgeon's table as the doctor works on upgrading him once again. Suddenly, an alarm sounds off across the laboratory, and a robotic voice announces that a monster has been detected at the front entrance of the building. Genos prepares to fight, while Kuseno quickly runs over to a nearby control panel to get a visual on the monster through a camera. And what he sees surprises him greatly, to say the least. What do you see, Doctor? Genos shouts, concerned. It's Boros riding on top of a giant monster dog hound thing. The cyborg's eyes widen. What in the world is Boros thinking? This is the middle of a city. At the same time, Saitama enters the room. He's been staying in the laboratory building for the last couple weeks since his apartment got destroyed. What's going on here? Why is the alarm interrupting my nap? Apologies, Master. Seems like Boros brought a monster here. I'll go check things out right away. Genos runs off to confront the alien. Having nothing better to do, Kuseno and Saitama follow him. The cyborg opens the entrance to the building and is greeted with the same sight the doctor had described to him. A giant, 10 meter tall dog monster, with Boro sitting on top of it. Hey, Genos! You look a little different since our last talk. Have you gotten upgraded again? What the hell are you doing, Boros? You can't just go around riding monsters in the middle of a city! Straight to the point. As usual, I see. This is my new pet. I haven't come up with a name yet. But I'm considering... What do you mean, pet? This is a monster. A hero can't be seen doing stuff like this. What if it attacks civilians? Calm down. There's nothing to worry about. I've already trained it. Boro says before dismounting the dog monster and jumping down to the ground. He looks at Rover, and orders him to sit. As soon as the monster hears the command, it sits down, obediently. Genos and Kuseno both look stunned. Saitama seems unfazed, however. Cool, you found us a dog. He walks over to Rover and pets his nose. Master, is this really okay? If the Hero Association finds out... They already know. There was another hero on the scene when I encountered and tamed this guy. I'm sure she's already reported this to the higher-ups. Genos' jaw drops. We're doomed, aren't we? Don't worry, I'll take care of everything regarding the Hero Association. The cyborg lets out a sigh. I'm sure you will. While Boros plays hero, Garu keeps up his hero hunter antics by finding and beating down various lower class heroes. He's careful not to leave any trail for Bang and Bomb to follow. As reckless as he is, he doesn't want to face off against those two just yet. However, it's been a little while since he's had a decent challenge, and he's beginning to get a little upset about that. Thankfully, his next set of opponents is a lot more interesting. Atomic Samurai, his disciple Ziyan, Akamataichi, and Bushi Drill, and the Council of Swordsmen have been trailing Garo in separate groups, and eventually, the disciple trio ends up running into the human monster on a populated street. Garo's lips curve into a smirk, and a gleam of excitement appears in his eyes. Alright, the runner ups of the A class are here. Tell me, where's your master, Atomic Samurai? If you lead me to him, I promise not to mess your faces up too badly. 
so you think you're above the A-Class now? Is that what you're telling us? Eion grips his sword, ready for battle. The other two disciples follow his example. Bushi Drill takes a moment to reach his hand behind his back and secretly presses a button on his phone as well, alerting any nearby heroes to their location. So what if I am? Are you going to do anything about it? Garo takes a signature fighting stance, prepared to use the water stream rock smashing fist from the very start. Despite his taunting, the hero hunter is very well aware that the top ranking A-class heroes are no joke and facing three of them at once could be challenging. The two sides face off in a moment of quiet before the storm. The people around them notice this and back away. Some even start running, not wanting to get caught in any kind of crossfire. Garo is about to tell the disciples to come at him, when the three of them charge him head on, with the Ion in the front and the two others behind him ready to jump in to protect their friend, or attack their foe. Without warning, Okamaitachi suddenly jumps into the air above everyone and swings her sword, causing a slicing shockwave of air to fly at Garo. The martial artist immediately figures out that this move is meant to make him jump back to avoid it, and when he's in the air, unable to dodge, the other two swordsmen will attack him. And so, instead of jumping back, Garo bursts forth right at Iyan with a punch, ducking under the slicing airwave and surprising the A-class trio. However, the top disciple of Atomic Samurai doesn't lose his cool and unsheathes his sword at lightning speed before using its blunt side to block the punch. At the same time, Bushi Drill rockets his drill sword at Garo's side, which forces the hero hunter to dodge, giving Iyan more space to attack. The two A-class heroes unleash a barrage of sword swings at the martial artist who does his best to dodge every single attack and even works in a couple counterattacks of his own, which are quickly blocked by the two swordsmen. Very soon, Akamaitachi lands on the ground behind Garo and attacks his back. This catches the human monster by surprise, and he actually receives a slight cut for the first time in the battle before getting out of the way and jumping back to get some distance between himself and his foes. However, the three disciples charge at him again, not giving him any time to catch his breath. The three of them coordinate their attacks flawlessly and push Garo back. The hero hunter's eyes dart around, attempting to follow his opponent's movements as he uses Bang's martial arts to dodge, redirect and block the attacks as best as he can, but with so many blades swinging his way, even he gets a few cuts. The man grunts as Iyan manages to inflict a significant wound by driving his blade through his arm. However, Garo instantly sees an opportunity here. As the swordsman attempts to pull the sword out, Garo tenses up the muscles in his arm, trapping the blade and preventing Iyan from getting his weapon back. At the same time, the hero hunter rockets his free fist at his foe's face. Seeing this, Iyan is forced to let go of his weapon to get out of the way of the punch. However, not all is good for Garo as the other two A-class heroes rush him from both sides. The martial artist crouches down and jumps high into the air, way above the incoming attack. Big mistake! Akamaitachi shouts as she starts swinging her sword, creating many air blades that shoot at the hero hunter. Garo's eyes narrow. He pulls the iron sword out of his arm and uses it to block the slices before landing on the ground and rushing at the trio. He swings the sword wildly, forcing Akamaitachi and Bushi Drill to block it with their own swords. Iyan, meanwhile, attempts to circle around Garo to hopefully prevent him from jumping back again, as well as put pressure on him from behind. Noticing this, the hero hunter smirks. He suddenly turns around and rushes at the disarmed hero. However, as he tries to hit Iyan with the sword, the swordsman easily dodges the swings. You really think you can cut a master swordsman with sloppy strikes like these? Iyan asks. No, but I can do this! Garo drops the sword and proceeds to attack Garo with his water stream rock smashing fist. Before the other disciples can get to their friend, the hero hunter pummels him as much as possible and with a massive uppercut, ends up knocking Iyan onto his back, before turning to face the other two heroes. With the fight having turned into a 2v1 instead of a 3v1, Garo has a much easier time and is able to keep up a lot more easily. Soon, he manages to disarm and defeat Akamitachi and Bushi Drill. He pants heavily. As he turns around to finish off Iyan, he sees a sword shooting at his face. 
At the last possible moment, Garo just barely dodges the thrust, but gets a pretty deep cut on his cheek. Seems the Ion has recovered from the pummeling he's received and picked up his sword to fight again. You're a persistent one, aren't ya? He laughs and the fight resumes as a 1v1. It's a difficult struggle for both men, but in the end, Garo is able to find an opening and knocks the Ion out. He takes a moment to look at himself. The battle ended in his favor, but he received numerous cuts all over his body, as well as a stab wound on his arm. Damn. This is bad. I'm bleeding too much. He begins walking, hoping to get back to his hideout. So you're the infamous hero hunter. Not impressed. I was expecting someone cool and intimidating, but all I see is a guy who has too much time on his hands. A voice comes from behind Garo, who quickly turns around to see who's talking, only to see a child. But not just any child. Class S, rank 5, Child Emperor. What are you doing here? Isn't it obvious? I received a call for backup from a hero and rushed over here. Many other heroes got the message too, so they'll be here soon. You're pretty much finished. The kid informs the hero hunter. Garo frowns. So one of those three managed to call for backup, huh? Guess this means this place is about to become a bloodbath! Just to let you know, I'm not above beating up a child if they're playing hero. Garo breathes in deeply before bursting a child emperor. The child genius immediately activates his backpack and numerous weapons shoot out of it, causing the martial artist's eyes to widen. Giant knives, saws, claws, swords and guns all start swinging and shooting at him. What the hell? Garo shouts in surprise as he just barely dodges or deflects the attacks. What kind of cheat code backpack is that? How is it physically possible to have this much bullshit in there? It's called technology, stupid. Child Emperor retorts as his backpack grows several spider-like legs and suspends the kid safely in the air while all his weapons do the fighting. Garo is pushed back further and further as the dozens of weapons pressure him. The human monster is forced to push his body to its limit just to survive. There's not even a chance to counterattack. This is the end for you, Hero Hunter! Child Emperor exclaims as he drops several black balls out of his backpack, which morph into dogman robots and rush at Garo, putting even more pressure on the man. Garo lets out a roar and uses his water stream rock smashing fist to deflect hits from the backpack with his hands, while dismantling the robots with kicks. However, once he destroys a couple of them, the remaining three robots fuse together, forming a humanoid robot Cerberus, which is actually able to somewhat match Garo in terms of strength and lends a few hits on Garo, making him cough up blood. As the human monster fights for his life, Child Emperor drops a few more Dogman robots to attack him. The martial artist's body receives dozens of cuts, bruises and blows, even with him doing his best to deflect the incoming attacks. Garo's vision begins to blur slightly due to all the pain and blood loss. He begins seeing flashes of his childhood, what the hell is this? My life flashing before my eyes? Child Emperor's words echo in his mind. This, this is the, the end, end for you, hero, hero hunter. hunter. Is this really the end? Beaten by a child playing hero? No. I won't allow it. You think this is the end for me? Well, you're wrong! MY JOURNEY IS FAR FROM OVER! Garo screams as his body surges with strength. He leans back before driving both of his fists into the ground, shattering the entire street and knocking Child Emperor off balance. In a fit of pure rage and determination, the human monster destroys all of the Dogman robots, including the Cerberus, in mere seconds, before getting on all fours and beginning to dart around all over the battlefield kicking off buildings and rocks from the wrecked street. He moves so fast the Child Emperor can barely even keep track of him. What's going on? Where did all the strength come from? 
he shouts as Garo shoots around, dismantling all his backpack weapons one by one. Don't you get it? This is the power of Garo the monster! Garo screams from the top of his lungs as he gets behind Child Emperor and punches his backpack with all his strength, completely decimating the technology and sending the hero flying. Child Emperor lands headfirst on the hard concrete. He grunts in pain as Garo stops to stabilize his breathing. The martial artist's vision becomes even more blurry. His body bleeds and aches all over. Any normal person would have long since collapsed from such wounds. But Garo just takes a deep breath and begins walking away as fast as he can, knowing that more heroes will show up soon. Suddenly, a pair of giant claws lands on his shoulders and grips them tightly before lifting him into the air. What? What's going on? Who are you? Garo shouts confused as Phoenix Man takes off into the air, carrying him. Hello, Hero Hunter. I am Phoenix Man, and I don't mean you any harm. In fact, I'm getting you to safety. I don't need any help! Where'd you even come from? I've been watching you for quite some time, waiting for a chance to chat. I have an offer for you, but that can wait. This place will be crawling with heroes soon. Let's just get out of here. You can piss off! Put me down! Garo struggles to get out of the monster's grip, but to no avail. And before long, the damage his body had accumulated gets the better of him, and he passes out. Garo? Did you fall asleep? Good. Makes my job easier. I just hope that when you wake up, you'll be more cooperative. After all, I need a partner who's actually willing to work alongside me. Now that the Monster Association is gone, I thought I'd be in trouble. But it seems the world has brought me another opportunity. One that isn't as grand, but perhaps even more intriguing than the last one. Phoenix Man flies off into the horizon, with Garo in his claws. At the same time, far away from Garo, Boros, or any population center for that matter, Platinum S descends into a large cave he's opted to make his temporary base of operations ever since losing to the alien. Next to him stands a short figure. The two monsters make their way to the main space of the cave. Hey everyone, we're back. Welcome back! How many did you bring this time? Around 200 billion. With this latest batch, we finally have enough to begin. Finally! Alright, let's get to it right away. I couldn't agree more. Do it! A huge light illuminates the entire cave. As it dissipates, Platinum S starts laughing. <laughs> yes! It worked! It actually worked! <laughs> Boros! You will rue the day you let me live! With this, I'll conquer the planet in no time. In fact, the existence of the alien proves that there's an entire universe out there for me to take hold of. <laughs> Just you wait. I'll become the ruler of it all. The monster laughs maniacally. Whatever is about to happen next, it will change the world forever. The day after the incident with Rover, Boros gets a message from the Hero Association. He reads it out loud to Genos and Saitama. S-Class Rank 16 Hero Kenji, we have been informed that you have shown some behavior unbefitting of a hero. In order to figure the situation out, 
We have prepared a meeting spot near the Hero Association headquarters. You are obliged to go there right away. And bring the dog with you. Oh, and there's also an extra note ordering you to come along, Genos. Boros finishes reading the message. Genos frowns. They probably want me to come because I recommended you to them during the hero exam. So, what now? We do as they say and pray that the two of us don't lose our jobs in the association. Or worse. Don't worry, I'll handle this. Boro says and Geno sighs. I doubt that. Boros, paying no attention to the cyborg's worries, summons Rover and jumps onto his back. Hop on, we're heading out. The two heroes, mounted on top of a monster hound, head toward the meeting place. Once they arrive, they see a large military hangar-like structure, which wasn't there the last time they'd visited. It must have been built urgently, specifically for this occasion. Boros, Genos, and Rover walk closer to the building and are greeted at the front door by several heroes. A-Class, Rank 1, Amai Mask. S-Class, Rank 3, King. S-Class, Rank 8, Zombie Man. S-Class, Rank 11, Super Alloy Darkshine. And S-Class, Rank 13, Flashy Flash. Five S-Class level heroes, including the Hero Association's Ultimate Trump Card. The hero who is believed to have defeated a near god level threat not long ago and was promoted to rank 3, King. This isn't just a regular meeting. The Hero Association has brought in enough firepower to wipe out almost any threat in existence. And Genos notes that if Boros and himself don't give a damn good explanation for the aliens' actions, that firepower might be turned against them. Boros, meanwhile, obviously understands this as well, but is more focused on sizing up the hero standing before him. All of them, with the exception of the men in a trench coat, possess exceptional fighting ability, he's sure of it. And King especially, the strongest man on earth. Boros notes that he can't sense any power from him. How interesting, seems this hero has the ability to conceal his power completely but he still has a certain aura around him. One that sends light shivers down the spine of the alien. What an enigma. Boros has to actively hold himself back from challenging him to a fight right here and now. His thoughts are interrupted by a My Mask. Heroes riding a monster into a meeting with other heroes? How disgusting. Boros scoffs at the comment. What are you talking about? I'm just showing my pet around. Watch your mouth, newbie. Say something like that again and I won't hesitate to smash your head in. And my mask scowls. In response to this, Boros jumps down from Rover's back and lands right in front of the idol hero, towering over him. Go ahead and try. No, no, calm down, everyone. Let's head inside and begin this meeting. Darkshine puts a hand on Boros and Amai Mask's shoulders. Genos touches down on the ground as well and gives the alien a glance, with an expression that screams, please don't escalate this any further. A bit reluctantly, Boros backs off from Amai Mask and turns to the dog monster. Alright boy, lay down and stay here until I come back. Howl if anyone tries to harm you while I'm gone. With no delay, Rover does as he's told and lays down on his belly. The heroes look on, flabbergasted. A monster obeying a human so willingly. This is certainly unprecedented. However, they soon get over the initial surprise and, together with Boros and Genos, enter the hangar. Inside, there is a large table with several big chairs around it. At the end of the table sit two association executives, Sekingar and the bearded worker, also known as Busho. Both of them look uneasy. Busho tells everyone to sit down at the table and the meeting begins. Sekingar asks Boros why he insists on having a dragon level monster as a pet, telling him it goes against their values as heroes and is very risky and dangerous. Boros responds by describing his encounter with Rover, how he noticed Rover acts just like a big dog and is even able to understand commands. 
The heroes are short-staffed already due to the catastrophic continent flip that happened recently, and a lot of them are busy helping with repairs and damage control, so there's less time and less people to kill monsters. Rover being able to be trained to deal with monster attacks and defend people is a benefit of the Hero Association. He could even act as a guard dog for the Hero HQ. However, the My Mask quickly counters by saying any dog can turn on his master at any time, even a well-trained one. Even a Chihuahua can bite its owner, so what's to keep this giant hellhound from wrecking havoc if it so chooses? The discussion becomes more heated with Geno speaking up in support of Boros, Zombie Man and Darkshine also seem to be on his side for the most part. Flashy Flash and Sekengar are cautiously against the idea, while Amai Mask completely refuses to even consider allowing Rover to live. Busho is somewhere in the middle, attempting to mediate. While the conversation is going on, King internally scrambles to think of a way to get everyone to just chill out. After a bit of thinking, he comes up with a solution. His heart begins beating louder because of his nervousness to express this idea. The King engine sounds off across the room. Everyone notices and turns toward him, causing the engine to intensify as King begins feeling pressure to speak up. The room becomes quiet for a moment before the man begins talking. We all seem to have divided opinions on this matter, so I have a suggestion. Kenji is new here, and we are all surprised by his actions but I don't think we can deny him his right to make his own judgement call. Since he made the decision to take the monster under his wing, I propose we don't interfere with him or the pet unless they show signs of hostility toward the association. Of course, we need to keep tabs on the monster and terminate it if things get out of line, but for now I suggest we wait and see how this plays out. But what's the point if we end up killing it anyway? We only kill it if it acts out of line on my mask. Not before. We don't know how this is going to go. King has made his decision. I suggest you respect that decision. Zombie Man glares at the celebrity hero. Everyone collectively sighs. Their de facto leader has made a good proposal. Some reluctantly, and some less so, they all agree to his plan. For now, it seems like they are willing to give Boros the benefit of the doubt, if only because King said so in a My Mask and Flashy Flash's case. Alright, seems we have a temporary solution. Kenji, Genos, you and your monster are under a probation period from now on until we, as an association, are certain we can trust your judgement. The meeting goes on for a little while longer before Busho declares that they've figured out everything they can for the time being, ending the discussion. The heroes, some more happy than others, start to scatter. And my mask gives Boros one last glare before driving off in a limousine. The alien glares back before spotting King walking away from the hangar. He's about to shout for him to wait and challenge him to a duel, but before he can, Darkshine suddenly pats Boros on the back, getting his attention. The muscular hero compliments Boros for being strong-willed and standing his ground. He also says he's impressed by the fact that Boros managed to take on such a powerful dragon-level monster and offers to spar with them sometime. Boros happily accepts and the two heroes part ways. However, as Darkshine walks away from the alien, he can't shake this odd feeling of deja vu. Like he's somehow met Kenji before, but he can't quite place a finger on it. The alien turns to Gavta King again, but to his surprise, the man is already out of sight. I see. So he's the elusive type. A few hundred kilometers away from Hero HQ, Garo opens his eyes in a damp, dimly lit cave. His memory is a bit foggy at first, but he soon remembers what happened. He was taken to the brink of death in a battle against several heroes and taken to the sky by some weird bird creature. He immediately shoots up to his feet and clenches his fists. His body does not ache any longer, and there are no wounds either. How long was he unconscious? The martial artist's eyes dart around the cave, adjusting to the lighting. Soon, he's able to make out the approximate layout of the cave. It's full of stalactites. Water drips down from their tips every now and again. Where are you, birdface? 
Garo shouts into the darkness. His voice echoes throughout the cave. A few moments later, a response comes from the shadows. I am right here with you. With those words, Phoenix Man steps out into the light, revealing himself to Garo, who quickly gets into a fighting stance. Do not worry, Hero Hunter. I do not wish you any harm. If I did, I could have easily killed you in your sleep. But instead, I healed you. Please keep that in mind as we chat. Garo's eyes narrow. I can see that for myself, dumbass. Why did you do this? And how long was I asleep? You seem a lot more open to conversation than the last time we talked. That's good. Just answer my questions. Very well. You were unconscious for almost five days, though nothing too noteworthy happened in that time. As for why I did what I did, I seek companionship. Or, more accurately, a partner in crime, so to speak. You see, I used to be part of something called the Monster Association, but it was recently wiped out by a powerful force. This has left me with little protection from the heroes. What I want is a strong friend who could help me defend myself. And I also plan on eventually taking down the Hero Association myself. For that, I need people like you. You clearly have a bone to pick with the heroes, so I'm sure it would benefit us both. You could do the fighting, and I could be your getaway card when things get tough. What do you say, Garo? Garo grits his teeth. Tch, <laughs> so that's what this is about? Some weakling wants my help? And if you don't even have the strength to defend yourself from heroes, why the hell would you ever want to take on the entire association? You stupid or what? Phoenix Man tilts his head. Is that a no? Damn right it is! Garo shouts before suddenly bursting forward at the bird monster and punching him right in one of its eyes. There's no way I'd ever work with a weakling like you. Thanks for healing me though. Garo pummels the monster until it turns into mere mush on the floor. He turns away from the corpse and prepares to search for a way out of the cave. However, just as he does, a brilliant light appears behind him and lights up the cavern. Garo turns to look what's happening, but before his eyes can even adjust to the light, a hand suddenly shoots out at him and grabs his neck. Garo struggles to break free, but can't. He's lifted into the air. Well, well. Seems I underestimated your lone wolf mentality, hero hunter. If I was a normal monster, you really could have killed me. Unfortunately for you, I am no mere normal monster. A voice comes from the light, and when the shine dissipates, Garo sees what's before him. A tall man in a bird costume with red and orange color schemes. He would call it dumb looking if he wasn't struggling for breath right now. Feast your eyes upon the great Phoenix Man, Hero Hunter. You have wasted your chance at an alliance. And now, you will pay for it. The monster declares before jabbing his hand into Garo's stomach. His nails dig into the martial artist's body and blood spills out of his abdomen. Garo's eyes widen in horror. Not because he feels pain, but because he realizes he might just die here, without ever having accomplished his goal. He kicks out his legs and pulls at Phoenix Man's arm with his hands, trying to get him to let go. But the monster does not budge. Moments later, Phoenix Man pulls his hand out of Garo's stomach and gashes him across the chest with it, making him bleed even more. Satisfied, the monster drops Garo to the ground. He turns around and begins walking away. See you around, hero hunter. Phoenix Man waves goodbye before spreading out his wings and flying out of the cave, seemingly leaving Garo to bleed to death. However, the moment he's out of Garo's field of vision, the monster stops. He starts monologuing in his mind. Whether you want it or not, you will work with me. 
because the two of us are more alike than you could ever know, hero hunter. They say monsters get stronger every time they get close to death and overcome it. Seems I have managed to do just that. But what about you? Let's see if you are truly as much of a monster as you claim to be, Garo. If all goes well, you'll come back from this stronger than ever. And then we can have another chat. I've got some interesting news. Seems the Hero Association finally deems us as enough of a threat to call upon the S-Class. I saw Puri Puri Prisoner investigating one of the forests we recently visited. Really? Well, I suppose that's something we expected sooner or later. What are you going to do about it? For the time being, nothing. Even with stage one complete, I want some more insurance before getting too aggressive with the heroes. Wouldn't want them to become too alert. We have reason to believe that alien Boros has joined up with them. If they send him out to get us, things would turn sour. We don't have the capabilities to fight him off yet. We have to be patient. Let's lay low for a while and strike when we are ready. Garo wakes up again, in the same cave that he was carried to by Phoenix Man. The man gasps in shock at remembering what happened to him, how he was ragdolled by some weird bird monster. Garo looks over his body and sees that all of his wounds are gone once again, though there are some scars left on his chest and stomach. What in the world happened after he passed out? Why is he still alive? Many questions run through the hero hunter's mind, but he doesn't dwell on them. Instead, Garo stands up and starts searching for a way out of the cave. While on the move, he thinks over what happened. If the monster wanted him dead, he would likely be dead. Either the bird left him alive on purpose, or it didn't bother to finish him off and just walked away. Both options infuriate the martial artist, but they also both benefit him, seeing as he was able to survive because of them. Soon enough, Garo finds the exit from the cave and dashes away from it. He's back to full health now, so he'll lead up and then continue his hunt for strong heroes. Little does he know that a pair of eyes is watching him from the sky. Phoenix Man floats a few hundred meters above the human monster, with his arms crossed and a smirk on his face. At the same time, in a forest a few dozen kilometers away, a certain ninja is doing his daily training routine. Speedo sounds sonic pants as he finishes a round of kunai target practice on a poster of Saitama's face. Suddenly, he notices a presence approaching, and tells it to show itself. That's when he is attacked from two angles by two figures. A brief scuffle ensues, but afterwards, the two attackers introduce themselves as Hellfire and Gale. The two ninjas have been laying low ever since the Monster Association was wiped out. They were not in the base during Boros's battle with the Monster Association, so they came off scot-free. However, their plans for world domination have been pushed back quite a bit, they have two goals at the moment, to kill Flashy Flash and to conquer the world. They're confident that they could do the former, but the latter is a different matter entirely now. Knowing that there is a creature on this earth who could decimate the entire Monster Association in a single day, Hellfire and Gale realize that they need to get way stronger to be able to combat it. And they also need powerful allies. That's why they have come to Sonic. They explain their predicament to him, and at first, he isn't interested in helping them. But when they show him the power of their monster forms, he starts to waver. Hellfire and Gale have kept a couple monster cells they received from Orochi before his death in order to get new recruits for the Monster Association. So they are able to tempt Sonic with the promise of great power that monsterizing would provide to him. In exchange, he is obliged to help them kill Flashy and whoever wiped out the Monster Association. Sonic is willing to give up his humanity, and the two ninjas are a lot more desperate in this story compared to the original. So they don't just hand over the cell to Sonic and leave. No, they stick around until he eats it in front of them, and prevent him from cooking it. This means that Sonic is able to fully turn into a monster here. He keeps his human form and is able to transform into a monster at will, just like Hellfire and Gale. 
The power boost that comes from monsterizing astonishes Sonic, and he starts laughing to himself. However, he does see one issue with his deal he made with his fellow ninjas. Hellfire and Gale want to take down Flashy Flash, but Sonic was actually friends with him in the past during their training days. They've had a difficult relationship since then, but Sonic still doesn't want to take on Flashy in a 3v1. He actually starts planning to double-cross the two ninjas as soon as they start fighting Flash, and team up with Flash to beat them. After that, he wants to fight his former friend one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, he keeps all this to himself for now. Sonic also warns Hellfire and Gale about Saitama, and how much of a threat he is. The two ninjas don't really believe him, but they keep this in mind. And so, the three ninjas start training together in preparation for future battles. The ninjas are not the only ones training, though. Boros works on training Rover to be less destructive in cities and teaches him some basic strategies and battle combos so that they can fight together well. He teaches Rover some commands like Cover Me or Protect Civilians. With the dog's high intelligence, he's able to pick these commands up relatively quickly. This is also when Boros gives him a name. For simplicity's sake, let's say he names him Rover. Boros also does some training on his own. A lot of it, actually. He asks Dr. Kuseno to make him a set of armor that could suppress his energy levels even further. And when the armor is made, he starts doing basic training like push-ups, following in Saitama's footsteps. He finds the regular exercises to be boring, and he would much rather train by constantly having limit-breaking sparring matches with Saitama. Unfortunately, he is under Hero Association surveillance, so he can't really reveal his true power for the time being. And hey, with his power being suppressed to a mere 1 one hundred thousandth of his true release form strength, and with him getting better at suppressing himself too on top of that, after a few million push-ups he does start working up a sweat. Kuseno also benefits greatly from this, as he's installed a module in the armor that allows him to siphon the power radiating from Boris's body and direct it into his machines. That's how he's actually able to suppress so much energy, by transporting it to his lab and using it to power his devices. Soon enough though, his tech starts overflowing with energy, to the point of overheating. Kuseno thinks of more ways to disperse the power, and an idea quickly comes to mind. He'll just share the power with the entirety of the country. That's right, Boros is being turned into a nuclear reactor to power nearby cities while he trains. And the energy gathered is completely nature-friendly. Jokes aside, I think this actually could happen. One Punch Man is a very wacky series, and this is a wacky scenario, so you know, it, it works, I think. And Kuseno would probably actually do this, since it would allow Boros to actually gain some benefits from normal training, and dispersing the energy is pretty much the only way to consistently maintain it at low levels. Kuseno either just gets the power to radiate into the air aimlessly, or he uses it for the good of the people. He might even direct some energy into Genos to power him up, to be honest. It sounds fanfiction-y, but all what-ifs are fanfiction at the end of the day, so I think it's fine. Anyways, back to the story. Boros does also train in other ways, too. He occasionally spars with Genos. In these matches, he uses his regular armor, which suppresses him to around the strength level of Darkshine. He does have the edge on the cyborg in these matches, but the more Genos fights, the more data and experience he collects. Over time, upgrade after upgrade, Genos eventually receives a form not too dissimilar from his Daedric form in the original series. But that will happen further down the line. For now, let's flash back to the present, around three weeks after the battle between Boros and the Monster Association. Fubuki walks into a hospital, intending to meet someone. She checks in and strolls over to the ward her sister has been staying in ever since her big battle with Boros and other high-level monsters. She overexerted herself way too much, and took a lot of damage from the continent Flip Boros performed that day. It took time, but the Esper is just about ready to get back into the field. Fubuki enters her sister's ward and finds Tatsumaki sitting on a bed. Hi, how are you feeling? The doctor says I need to stay here for another day to make sure everything's alright, but I feel just fine. If the doctor told you to stay, I think you should do that. Wouldn't want any of your wounds reopening. Fubuki says as she sits down next to her sister. I'm fine. I know my own body better than anybody else does. Besides, I've already spent way too much time here. 
Monsters aren't going to destroy themselves. Who knows how many accidents have happened because of my absence by now. Oh, don't be like that. The Aeschylus heroes and I are capable of holding the front while you're gone. Many of us have had to work extra hard because of the aftermath of your battle a few weeks ago, but we're managing. There have barely been any incidents whatsoever lately. There's even a new S-Class hero in town. Hmm. Maybe my battle scared all the monsters off then. Tatsumaki boasts a bit before focusing on, on that supposed new hero. A new hero, you say? Is he any good? Hope he's not just another incompetent weakling trying to earn fame. We have enough of those already. She frowns. I think he's pretty good. He's been killing monsters left and right ever since joining the association. And he recently took down a dragon level monster all by himself. He actually saved my life too. Fubuki explains and Tatsumaki smirks a bit. Good. Seems he might not just be some hopeless moron then. It's always good to have heroes who take their job seriously. Agreed. Though there is one thing that's very surprising about him. What? When I say he took down a dragon level monster, I don't mean he killed it. He actually beat it into submission and took it in as a pet. What? Who in their rightful mind does that? Uh, so much for a competent hero. I assume he got kicked out of the association after that? Well, not exactly. The association had a meeting with him, and he was able to convince them to let him keep the monster. Oh, you've got to be kidding! Tatsumaki whines. Seems things really did spiral out of control while I was out of action. And of course, I'm going to have to be the one to clean this mess up again. How does this guy look and where does he live? I need to have a word with him. I'm not sure about where he lives, but I can show you a picture of him. She pulls out her phone and searches for Boros' name in the Hero Association heroes list and finds a picture of his full body. She turns the phone screen to her sister. Tatsumaki glances at the screen nonchalantly. However, just as she does, her blood runs cold. A sweat drop appears on her face. Fubuki notices this sudden change in demeanor. Is something wrong? No. This can't be. He looks human, but the resemblance is uncanny. But King killed him, right? How the hell would he have... Tatsumaki murmurs to herself as her face turns pale. This hero. It reminds her way too much of the monster she fought recently. The monster that hospitalized her in the first place. What's wrong, sis? Fubuki, when did this man enter the association? Uh, about a week after your big battle, I think. Fubuki answers and a vein pops out of Tatsumaki's forehead. Things are lining up way too well. Where is he now? I told you, I don't know- WHERE IS HE?! His address should be written in the Hero Association database! Tell me where he is right now! Fubuki is freaked out by her sister's sudden outburst, but complies right away. After a minute of searching, she finds the coordinates of Dr. Kuseno's lab, the place where Boros is currently staying. She tells her sister the address. Without saying a word, Tatsumaki shoots out of her bed and flies out through the window. Wait! You shouldn't use your powers yet! To hell with that! We might all be in great danger! Just sit here and stay away from that man! Tatsumaki shouts before rocketing off into the direction of Kuseno's laboratory. Near the building, Boros is currently teaching Rover the jump command, when he suddenly senses a power approaching rapidly. He turns in the direction of the incoming energy. It feels familiar, but he can't quite place a finger on it. The alien tells Rover to sit down and waits for the power he's feeling to come closer. Within moments, a figure appears in the horizon and quickly closes the distance between itself and Boros before coming to a halt right in front of the alien. Boros takes a look at the visitor and immediately recognizes her as Tatsumaki, the number two hero he fought not too long ago. Instantly, he gets nervous. Crap, she's seen his true form before, and she obviously came here to see him specifically since she stopped right in front of him. Does she recognize him from their battle? If so, things could get tense. 
Boro stands in place awkwardly as Tatsumaki stares him up and down while levitating before him. The woman is visibly nervous. Uh, can I help you? Boros asks before realizing she might remember his voice from their fight. Damn it, why didn't he think of that before opening his mouth? Did he say anything to her during the battle? Did she hear his voice? Boros genuinely can't remember. He stands still, hoping that she didn't hear him talking when they last saw each other. Thankfully, the Esper doesn't seem to have any particular reaction to his voice. Yes, I need to talk to you she says while hovering in front of Boros. She then lowers herself a bit and looks directly into the eyes of the alien. She breathes deeply a few times. My name is Tatsumaki, the number two S-Class hero. The Esper introduces herself calmly. She doesn't want to go in guns blazing just yet. For one, she's in a populated city right now. Second, she still isn't sure if this guy is truly the monster she fought. And third, if he is that monster in disguise, the Esper hates to admit it, but he is stronger than her. If he somehow survived, she would need to get King to come help deal with him. Wait, why didn't she just do that in the first place? While Tatsumaki is having her in her monologue, Boros responds. I know who you are. You're all over the news. What business does a high-ranking hero like you have with me? He asks with a slight caution to his tone. Tatsumaki remains calm and composed. I need to ask you some questions. I suppose I'll try to answer them as best as I can then. Tatsumaki breathes in, preparing to state her first question. However, an alarm abruptly sounds off in both of their heroes' communication devices that they have on themselves. The same ones used by the Hero Association to assign missions to the S-Class. Attention to all S-Class heroes within sprinting distance of the Hero HQ. A giant monster has appeared on the coast of City A. It's estimated to be threat level Dragon or above, and is rapidly making its way to the Hero Association headquarters. Evacuations are on the way. Any and all available S-Class heroes, you must head to the HQ now. I repeat, a gigantic Dragon level monster or above is currently heading toward the Hero HQ. Please hurry to protect it. Geno suddenly sprints out of Kuseno's lab. Did you hear that? I did. Tatsumaki turns away from Boros. I shall ask some other time. The Esper says before flying away to protect the Hero HQ. Boros and Genos glance at each other before going after her. Boros whistles for Rover to follow him as he and Genos run to the Hero HQ. Tatsumaki is ahead of them, given that she got a head start and can generally fly faster than they can run. She decides to put the whole Boros thing on hold for now and increases her speed further, blasting off at top speed toward the Hero HQ. Meanwhile, the Hero Association workers are in a panic. Evacuations by helicopter are on the way, but it's clear that most personnel won't be able to escape the building before the monster gets here. Busho runs into one of the observation rooms and asks for a report on the situation. A monster emerged on the shoreline and is making its way here. It appears to be made entirely out of water and is estimated to be around a hundred kilometers tall. There's no way. Can a living creature even get that big? According to Middle Night scanners, that's the confirmed height. We've sent out all available as glass heroes to try to stop it. Metal Knight's drones and missiles, Dark Shine, Flashy Flash, Tank Top Master, Metal Bat. Those are all the heroes at the scene so far. But even with all of them there, the monster shows no signs of slowing down at all. If the monster really is that big, nothing short of a nuclear bomb will make a dent. Terrible Tornado is the only hero who can replicate that kind of scale without spreading radiation all over the place. Where is she now? She's in the hospital. But her release date is due tomorrow. She should have heard the announcement. We can only wait and see. Ugh. How much time do we have before the creature reaches us? About five minutes at most. Busho frowns before sprinting out of the room and calling Metal Knight. Metal Knight, is there any chance the base can repel that thing? 
The structure is solid. It can withstand most weapons with ease, including nuclear ones. But I'm afraid it probably cannot withstand that amount of weight. If the creature submerges the building, it will be crushed in under a minute. I'm activating long-range defense lasers and missile launchers. But it will take too long to transport my most powerful weapons to the site. If the defenses fail to stop the monster, you should prepare for the worst. Not very reassuring. Do your best, Metal Knight. We're counting on you. Busho ends the call and rushes to the roof of the building. At the same time, a Metal Knight drone tells all the heroes trying to combat Evil Ocean Water to scatter and run toward the Hero HQ. He's about to activate his long-range defenses, so they need to clear the area to not get hit by them. The heroes, seeing nothing they can do to combat the creature, do as they're told, and Metal Knight activates his weaponry. From the top of the Hero HQ, a giant cannon emerges and fires off a massive laser right at one of the eyes of Evil Ocean Water. The beam hits and seemingly drives the monster back a bit. Giant clouds of steam rise from the evaporating water. Seeing this, some of the heroes start cheering. This is the first thing that's been able to phase the monster so far. However, moments later, the laser is suddenly met with resistance. Ocean water activates an ability of its own. The Great Oceanic Cannon. The cannon clashes with the beam and, slowly but surely, overpowers it. Everyone's jaws drop as the Great Oceanic Cannon suddenly doubles in size and completely obliterates Metal Knight's beam. It doesn't just stop there, though. The immense stream of water continues flowing and soon crashes into the top of the Hero HQ, annihilating the laser cannon. Inside the building, Busho stares in shock as the stream of water vaporizes the Hero HQ floor above him. If the monster had aimed just a few meters lower, Busho doesn't want to think about it. Even before he can't believe his eyes. His laser, which was designed to kill dragon level monsters in one shot, overpowered so easily. This creature is seriously dangerous. The scientist initiates the second defense wave. Dozens of missile silos emerge from the sides of the Hero HQ building and fire off hundreds of high-potency missiles at the incoming water. The water absorbs the projectiles, which explode inside its body, creating showers of vapor as they vaporize parts of the living ocean. However, despite the explosion, the creature keeps advancing like nothing ever happened. Its evaporated body parts soon fill with even larger quantities of water than before. The monster grows even larger as it absorbs water from the ocean, as well as moisture from the air. All the heroes look on in horror as the creature gets closer and closer to the Hero HQ. They do their best to fight back, but all of their slashes, punches and kicks are completely ineffective against the living tidal wave. The best they can do is keeping themselves from drowning. Flashy Flash suddenly thinks of a way he could help out though. He could rush into the Hero HQ at top speed and begin carrying people out of the building. However, even with his speed, Evil Ocean Water is now a mere 5 kilometers away from the building and is about to collide with it. He wouldn't get everyone in time. And where would he drop the people off? On the ground a few kilometers away? They just get swept up in the water anyway. Still, the heroes refuse to give up. They keep fighting. But it's just no use. Evil Ocean Water raises a massive lump of water into the air and prepares to crash it down on the Hero HQ with all its might. Busho, standing at the top of the building, looks on as the gigantic wave falls at him. The man closes his eyes, preparing to meet his demise calmly. He thinks of all the things he's been able to do in his life and smirks. He's directed so many heroes to locations of monsters, indirectly causing those monsters' deaths. And now, he's about to get crushed by a monster. Perhaps this is a fitting end for him. Busher sighs as he accepts his fate. A moment later, a gigantic crash is heard and the entire building shakes violently, causing Busher to fall off his feet. However, strangely enough, the man realizes that he's still alive. Seriously, can't anyone here do anything without me? 
the voice of terrible tornado echoes through the battlefield. Bush opens his eyes to see a massive dome of green energy covering the Hero HQ. The monster's attack has been blocked. The rank 2 S-Class hero Tatsumaki arrived on the scene just in time. The other heroes soon notice and some start cheering. High in the sky the Esper sighs. She was just barely able to put up the barrier in time, and while it stopped the ocean's initial crash down, now the creature is submerging the entire dome, and its weight starts applying pressure to the shield. Tatsumaki winces a little at feeling the immense tension her shield is being put under, and focuses on strengthening it. You're certainly a big one, but that makes you an easy target too. She says, preparing to launch a psychic attack on the creature to blow it away. However, Tatsumaki suddenly feels an immense wave of pain in her head, and blood suddenly splurts out of her nose. She gets as she lifts one of her arms up to her face to check the bleeding. In that moment, the Esper's barrier wavers a little. A crack appears at the top of the dome. What in the world is going on? Boros and Genos run toward the Hero HQ when they see someone in front of them, seemingly also running in that direction. It's Fubuki. Once she sees them, the woman calls out for them to stop. The two S-Class heroes and their dog come to a halt next to her briefly. What's going on? Why'd you tell us to stop? Take me with you to the battlefield. My sister's gone there. Normally, she should be able to deal with almost any threat. But if the monster attacking the Hero HQ is a strong one, she might be in trouble this time. What do you mean? My sister hasn't fully recovered from her last battle. The doctor said she'd be okay to return to the battlefield in a day or so, but that only applies to her physical health. Psychic powers take longer to recover. If Tatsumaki overdoes it now and goes all out, I don't even want to think about what might happen. Well, that certainly sounds troublesome. Fine, float yourself onto Rover's back and let's go. Double speed. Meanwhile, Tatsumaki is doing her best to pull herself together. She realizes what's going on, and it infuriates her, but she can't go on the offensive and keep her barrier up at the same time. Normally, she could do both just fine, but when she's in the state she's in right now, she can only focus on one. Sensing the thousands of people still inside the Hero HQ, Tatsumaki decides on defending them and pours all her efforts into the barrier. She strengthens it to the point that the crack vanishes. However, the Esper is not sure how long she can hold out. And with the water creature having encompassed the entire barrier, the only way left for the people inside to evacuate is through underground tunnels, which is going to take a while. But things just keep getting worse. One of Evil Ocean Water's eyes slowly ships upwards and locks onto Tatsumaki. The creature has noticed her presence. The Esper sees a spot on Ocean Water beginning to boil. Moments later, the monster shoots out a massive stream of water at her. The Great Oceanic Cannon travels at Tatsumaki with great speed. She ducks out of the way and dodges the attack, but Ocean Water launches another stream at her soon after the first one. And then another. And another. It starts rapid-firing massive water bullets at Tatsumaki, forcing her to duck and weave to dodge them all. This makes it difficult for the Esper to concentrate on defending the Hero HQ. That's when the other heroes on the scene realize something they can do. They can distract the monster and direct its firepower away from Tatsumaki. Darkshine, putting all the strength he has into his legs, jumps up to the eye looking at Tatsumaki and delivers a super ally bazooka right into the eyeball, making it burst into small pieces. At the same time, Flashy Flash uses a Flashy Slash to chop up the ocean's other eye. This temporarily stops the creature's onslaught on Tatsumaki, but the eyes soon begin reforming. That's when Genos, Boros, Rover, and Fubuki arrive on the scene. They wonder where the Hero HQ is for a moment, before realizing that it's deep beneath the water's surface, in some kind of energy dome. It's obvious the dome has to be Tatsumaki's doing, but the trio doesn't see her at the moment. Boros smirks to himself at seeing the enormous creature. 
This thing looks strong. It might be fun to fight. A moment later, a figure crashes down into the ground next to him. It's Tank Top Master, who was blown away by a giant wave. He looks to be out for the count. That's when Boros remembers he can't fight this monster the way he'd like to. The alien has to keep his true body and abilities hidden from the other heroes. Well, this is certainly complicated. How are we supposed to kill a creature like this? Regular blows likely won't work since it's made of water. Our best bet would probably be an energy blast powerful enough to incinerate the entire creature. Easier said than done. Boro says before thinking to himself. If I could use my true power, that wouldn't be an issue. Suddenly, Fubuki points to the sky. There! There's my sister! Boros and Genos follow her finger's direction and see the Esper. She appears to be struggling. The group thinks of what they can do. Like Genos pointed out, they probably can't kill the creature with regular punches and kicks. And if they try to blast it with energy, they'd probably run out of stamina way before they could fully incinerate all the water. Still, they can't just sit and do nothing, so Boros takes charge. Listen up. Rover and I are going after the creature. We shall attack it repeatedly for a while. Genos, you go up to the sky and observe the monster. Use your scanners and brain to pick up on as many details as possible. If we're lucky, we might discover a weakness or something. If not... He glances at Genos, who gives him a knowing look. If it happens, it happens. We can make do and deal with the fallout later. He intentionally uses vague language so as to not give anything away to Fubuki, who's standing behind them. But he conveys his message clearly. If Boros needs to, he can take off the armor. Boros being exposed is better than the entire Hero Association HQ falling. Still, Boros hopes to keep this option as a last resort. Meanwhile, Fubuki is a bit confused at the wording, but with the entire ocean having seemingly come to life to kill everyone she knows, she's got bigger problems to worry about at the moment. What about me? What should I do? Just stay back. You're not strong enough to take this thing on. I can't worry about you while I fight. But... Go! Boro shouts as he hops onto Rover's back and the dog kicks off the ground, galloping toward the ocean monster. Genos activates the thrusters in his back and shoots off into the air. Fubuki is left on the ground, alone and dissatisfied. Darkshine blows away another portion of the ocean monster, but it doesn't budge and just floods the hero with more water. The same happens to Metal Bat. Flashy is doing a bit better, as he's light and fast enough to run on the water's surface, so he runs along the creature's back and keeps slicing it up. It doesn't deal any damage, but the annoyance provided by these actions does distract Evil Ocean Water and directs his line of fire at Flashy and away from Tatsumaki. Metal Bat is rampaging around the outskirts of the creature, blowing away portions of its body. However, in this rampage he fails to notice water beginning to boil behind him. The ocean monster is preparing to hit the hero with an oceanic cannon. But just as that's about to happen, Boro suddenly rams into the hero, pushing them both out of harm's way just as the cannon fires. Hey, what was that for? I saved your life, dumbass. Didn't you see the attack this thing was charging up behind you? No, and I don't care. I would have just pumped myself up to survive it. The punk hero declares before realizing who he's talking to. Oh wait, you're the new guy, aren't you? Congrats on getting into the S-Class. This is not the time! Boro shouts as he notices water begin to surround them on all sides, and unleashes every ounce of power that the armor will allow him to. Metal Bad gets serious in a heartbeat and stands back to back with Boros as water encroaches on them on all sides. I hope I can count on you for backup, newbie. Huh. <laughs> You're the one who's going to be my backup. Boros responds and the two heroes burst into action plowing through the incoming water and fighting their way out of the encirclement. A few kilometers away, Darkshine is fighting all by himself, 
and can barely keep himself from drowning inside of the monster. The ocean's attacks don't really deal any damage to the hulking man, but being suffocated to death is a real issue. Just as Darkshine is about to be submerged, four giant fire blasts land all around him, vaporizing some water around the man and giving him a chance to jump out of the danger zone. Darkshine is quick to take that opportunity. He jumps back to put some distance between himself and the water to regain his breath. During this moment of rest, he looks over to where the blasts that saved him came from, curious who could have helped him. But instead of a hero, he's met with a friendly face of a hound from hell. Whoa, you're Kenji's pet. Where did you come from? He asks, surprised, but not displaying any fear or hostile intent. Did you fire those energy attacks to help me? He asks and the dog responds by wagging its tail and licking Darkshine in a friendly manner, which causes the hero to laugh. <laughs> I can totally see why Kenji wanted to keep you alive now. Darkshine chuckles, but the moment is soon interrupted by Evil Ocean Water, who fires an ocean cannon at the duo. They quickly dodge out of the way. Okay boy, give me some cover fire, will ya? Darkshine calls out as he jumps at the water monster. On command, Rover starts firing off blast after blast, evaporating parts of the creature and helping Darkshine keep himself from getting submerged. However, even as all this is happening, the collective strength of all the heroes is not enough to even put a dent in Evil Ocean Water's offensive. To it, all these heroes are nothing but a small nuisance. And on top of that, Tatsumaki is starting to run low on stamina. She's doing her best to keep up her barrier, but it's becoming more and more apparent that she's nearing her limit. Meanwhile, Genos watches from above, picking up every movement in his peripheral vision with help from the advanced scanners in his eyes. As the monster continues its assault, Genos is able to make out a few key details. He activates his thrusters again and flies back down to the ground to speak with Boros. On the way there, he passes by Darkshine and Flashy Flash. He tells them to follow him, and all the heroes regroup at Boros's location. You get anything useful, Genos? I have a few leads. First, the monster does not have the ability to regenerate in a usual sense. It appears to be regenerating, but what it's actually doing is just pulling water from the nearby ocean to replace the water of we evaporate. If we can sever the connection between this creature and the ocean, its regenerative capabilities will be greatly reduced. It does appear to be pulling moisture from the air as well, but if we are able to gather enough firepower, it shouldn't be enough to stop us from eventually vaporizing the creature completely. Awesome! Seems like we have a way to victory now! You're glossing over a lot of things. How can we separate that thing from the ocean? And where do we get enough firepower to vaporize its entire body? This creature is simply far too large for anything like that. Flashy Flash states and everyone thinks of how they could possibly overcome both of these hurdles. Boro soon comes up with an idea. I think I've got something. But it's going to take a lot of luck. What are you thinking? If Tatsumaki were at full power, she could probably put up a wall of energy between the monster and the ocean to separate them. If that were the case, we might be able to do something. But Tatsumaki is not in great shape at the moment, so it might be a bit too much to ask of her. How would you know if she's in good shape or not? We ran into her sister on the way here and she told us. In any case, we have no choice but to rely on her. Genos. Go ask her to put up that barrier. Then come back and start blasting the monster with everything you've got. Rover will join in as well. The rest of us will keep the monster's attention away from you two. Let's try to make this quick. With a plan set in motion, the heroes go into action. Genos flies up to Tatsumaki while everyone keeps ocean water distracted. Tornado! How much power do you have left? Have you flies thought of something? We have, but the plan involves separating this creature from the ocean. Do you think you could put up a wall to do that? Tatsumaki rolls her eyes. Of course, it's all up to her again. 
she's not sure if she can pull something like this off in the state she's in, while also keeping the barrier protecting the Hero HQ up. However, not wanting to show any signs of weakness, the Esper smirks. Are you forgetting who you're speaking to? Of course I can! She says before letting out a massive surge of power. Tatsumaki pushes her body to its absolute limit. Blood trickles down her nose and tendons in her arms snap. But the Esper pushes through the pain, and moments later, giant walls of green energy emerge from the shoreline and sever the connection between the monster and its power source. Not done yet, Tatsumaki grunts in pain as she musters up the strength to extend those walls inland to surround the creature and prevent it from circling around the walls to reach the ocean again. With this display of power, Tatsumaki is able to completely isolate evil ocean water, surrounding it with walls from all sides. There. Now go and do your plan. The walls won't hold out for long. Genos nods and flies down to the group. With the monster isolated, step two of the plan begins. Genos and Rover begin blasting ocean water with everything they have, hoping to evaporate as much of the creature's body as humanly possible. Everyone else darts around the monster, diverting its attention. Boros and Darkshine take it upon themselves to destroy both of the ocean water's eyes. However, the creature is not incapable of thought. It realizes that what they're doing is the same thing as before, aiming for its vision. And the monster prepares to use that to its advantage. Right as Darkshine and Boros are about to reach its eyes, ocean water fires off an enormous oceanic cannon right from in between its eyes. The stream is so wide that the duo has no hope of dodging it. Watch out! Darkshine yells as he maneuvers himself in front of Boros, intending to take the hit for the both of them. The alien's eyes widen a bit. Why would this guy jump in to protect someone he barely even knows? This thought delays Boros' reaction slightly, and the stream hits Darkshine head on. The bodybuilder uses himself as a meat shield to protect Boros, but the force of the impact pushes the S-Class hero backwards, right into the alien. Darkshine's back crashes into Boros and both heroes are sent flying. Darkshine groans in pain as he feels the intense pressure of the water tearing into his skin. For the first time since he became a hero, his flesh is taking damage. The two heroes crash into the ground hard, with Darkshine landing on top of Boros. The alien puts his arms up to soften the impact, but it's no use. The crash causes cracks to form on Boros' armor. The alien curses under his breath as he lifts Darkshine off of himself. Seems the blast knocked the hero out. He's injured, but not too terribly. With some medical attention, he should survive. Boros takes a look at his power-limiting armor. It's a bit busted up, with cracks all over his forearms and some indents on his back. It's not too bad though, as the cracks are narrow, and there are no spots where his actual skin is visible. Boros can feel energy begin to radiate from his arms. Seems the suppression mechanisms in the cracked areas of his armor have been damaged. Just great. The alien mutters to himself before someone calls out to him. Boros turns around and sees Fubuki running at him a few dozen meters away. Seems he landed near her. The Esper runs up to the alien. She pants. Sweat drips down her face. It appears she's been running for a while. What's wrong? You look beat. I've been flying toward the battlefield. Boros frowns. I told you to stay away. No, you don't understand. My sister and I are linked. I can somewhat sense her state at any given time. And she's at her limit. If she keeps this up any longer, she'll die. This gets Boris's attention. He looks up a terrible tornado, and while it's hard to see from such a great distance, he does notice her figure trembling. At that moment, a crack once again appears on the barrier covering the Hero HQ. You're right. This doesn't look good. I'm going to my sister. I can help her if I get close enough. 
I know I can. Boros looks at the Esper with uncertainty, but after seeing how determined the look in her eyes seems to be, he relents. Fine. Can you float yourself up to her? I can, but it might take too long. I'm nowhere near as good at flying as my sister is. Then what if I gave you a boost? Boro suddenly wraps an arm around Fubuki's waist. Hold on tight! He says before crouching down. Fubuki's eyes widen in horror when she realizes what the man is about to do. Wait, wait, wait! Boros pulls all the strength he can muster into his legs and jumps with enough force to leave a crater when he kicks off of the ground. The duo flies into the sky at an incredible speed. Fubuki would curse if she wasn't so busy trying to keep her skin from peeling off due to the immense friction created by the speed of their movement. Moments later, the duo finds themselves high in the sky, just below Tatsumaki's altitude and a few hundred meters away from her on a horizontal line. Now, float us to her from here. Boro shouts and Fubuki weakly raises her arms, creating a bubble of energy around them to keep them in the air. The Esper then grabs her mouth to prevent herself from throwing up. The jump really messed with her bodily functions. You jerk. You could have warned me. Nevertheless, the Esper knows they must hurry. She shakes off the nausea and, using her psychic powers, pushes the bubble toward Tatsumaki, who notices them a few moments later. The number two hero would shout for Fubuki to get out of here if she wasn't focusing every bit of her power into maintaining her barriers. Without interruption, Fubuki and Boros make it to Tatsumaki. Why are you here? You'll get killed! Get out of here! Tatsumaki forces herself to mutter out to Fubuki, but the younger of the two sisters stands her ground. I'm not leaving. You're at your limit and we both know it. I can help you. What can a weakling like you do for me? Just go! Tatsumaki shows a bit of rough love, trying to get her sibling to leave with harsh words, but Fubuki does not budge. I may be weak, and I may be incompetent in comparison to you, but you're not all-powerful. You'll die if you keep this up. I can help you. Please, trust me, just this once. Tatsumaki is surprised to see such a show of resolve from her little sister. Fubuki, who's afraid to take risks and rarely exits her safe space, is showing such bravery, risking her own life. Tatsumaki doesn't know how to feel. Her sister is showing such immense growth. It makes the Esper happy. But to think that the cause of this growth would be Tatsumaki's inability to save herself. How pitiful. The hero ponders for a moment before letting out a sigh. Perhaps having to be helped by her sister is the punishment she deserves for being unable to do this on her own. Fubuki notices the sigh and the look of defeat in her sister's eyes. Though Tatsumaki doesn't say a word, it's clear that she's accepted Fubuki's help internally. This is what you get for being such a stuck-up brat, sis. Fubuki says as she morphs the energy bubble into a platform for her and Boros to stand on. She places a hand on Tatsumaki's shoulder. The Esper's never done anything like this before, but in a situation like this, she has to give it a go. Fubuki focuses all of her aura in the palm of her hand and channels in it to Tatsumaki. A green flame erupts from her hand and engulfs the two sisters. But instead of burning, Tatsumaki feels a calmness wash over her. Her muscles, which have been screaming in pain up until now, are feeling better all of a sudden. They're healing. Tatsumaki can't believe it. Fubuki is actually healing her. She didn't even know something like this would be possible with psychic powers. When did her sister figure this out? The flame slowly dissipates. Fubuki smiles, content with what she was able to do. Tatsumaki's body is back in fighting shape. However, blood suddenly starts gushing out of Fubuki's mouth. The Esper used up all her power to help her sister as much as she possibly could, and it's left her drained. Fubuki starts falling backwards. I gotcha. 
Boro sketches her before she can plummet to her death. As Fubuki passes out, the platform keeping her and Boros afloat vanishes. Boro starts falling out of the sky. A little help here, Tatsumaki! The Esper twirls her finger a bit and creates another platform under Boros's feet to catch him and float him back up to her. She looks at the alien with an unsure expression. What are you doing here? I got Fubuki up here into the sky, but that's about all. If that's all, then take my sister to safety and get lost. There's still work for me to do. The Esper says before lifting up her hands to attack evil ocean water. However, at that moment, another crack appears on the side of the Hero HQ's barrier. Tatsumaki's eyes widen. She tries to put more power into the barrier, but then a grim realization hits her. Fubuki restored only her physical body. After having spent so much time and energy on maintaining her barriers, Tatsumaki's stamina is running low. Her life may not be in danger anymore for the time being, but she's out of energy. More cracks appear on the barrier. Water starts seeping through and onto the Hero HQ. No, no, no. This can't be happening. She tries desperately to muster up some power. Anything at all. But her tank is running dry. Very soon, her barriers will collapse. Boros looks down. He still senses people running around inside the building. If that wasn't enough, further away he notices smoke emitting from Genos. Seems he spent all his energy as well. Even Rover seems to be letting out little coughs every now and then. All the blasting has taken its toll on the poor dog. Darkshine is writhing in pain and Tank Top Master is still out cold. Metal Bat and Flashy Flash are running around and continuing the fight. But they're clearly exhausted. A few Metal Knight drones have even arrived and started dropping missiles and various forms of bombs and lasers on the creature. Boros looks over at Tatsumaki, desperately trying to maintain her shields. He can see the same determination in her eyes that Fubuki showed moments ago. She's really trying to help everyone and do her job as best as she can. Nevertheless, all that is simply not enough. The ocean monster may be a little smaller now than before thanks to everyone's efforts, but it's still far from done. The creature is about to break through the barrier separating it from the ocean. When that happens, all their efforts will go to waste. The hero HQ will be crushed and most heroes on the ground will probably die. Boros lets out a sigh. What a shame. He really did enjoy being a hero. Not living as an almighty lord that everyone fears was a nice change of pace for the alien. But continuing that life seems to be an impossibility now. Tatsumaki, would you mind coming closer? Hmm? Just float yourself over to me. Tatsumaki, being as desperate as she is, does as she's told. Really, she doesn't know what else she could do. Now give me your hand. He says as he extends his own hand as if offering a handshake. Tatsumaki seems doubtful at first, but takes the hand soon enough. Boro smirks a bit. Good. Prepare yourself. I shall lend you some energy. After seeing your sister do it, I think I can do something similar. I can't exactly heal you, but I should be able to give you enough power to maintain your barriers. Huh? Th there's no way you'd have enough. Boros unleashes a burst of energy from his arm. The already cracked armor on his hand can't withstand the pressure, and shatters, revealing the alien hand of Boros. Tatsumaki's eyes widen in realization, but before she can say anything, she feels a surge of power running into her body. The energy is immense, greater than even her own full power. Her hair stands up and her body shivers as the power courses through her veins. The Esper is utterly shocked at how much energy she's been given. If Fubuki hadn't healed her beforehand, she might not have been able to handle it. But even more so, 
she's shocked at the hand she's gaining this power from. It looks exactly like the skin of the monster she faced a while ago. Her suspicions were true. So why? Why is this monster helping her? She feels fear, of course, but... The confusion of getting help from a monster she fought is more prominent than the fear inside her mind. She looks at the alien and utters a single word. Why? Don't worry about that. You have bigger problems on your hands right now. He says as he lets go of her arm. Strengthen your barriers and protect your sister. I'll take care of the rest. Tatsumaki is surprised to hear such a response coming from the mouth of a monster, but she complies. Having fought Boros already, she knows full well that he's strong enough to get the job done. And if he wants to do it, why not let him? Tatsumaki nods and takes Fubuki from his arms. Boros smirks a bit, though there is a pained expression reflected in his eyes. He tenses up the muscles in his back and lets out a surge of energy. The armor around his back and chest starts cracking and quickly breaks off. He puts a hand over his face and digs his fingers into the human face mask before ripping it off to reveal his true face. Boros's hair spikes up as he returns to his released form. His true form. Tatsumaki gazes upon the single eye of the alien, and her mind immediately flashes back to their battle. She backs away, still fearful, but it does seem that the alien is not intent on attacking her right now. You owe me an explanation after this is over, Tatsumaki says before raising her arms up and flexing her newfound power. All the barriers on the battlefield suddenly repair themselves and become twice as thick as they were before. There's no way ocean water can break through them now. Boros looks down at all the fighters below. He'll need to get them out of the way before he can fight properly. In less than a second, Boros drops down to the ground and sprints toward Metal Bat. Without saying a word, he grabs him and carries him over to Genos and Rover. The alien puts Genos and Metal Bat onto Rover's back, and then grabs the dog monster before carrying him out of the battlefield, jumping over Tatsumaki's barriers like nothing. He grabs Tank Top Master, Flashy Flash, and Dog Shine on the way. All this happens so fast that the heroes don't even have a chance to register it. Boros puts everyone down outside of Tatsumaki's barrier, and jumps back into the battlefield. He stands atop one of the walls Tatsumaki's holding up and looks down at the water creature. You've certainly made things messy for me, he sighs. Strange, isn't it? I should be ecstatic about getting to fight you, but I feel irritated more than anything else. And you're responsible for that irritation. At that moment, Boros lets out some killer intent and ocean water immediately reacts to it by firing off a great oceanic cannon. The stream collides with Boros' body, but deals no damage whatsoever. That's a nice replacement for a beam attack. But now let me show you what a real beam is supposed to look like. Boros puffs out his chest and charges up a blast from his eye. Energy surges all around him like a fiery aura. Strikes of lightning and static electricity surround his body. Go to hell! Boro shouts as he fires off a gigantic energy wave right at the monster. The beam collides with the water and begins evaporating it at an unprecedented rate. Ocean water realizes what's going on, and it tries to shoot a few oceanic cannons at the alien, but they simply evaporate in midair before even getting close to Boro's. The heat given off by his energy is simply too much. Evil Ocean Water can't do anything. It's trapped, and over the course of a few minutes, Boros completely vaporizes the entirety of the creature's body, leaving behind nothing but a giant wasteland. Thankfully, he didn't use enough energy to breach Tatsumaki's barriers, so the Hero HQ is still intact. 
The alien powers down and jumps from the wall to where all the other S-Class heroes and Rover are bunched up. They saw the immense energy blast and thought that maybe King or even Blast himself had shown up. To their surprise, now the source of energy is standing right in front of them. A tall, blue, one-eyed monster. And the resemblance between him and Kenji is strong. Everyone present figures out that they're one and the same almost instantly. Boro stares the heroes down, waiting to gauge their reaction. Geno sighs. The cat's out of the bag now. Boros will no longer be welcome in human society. Genos himself might be expelled from the Hero Association as well, given that he was the one who recommended Boros to them and could be accused of harboring a monster. All the other heroes present stare at the alien in disbelief, to think that there was a monster in their ranks. Flashy Flash is the first to act. He suddenly unsheathes his sword and charges at Boros with his ultimate move, the Flashy Slash. However, the alien is able to catch the ninja's blade with just two fingers. This shocks Flashy. Boros swings his arm at Flashy and knocks him back a dozen meters, but holds back just enough to not deal any real damage to the hero. Don't. You can't beat me. Flashy Flash scowls and prepares to go in for another attack, but Metal Bat extends his bat in front of the hero, stopping him. Calm down. He tells Flashy Flash before turning to Boros. Who are you? And why were you posing as a hero? Boros sighs. Here it comes. The moment he has to reveal himself fully. Boros could try to lie, but in all honesty, he's a bad liar. My name is Boros. I once led a band of thieves known as the Dark Matter, but to you they're known as the aliens who wiped out City A. Everyone's eyes widen. I always wondered why no boss ever came down to face us. You killed thousands of people! What the hell are you doing posing as a hero? Metal Bat expresses his disgust, and Boros doesn't respond. In fact, to Genos, he looks a little... Huh. The cyborg can't quite make out the emotions on Boris's face. That's when Darkshine steps forward. You... I thought you were a good guy. Your monster saved my life. I protected you during the battle. I protected... a monster. And you killed the water creature, but you also destroyed an entire city. I don't get it. What are you? What side are you on? The hero feels confused, betrayed. But everything Boros did up until now as a hero was... positive. He saved everyone. Darkshine doesn't know how to feel about any of this. Metal Bat is in the same boat. Flashy is a little more hostile, but decides not to take any action for the time being. Before Boros can respond, the barrier surrounding the Hero HQ dissipates and Tatsumaki descends from the sky, landing in front of the alien. She looks up at him with a serious expression. Go. Huh? Heroes not on this battlefield don't know that the threat attacking the Hero HQ is gone. It's only a matter of time until King gets here. He might not want to hear you out. He already beat you once. So if you fight here and now, he'd likely kill you before you could tell me why you did what you did. And you owe me that explanation. So get out of here and go hide away somewhere. I'll take care of things here. What do you mean, King beat me? Just go already. All right, all right. Boros is a bit confused, but he does listen to the Esper. He turns to look at all the heroes one last time. At that moment... Genos finally realizes what emotion he recognizes on the alien's face. It's sorrow. Boros whistles for Over to come to him before hopping on the hound's back. Without saying another word, the two monsters jump away and soon disappear into the distance. What do you think you're doing, Tornado? You helping him now? 
Flashy Flash asks with audible hostility in his voice. The Esper turns to look at him. All the heroes are shaken by the expression of fury on Tatsumaki's face. You think I know what I'm doing? If you think I do, then you're wrong. I don't know what the deal with him is, or why he's doing what he's doing, or what he even is entirely. That bastard killed thousands of people, damn near killed me, and brought a cataclysmic event onto our hands. I hate him. Tatsumaki shouts with rage, shocking all the other heroes. However, her voice suddenly softens a little. But he also saved my sister. And he is the only reason we won today. He dropped his disguise to help us. He knew he'd be revealed if he unleashed his true power. And yet, he still chose to do it. He saved me. Saved all of us. I... I don't know what to make of it. That's why I can't have him die yet. I need him to explain himself. I need to know what the hell is truly going on in that head of his. The Esper says in a rare moment of vulnerability. The other heroes look on stunned. Tatsumaki, tornado of terror, being so unsure of herself. This is certainly a first. Many of the heroes do share this sentiment with her. Darkshine and Metal Bat are almost as conflicted as Tatsumaki is. Genos doesn't really know what to do or say. He figures he'll remain quiet for now. Just then, Tatsumaki gets a call from Busho. He asks her for a report on the current situation, and reluctantly, the Esper tells him everything. At first, the worker is relieved that the threat is finally handled. But that relief is soon overtaken by the shock over the fact that Kenji turned out to be a monster all along. After thinking for a few moments, Bushu decides that an emergency meeting between the Hero Association executives and some top-tier heroes is in order. He begins calling all the most important figures in the association to the Hero HQ. Unfortunately, not all will be able to attend. Silverfang and Bomb, as well as Atomic Samurai and the Council of Swordsmen, are still in hot pursuit of Garo. They can tell they're getting closer and closer to the Hero Hunter. The two tracker groups encounter each other on a street, where Garo fought some heroes, and decide to join forces. Soon, they will catch up with the martial artist and eliminate him. Watching everything from above, Phoenix Man is getting a bit anxious. Bang and Atomic are getting awfully close to Garo. It's to the point where the Hero Hunter sometimes avoids them by only half a mile. An encounter between them is inevitable, and Phoenix Man realizes he'll have to help Garo out once again. As the chase is going on, over the course of a few hours, several S-Class heroes and many important association executives gather at the Hero HQ to discuss what to do next. This is what madness! What management is Who this? Who let that become a hero How did we not place? know he How was a monster up until he revealed himself? Oversight? Unbelievable! Don't Absurd. we have scanners for that Who kind of that monster to become a hero in the first place? What poor management is this? Silence! The voice of Sitch rings out across the room and everyone quiets down. I know you're all worked up, and believe me, I'm no different. But that doesn't mean we can act like savages in a meeting like this. As you already know, the newest S-Class hero, Kenji, was actually a monster in disguise. We are investigating how such a thing could slip under our radars. But regardless of that, the information we have on the monster currently is very disturbing. His name is apparently Boros, and he was the leader of the spaceship that attacked City A a while ago. For some unknown reason, he did not go down to fight the heroes on the scene and instead fled his spaceship at some point. After that, he was completely off the grid for a few weeks until we started detecting unusual tectonic activity underneath City Z. Tatsumaki was sent to the scene, and according to her, she faced four monsters who were too strong to even be considered as dragon-level threats. Once again, according to her, one of these monsters was Boros and he was the one responsible for the continental crash that caused devastation all throughout the planet. 
Tatsumaki was barely able to make it out alive, but the other three monsters seemed to have perished. After the impact, King arrived on the scene and defeated Boros. As we now know, the monster was somehow able to escape with his life, making him the first monster to encounter King and live to tell the tale. One week after the battle, Boros joined the Hero Association under the name Kenji and passed himself off as a cyborg. S-Class hero Demon Cyborg recommended him to us as well. We are investigating possible connections between Genos and Boros right now. At the moment, Demon Cyborg is in a cell underneath the Association HQ building. Since joining the Hero Association, Boros saved the life of B-Class hero Fubuki, tamed a dragon-level monster, and fought alongside various S-Class heroes against the water creature earlier today. During the battle, he and his hound reportedly helped the other heroes and saved them on multiple occasions. On top of that, Boros was the one leading the offensive and coming up with strategies. Perhaps most interestingly, he chose to drop his disguise when it became clear the heroes would lose if he didn't unleash his true power. This raises many questions, such as why he would blow his cover to protect the heroes. Ultimately, he was responsible for the defeat of the monster. And now, here we are. The point of this meeting is to decide what we do about this situation and how we view Boros going forward. Isn't it obvious? We declare him a threat and have him hunted down. Not so fast. He worked to protect us, didn't he? He could have done that just to gain our trust. Maybe, but something doesn't add up. If he wanted our trust, he wouldn't have done anything that would reveal his true identity. He wouldn't have taken off his armor. Like I said, things just don't add up under that explanation. This is entirely a guess on my part, but maybe something changed between his battle with Tatsumaki and today's events? The monster did save my life. It appeared to be very dog-like and gentle. What? You're saying he turned to our side or something? That's hard to believe. It's possible that whatever his goal is, he was hoping to accomplish it by going undercover, and requires the Hero Association to exist. Maybe revealing himself was a better alternative to the Hero HQ being destroyed, even if it messed with his initial plans. The only thing we know for certain is that he does not want the Hero Association destroyed. Otherwise, he would have just sat back and let the water creature kill us. Okay, he might need the Hero Association for something. So what? He's still a monster who's killed thousands! That's true. Regardless of who or what he is, he's still committed grave sins. Even in the best case scenario, if we say Boros had a change of heart of some kind, he still cannot be forgiven. The discussion goes on a while longer, with multiple heroes and association executives expressing their thoughts. Throughout it all, Busho notices something unusual. Terrible Tornado, who is usually so active and prominent in meetings, is sitting quietly with her head down. In fact, she hasn't said a single word since the beginning of the meeting. He speaks up, telling everyone to stop talking for a moment. Alright everyone. From what I'm hearing, most of us are leaning toward declaring Boros as a threat. But before that, I would like to ask one particular person's opinion. You know her well, and she knows Boros the best out of any of us. I am of course talking about Terrible Tornado. She's fought the alien directly, and fought alongside him too. I believe her thoughts on the matter would be most informative. He looks at Tatsumaki and motions her to speak. All eyes drift toward the Esper, who simply sighs. She continues staring at the table, not looking up for even a moment. I... I don't know what to think or say. I despise that alien for what he's done, but he saved us. And when he did, he seemed genuinely sad to have to take off his armor and reveal himself. Right now, I can't come to any sort of conclusion. I need to talk to Boros before that. I already made him promise to give me an explanation for his actions. 
I propose you allow me to follow through with meeting him once more to determine how to proceed. Whispers fill the room. No one's ever seen Terrible Tornado so down and unsure of herself. Still, her proposal seems preposterous to most. Talk to him? Are you serious? We're going to talk to a monster now? Honestly, what nonsense! Should we start considering you a threat as well, Tornado? A hero association executive asks, but soon regrets it as Tatsumaki gives him an intense glare. In that moment, the man's life flashes before his eyes. Go ahead, if you think that's a good idea. I'm with Tornado on this one. I think we should talk before we take any drastic action. Same here. I agree. Darkshine, Metalbat, and Zombie Man all stand up and walk over to Tatsumaki's side of the table. I don't need any of your help. The Esper mutters, but the other heroes continue to stand by her. Metalbat looks down at Tatsumaki. We're not doing this to help you. We're doing this because we want answers, just like you do. Meanwhile, on my mask and flashy flash scowl, several Hero Association executives do the same. What is this? Some kind of rebellion? You're clearly in the minority. Stand down and do your damn jobs. And as you all know all too well, your job is killing monsters. We shall declare Boros to be an above dragon level threat and organize a unit of heroes led by King to dispose of him. And we won't let you do that. Darkshine, Tatsumaki, Zombie Man, and Metal Bat stand against the other heroes, seemingly ready for combat if it comes to it. This causes outrage among the executives. You can't be serious! This is treason against mankind! King! Put an end to this at once! Knock some sense into these people! In response to this, Tatsumaki glares at King. Her eyes meet the man's bloodshot ones, and the two heroes stare at each other for a few moments. A sweat drop rolls down the Esper's face. She really hopes King won't side against her. Slowly, the man closes his eyes. I refuse. King opens his eyelids and looks at the executives with bloodshot eyes and a terrifying expression, which sends shivers down their spines. Tornado's group has the right idea. It's best to talk to Boros before taking any action. It's clear that he doesn't mean harm to the association for the time being. It's best to keep it that way, and not provoke him. If all goes well, we can gain a powerful new ally. Are you serious? Are you implying you couldn't beat him in a fight? That's not what King said. Gaining a new ally would be a lot more beneficial to us than destroying it. King is thinking of the future, and what would benefit the Hero Association in the long run. Such wisdom. Incredible deductive ability. Everyone starts praising King for his suggestion. No one notices him wipe some sweat off of his forehead. The thought of having to fight Boros was terrifying to the man. Nevertheless, Sitch shouts for everyone to quiet down, and after a few moments, silence fills the room. With the stage set, Sitch reveals his final verdict. It appears we have made a decision. No matter what anyone thinks, King and Tatsumaki are two of our strongest heroes. If both of them are against the extermination of Boros, then there's nothing any of us can do to object. We shall conduct a search for the monster. Whoever finds him first will call the other heroes, and we shall talk things out with Boros. After that, we'll decide whether he is worth keeping alive. And with that, the meeting is declared over. The heroes scatter to search for Boros. Tatsumaki in particular heads right towards Boros' location. She has sensed his power before and knows how it feels. The Esper can track down his approximate direction, though it will take some time to find him.
Meanwhile, Phoenix Man floats in the sky, above Garo. A few kilometers away, he sees Bang and Atomic's group getting ever closer to the Hero Hunter. The monster sighs. If he doesn't take action now, they'll catch up to Garo and a fight will ensue. Right now, there's no way the martial artist can win. Phoenix Man will have to step in, and things will get way too chaotic since Garo will view him as an enemy and refuse to cooperate. Hmm, what to do, what to do? I suppose I could confront them by myself to buy some time for Garo to get farther away from here. Yeah, that's probably for the best. The monster monologues before gliding down to the ground, landing behind the group of Bang, Bomb, Atomic Samurai, and the Council of Swordsmen. Hey there! Are you heroes looking for something? Phoenix Man waves a hand and everyone turns to him. Hmm, seems we were right. There was someone watching us from the sky. For masters like us, it's easy to pick up on bloodlust, or when we're being watched. I just couldn't pinpoint where the Watcher was. Never thought he'd just reveal himself to us. I'm right here, you know. Talking about someone when they're in front of you is rather rude. Don't you heroes have any manners? Last time I checked, spying on people was pretty impolite too. Atomic smirks, and Phoenix Man smirks back. I guess that's fair. In any case, I've come to kill you. You think that's a good idea? To take on all of us at once? Normally, I'd call any monster trying to face a group as stacked as yours crazy. But I do have a few tricks up my sleeve, as you will soon see. Really? Well, I look forward to seeing them then. Before that, why were you watching us, creature? Ha! You think I just tell you? That's none of your concern! Phoenix Man suddenly lunges at the group and takes a swipe at Atomic Samurai with his claws. The Swordsman reacts quickly and blocks the monster's attempt to skewer him with his blade. Instantly, Bang and Bomb rush Phoenix Man from both sides and he flaps his wings, flying backwards and dodging their assault. Unfortunately for the monster, the two masters don't stop after just one attack. They jump into the air so fast that Phoenix Man can't even react and pummel him with dozens of blows all over his body. The monster spits up blood as he's kicked to the ground and crashes into the street. Just as he does, two of the swordsmen from the council slice up his wings and the other two chop off his legs. Phoenix Man is left breathless on the ground. Atomic Samurai looks down at him with a look of disgust on his face. Is that all? Good grief. After all that talk, too. He yawns as he cuts off the monster's head with a single absent-minded swing. Nichiren approaches him with a slightly concerned expression. Are you sure killing it was a good idea? We could have gotten some information. What information was there to be gained from a small fry like him? Let's just go track down Garo and get this over with. Yes, we should get going before the trail goes cold. Bang says and everyone starts walking away. And where do you think you're going? Phoenix Man utters and everyone's eyes widen. They turn to face him once again, but when they do, an enormous light hits their eyes, making everyone go blind for a few moments. Phoenix Man's body parts merge back with each other, healing his injuries. A gold-like substance covers his body. Two extra wings sprout out from his back and his fingers transform into large, knife-like claws. Several eyes open on his chest and abdomen. By the time the light dies down and everyone is able to see again, Phoenix Man has completely transformed. What in the world? Wasn't he dead just moments ago? Did the creature go through some sort of evolution? He looks completely different. I thought I told you. I have a few tricks up my sleeve. And I also told you speaking about someone right in front of them is rude! Phoenix Man lunges the group once again with a claw swipe. This time, his speed is far greater than before. 
Atomic barely has enough time to raise his sword to block the attack in time. Sparks fly into the air as the monster's claws crash with a samurai's blade. Atomic grits his teeth. The muscles in his arms bulge as he pushes them to the limit to keep the claws from inking contact with his face. His feet dig into the hard concrete from the force of the impact. Before Phoenix Man can push Atomic any further, three Council of Swordsmen members swing at the monster from all sides. In an instant, Phoenix Man kicks off the ground and jumps into the air, avoiding the slices easily. Yeah! Bang shouts from behind the monster and aims a punch at the back of his head. Phoenix Man turns around and blocks the old man's fist with the palm of his hand. You know, it's not very wise to announce your surprise attack! The monster is suddenly hit from behind by bombs whirlwind iron cunning fist. Several circular gashes appear on his back and wings, but they aren't deep enough to slice him into pieces. Phoenix Man grunts in agony, but before he can counterattack, a punch to the cheek from Bang and a kick to the back of the head by Bomb sends the monster flying into the ground again, right at Atomic Samurai, who prepares to unleash his signature move on the falling monster. Moments before he does, Phoenix Man suddenly spreads his wings and instantly stops himself mid-air before turning around and flapping those wings to propel himself at Bang and Bomb, who are still in the air and unable to dodge. However, the brother duo does not falter. Instead, they cross their hands together and perform one fluid motion. Whirlwind Water Stream! Roaring Aura Sky Ripping Fist! Phoenix Man raises his arms in an X Guard just in time to defend himself from the two brothers unleashing a massive joint attack on him. The combined punch is devastating, and the impact breaks several bones in Phoenix Man's arms. The force of the blow sends the monster crashing into the ground once more. Before he can even think about what happened, a member of the Council of Swordsmen drops on him with the tip of his blade aimed right at Phoenix Man's face. The bird monster is able to get his bearings together just in time to roll out of the way, but two other swordsmen attack him, forcing him to keep rolling on the ground for a few more meters before he's finally able to get enough distance to jump to his feet and lunge at one of the Swordmasters. He swipes a claw at him and the swordsman is just barely fast enough to tilt his head out of the way. He avoids a fatal blow, but the monster's claws gouge out one of his eyes. The man screams in pain and jumps back. Phoenix Man is about to chase after him, but before he can, Atomic Samurai jumps at him with a wide swing of his blade. The bird monster hops to the side to avoid it and immediately sends one of his claws at Atomic's face, but the man is fast. He instantly draws back his blade and blocks Phoenix Man's attack. The two of them get into a furious exchange, with Atomic swinging his blade and Phoenix Man his claws. Thousands of sparks shower the two men as they block and parry each other's attacks, exchanging hundreds of blows over the course of a few seconds. Soon, Phoenix Man realizes that even with two clawed hands, he can't outdo the samurai's skill with a sword, so he hops backwards, hoping to gain some distance. At that moment, Bomb comes rocketing at him with a kick from the sky. Phoenix Man quickly catches the martial artist's foot and turns around, intending to throw Bomb into the concrete, but a kick suddenly lands on the back of his head. It's Bang, also having dropped from the sky. The shock from the blow forces Phoenix Man to let go of Bomb, and in that instance, the old man drives a skull-shattering roundhouse kick right into the monster's cheek. Phoenix Man stumbles backwards, dazed and disorientated. At that moment, Atomic Samurai rushes in to deliver a finishing blow. Wait! Bang shouts to his friend and Atomic freezes for a moment. In that moment, Phoenix Man is able to regain his bearings and jumps to the sky again. Atomic looks over at Bang with anger in his eyes. Why'd you stop me? We had him! Bang and Bomb land on the ground and sprint to Atomic's side. Remember what happened before. We thought we killed him, yet he was somehow able to come back, stronger than before. We don't know what happened, but we can assume mortal injuries might trigger this monster to evolve. If so, we'd probably have to destroy his entire body to the point where there wouldn't even be a trace left to actually finish him off. Bang explains and Atomic frowns. Seriously? Then what do we do? 
He's certainly a troublesome fellow. You're very observant, Silver Fang. Seems wisdom really does come with old age. Phoenix Man wipes some blood off of his lips. Then he starts thinking. Against three top-tier fighters, he can't make any progress. And if he stays around for too long, with Bang and Bomb being extremely experienced and intelligent, who knows what kind of plans they could come up with to deal with him. Garo should be far enough away now. He's bought quite some time. And so, Phoenix Man decides to retreat for now and head to Garo. With his current strength, Garo won't be able to resist and Phoenix Man will get him out of the city no matter what. This has been quite enlightening, but I'm afraid I'll have to take my leave now. Maybe one on one I could take you, but against all three at once I can't do much. Goodbye. He waves at the heroes before flying off into the clouds. Bang, Bomb and Atomic can chase after him. They're confused by the whole encounter, but soon shrug it off and continue their pursuit of Garo. At the same time, a few kilometers away, in a dense forest, Hellfire, Gale and Sonic train together, attempting to get strong enough to take over the world. Or, in Sonic's case, to beat Saitama. However, their training is interrupted when they all feel someone watching them. The three ninjas glance at each other before Gale takes the lead. We know you're out there. Show yourself and state your motive for spying on us. For a moment, nothing happens. But then the trees and bushes a few hundred meters away start rustling and shaking. The sound of incredibly heavy footsteps rings out across the forest. You're quite good. I was confident I had concealed my presence well enough. A giant monster with four eyes steps out into the opening where the ninjas were trading. Hellfire and Gale immediately recognize this creature. Goketsu! You were one of the Monster Association cadres. What are you doing here? Searching for allies. Some hours later, Tatsumaki lands near a large canyon. Unbeknownst to her, it's the very same wasteland where Genos first fought Saitama. She looks around and soon spots Boro sitting on a cliffside. Alone. Without looking at her, the alien starts talking. You here to kill me? No, not quite. After leaving the Hero HQ battlefield, Boros drops her over off at Dr. Kuseno's lab for Saitama to take care of and warns the good doctor about the possibility of him having to move his lab somewhere more secret, depending on what the heroes decide to do. Worst case scenario, they could come after Genos and Kuseno for harboring a monster and making gear for him. After making sure Kuseno is aware of the situation and Saitama is taking care of Rover, Boros turns to leave. And where are you going? It's unlikely the heroes will accept you back into their ranks. I... don't know. I have a lot of things to think about. I'll probably go someplace secluded and just... take some time to ponder things, I guess. The alien, not knowing any other place he could go, heads to the battlegrounds where he first fought Genos. Well, it wasn't really much of a fight. But he remembers being impressed by the level of technology on this planet. It was... rather fun. Maybe the first time he actually had fun outside of a life-or-death battle. The alien sits down and takes a trip down memory lane. A few hours later, he hears someone touch down on the ground behind him. The surprise of the landing causes Boros to snap back to reality. He realizes he was too preoccupied with his own thoughts to even sense Tatsumaki approaching him. Regardless of that, he figures he should say something to the Esper. You here to kill me? 
Not exactly. I managed to convince the Hero Association to hold off on that for the time being. I see. Then why are you here? Don't play dumb with me. You know why I'm here. I want answers. Who are you? Why were you pretending to be a hero? And most of all, why would you go out of your way to save us when you've killed thousands in the past? I want to know all of it so I can decide how to proceed with you. Boro sighs. Killed thousands? More like tens of billions. I suppose you do deserve some kind of explanation. Thing is, I'm still trying to figure this mess out myself. Tatsumaki looks at the alien, a bit confused. What do you mean by that? So much has changed in such a short amount of time. I don't know what to make of it. Boros closes his eye and silence fills the area. The only audible sound for a while is the blowing of the wind. Tatsumaki takes a few steps closer to the alien and sits down on the cliffside, a meter away from him. She can feel that Boros is being genuine. He admitted to being the leader of the aliens among other things, so he has no reason to lie at this point. And if he wanted to do harm to someone, he would have already done it. Why don't we try to figure it out then? Boros looks at the Esper. What do you mean, we? How would you know what's happening inside my head? I would if you told me. I'm usually not the type to go to for this kind of stuff, but I've been through my fair share of therapy. I think I can help you out. Therapy? What's that? Man, you really are from outer space. Therapy is basically when you talk to someone about how you're feeling and they try to help you out by giving advice and stuff. Helps with stress and doubt. Never pegged you for the type of person who'd be willing to indulge in such things. Hey, when you're in the line of work I'm in, surrounded by incompetent morons who try to boss you around all day, you do need someone to complain to sometimes. Fair enough. So, how does this therapy thing work? Well, you basically say whatever is bothering you. Sometimes just stating your problems out loud can be of some help. And then I guess I'll try to make sense of what you're telling me. Sounds... simple enough? Boro says in another period of silence and crouches on the two heroes. Tatsumaki glances at Boros. So, you gonna talk or what? I'm getting to it. Boro says with a sigh. It's abundantly clear the alien doesn't feel comfortable talking about the inner workings of his mind. Tatsumaki can't say she blames him. He doesn't seem like the type to be open about such things. Nevertheless, eventually, Boros breaks the awkward silence. I guess I should start with where I was before I came to this planet. I used to be known as the Dominator of the Universe. Boros goes on to explain his backstory to Tatsumaki. How he was too strong for his own good. How he conquered planets and slaughtered challengers. He explains what atrocities he's committed in the name of curing his boredom. All this leaves Tatsumaki with a bitter taste in her mouth. To think she had to rely on someone so vile to save the day. Someone who's killed billions and destroyed entire planets in search of mindless fun. However, in a strange way, the Esper can relate to Boros. Being too strong for one's own good is something Tatsumaki herself has been dealing with for the past 28 years of her life. Just for a moment, she wonders if, maybe, if she was raised differently, if she didn't have her sister by her side, if she didn't have people to protect, she might have ended up like Boros. Tatsumaki shakes that thought out of her head. 
But then, Boros starts talking about the events he went through on Earth. After many years of travel, I finally arrived here. You know what happened next to some extent. I destroyed a city and ordered one of my generals to go down to the planet's surface to check things out. To my surprise, just minutes after my arrival, a hero had made his way onto my ship. Tatsumaki perks up, assuming that the alien is talking about Blast himself. He dismantled my best generals with singular blows. For the first time in ages, I felt excitement boiling up within me. I craved to fight that man to my heart's content. And we fought. The battle was intense, but in the end I was defeated for the very first time in my life. I was so happy. And yet, I got the feeling that the hero hadn't even broken a sweat throughout the entire fight. It was at that point that I realized the hero was just as empty as me. I asked if this planet had any other powerful fighters like him. His response gave me hope. Hope that I could have more real battles here. The hero let me stay so long as I promised not to harm people. And so I did. Tatsumaki's eyes widened slightly. Blast let Boro stay here? Did he see potential for change in the alien? The Esper doesn't really know what to make of this, but if Blast allowed Boros to live, that's a big deal, and Tatsumaki will keep that in mind when making her own judgment about the monster. Before she can ponder any more, Boros continues. I remained hidden for a while until I encountered an organization which call themselves the Monster Association. I started fighting them and that's when you arrived. During the battle I got carried away and ended up dropping a continent on you all. After the fight the hero who defeated me originally got mad at me, understandably so, and I was forced to become a hero to repay him for what I'd done. At first, I had no enthusiasm at having to perform hero work. I felt humiliated. Me, the dominator of the universe, reduced to some guy fighting crime in the streets of a small planet. But over time, I don't know when exactly, something changed. I tamed Rover and took him in. Not as a general or a soldier, as a pet, as a friend even. Demon Cyborg became someone who I would soon come to call a comrade as well. Even the hero who originally defeated me and made me become a hero. I took a liking to them all. The more I lived as a hero, the more I became aware of just how truly empty my life as a conqueror was. I wasn't just bored. I'd grown numb to everything and anything. I couldn't even feel any emotions anymore until that faded battle on Earth. Do you have any idea how it felt? Joy, anger, sadness. All of those emotions were foreign to me. I was living an empty existence. No challengers. No place to call home, no source of any kind of frustration or happiness. But as a hero, I felt humiliation. I felt frustration. I felt... I experienced what it was like to be alive again. Truly alive. Over time, I began to understand that feeling things like humiliation was a far better alternative to feeling nothing. I even felt hints of joy when I was given official permission to keep Rover. Hints of fear when you arrived to talk to me. I didn't fully really realize what it meant until now, but I felt fear at the prospect of being exposed. I felt fear outside of a life-or-death battle. 
and I felt joy at having Rover beside me. Joy at something completely unrelated to Mortal Kombat. Once I began to feel emotions, I couldn't get enough of them. I grew to somewhat care about this backwater planet. Boros's eye widens, like he just came to that conclusion as he was talking. Maybe he really did just think of it now. From here, Boros begins talking about uncharted territory. Things he's never even considered before. It's almost like he's been hit with an epiphany of sorts. I've made actual connections here. That's why when the time came to take off my disguise, to lose it all, I felt... I don't really even know what I felt, what I feel right now. This emotion is unknown to me. Boros looks off into the distance. His hair blows in the wind. It's sadness. That's the emotion you feel. Tatsumaki looks at Boros. Are your thoughts any clearer now that you've said everything out loud? Maybe. So what do you make of all this? Boros asks and Tatsumaki thinks for a few moments. Before that, let me ask you a question. Do you regret what you've done? Do you regret killing all those people? Please answer me truthfully. Boros looks the Esper in the eyes. He sees a glint of... hope? Is she hoping for him to say he does? I'm not exactly sure. Do I wish I hadn't done it? Yeah. Probably. But do I regret it? I don't know. I witness the daily life of people in several cities here. They all have their own problems, and I understand that they definitely don't want cataclysmic events to fall upon them. But at the same time, I don't really care about them. I only care for the people I've got some connections with. Genos, you, Fubuki... That dark hero, Rover, and a few others. Boros intentionally never mentions Saitama by name. When he was telling a story to Tatsumaki too, he doesn't want Saitama to be pulled into this mess and become associated with a monster, just in case the Hero Association decides to deem him as a threat. Yet another sign that Boros really has become a lot more thoughtful over these past few weeks. Who knows? If things continue the way they're going now, maybe I'll start caring about more people in the future. Tatsumaki listens intently. When Boro stops talking, she takes a minute to think. And Boros gives her that minute. He doesn't feel any need to rush at all. One thing is certain. No matter what happens, no matter what you do from now on, the crimes you've committed will never be forgiven. If there is a hell, you'll definitely go there when you die. But that doesn't mean you can't repent. You were clearly a terrible person before coming here, and I'm still not entirely convinced that you're not a terrible person right now either. But you're also clearly becoming more human. The fact that you're starting to care about a few particular people is a good start. If you want to keep the bonds you have right now, and even form new ones, I suggest working hard to regain everyone's trust. If everyone sees you going around doing heroic deeds without any incentive other than your own free will, if everyone sees you working toward becoming better, I believe they might just give you a chance. Boros looks at Tatsumaki. He can't help but notice she said they instead of we. And what about you? Would you give me a chance? Tatsumaki looks at Boros with a raised eyebrow. Isn't it obvious? I'm already giving you a chance by talking about all this with you. But don't think for a second that I'm fully on board with you. Like I said, I'm only giving you a chance at redemption in my eyes. 
Boros blinks a few times before letting out a smile. I suppose you're right. He stands up. Very well. I shall do my best to gain back what I've lost. Tatsumaki smiles back at him, albeit a bit reluctantly. Yes, I think that's the right thing to do. Let's head to the Hero HQ and have you properly explain everything to the rest of the heroes. They already agreed to hear you out, so I believe things should go somewhat smoothly. And if not, King did say he wouldn't be going after you for the time being, and he seems like a generous man. He'll probably give you a chance too. With him and I backing you, there's nothing the Hero Association will be able to do about it. Sounds good. The two heroes prepare to leave, but Tatsumaki's S-Class hero communication device suddenly lets out a signal. A call for help. Tatsumaki looks at the device, and her eyes widen slightly. It's coming from Bang. But he's with Atomic Samurai, isn't he? What could possibly threaten the duo to the point that they're asking for backup? Only one way to find out. Boro says as he stretches his arms and back. I suppose so. Let's go. A few hours before the meeting between Tatsumaki and Boros, Bang, Bomb, Atomic Samurai, and the Council of Swordsmen just got done fending off Phoenix Man and are in hot pursuit of Garo. The murder monster curses under his breath when he sees them heading toward the Hero Hunter. Seems his battle with the heroes didn't last long enough for the trail to run cold. At this rate, they'll catch up to Garo in under an hour. There's only one thing Phoenix Man can do. He flies above the young martial artist. Garo, long time no see. The bird monster lands in front of the hero hunter. Garo frowns. Oh hey, it's Birdbrain again. What do you want? I've come to warn you. Several heroes are chasing after you as we speak. They'll catch up soon. You don't stand a chance against them at your current level. You think I'm unaware of that? I know when I'm being tracked. So, what are you planning to do? Fight, obviously. I'll pick them off one by one with a surprise attack and guerrilla warfare tactics. That won't work. It's not just your master. They also have his brother, Atomic Samurai, and four experienced swordsmen with them. Each one a lot stronger than the three you faced a while ago. You've gotten stronger, yes, but you definitely can't even begin of dreaming about taking on a team like that on your own. Instead, I propose we head to the forest. We can lose them better there. Drop the we. You and I are not affiliated. Would you stop being so stubborn and just accept my help for once? I'm trying to keep you alive here. Either you come with me peacefully, or I'll drag you by force like a child. I'm sure you've noticed I've changed forms again. I could beat you within an inch of your life a second time if you'd like. Garo frowns and grits his teeth. He doesn't like it, but he knows he can't oppose the monster right now. And as much as he hates to admit it, the martial artist knows he probably can't defeat his master at the moment, much less him with several S-class level fighters as support. Fine, let's go. But don't get in my way. Trust me, I won't. The unlikely duo, led by Phoenix Man, make their way out of the city and run into the forest. Phoenix Man hopes to train Garo up a bit there, and then have his support when they inevitably face off against Bang's group again. With Phoenix Man's power and a stronger Garo as support, they might stand a decent chance at wiping out this group. Phoenix Man is willing to take that gamble. However, Soon after entering the depths of the forest, Garo starts feeling a bit uneasy. Hey, do you hear that? 
Phoenix Man blinks a few times and starts listening. A few moments later, he hears something. It's faint and coming from far away. But the monster can make out the sound of metal clashing against metal. Yes, I do. It seems we are not the only ones here. Let us proceed with caution. And beneath to them, only a couple kilometers away, Hellfire, Sonic, Gale and Goketsu are sparring with each other. The ninjas and the martial artists are testing each other's strength. Now that they've made a temporary alliance, it's good to get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. The ninjas soon learn that Goketsu is almost as fast as they are, and his strength is superior to theirs. He'll no doubt make a valuable ally. As their train continues, the four monsters all notice something. Goketsu thanks to his incredible sense of smell and hearing, and the ninjas because of the way they were raised. Someone is coming. I hear two sets of footsteps. Two people, huh? Let's see what they'll do. The four monsters stand scattered throughout the forest clearing. A few minutes later, Phoenix Man and Garo enter said clearing. Phoenix Man recognizes the familiar faces of his fellow Monster Association members and smirks. Goketsu, the ninja duo. How have you been? Further away, Bang's group arrives at the forest entrance. The old master looks at the tall trees. What do you think, brother? Me? I think this is a perfect place for an ambush. Agreed. We have to be careful in there. Let's split up into two groups. Both groups will enter the forest at the same time and travel in parallel lines. We'll stay within approximately 200 meters of each other. Close enough to help each other out in need, but far enough apart to not fall into the same ambush, if there is one. Atomic lays out a strategy and Bang nods. Good thinking. My brother and I will take the left. You and the council go right. Alright. Good luck in there. Bang returns the gesture, and the two groups enter the forest, where a massive battle is brewing. Goketsu, the ninja duo, how have you been? Phoenix Man waves a hand before noticing Sonic standing by. Did you find a new friend? Something tingles in the back of Garo's mind. Something about what Phoenix Man just said. But he can't quite place a finger on it. Meanwhile, the four monsters stare at Phoenix Man, not recognizing him due to his changed form since the Monster Association days. How do you know us? Oh, right, right. My appearance has changed a lot, hasn't it? The bird monster rubs the back of his head. I'm Phoenix Man. Remember, Monster Association Scout? That name does ring a bell. Oh, that's right. Now I remember. Seems you've gone through quite the evolution, haven't you? Indeed I have. While Gale and Phoenix Man chat, Hellfire notices something. What are you doing here with a human? He points at Garo. His name is Garo. I'm sure you've heard of the Hero Hunter by now. That's him. Phoenix Man says and Garo scoffs. I see. Quite the catch. Anywho, what are you four doing here? We are training in order to overcome the creature who destroyed the Monster Association. Phoenix Man whistles. That's a tall order, all right. Seems you could use some extra muscle on the team, then. If you believe you are strong enough to help out, be my guest. We'll of course have to test you to see if you're strong enough to fight alongside us. But after that, we'll be glad to accept you into the group. 
Phoenix Man chuckles. That sounds wonderful. We can build a new monster association ourselves. Yeah, not gonna happen. Garo glares at Phoenix Man. If you think I'll work with any of these second-rate phonies, then you're even more delusional than I thought. I'm out of here. Garo turns and starts walking away, leaving all the monsters confused. Phoenix Man stutters a bit. W wait Garo! See ya! Suddenly, Goketsu appears in front of the Hero Hunter, blocking his path. With his arms crossed and all four of his eyes glaring down at the human. Not so fast. You know where we are now. We can't be sure you won't inform the heroes about our whereabouts. Are you kidding? You know what I've been doing over the last month, don't you? Oh, we are well aware. Since you started hunting, you haven't killed a single hero. You're not really out to get them. And by the way, calling us phonies when you're the only non-monster here? Real ironic. In any case, we can't let you leave. Either you join us, or you die. Hellfire glares at Garo, and Garo glares back. A stare down ensues. No, no, let's not be hasty. I'm sure we can figure this out. You're the one who brought this human here, Beakman, or whatever your name is. I suggest you keep your mouth shut. Sonic says, already grasping his blade. He is really not amused at his training being interrupted. And this guy brought them a security risk, who apparently doesn't even finish off his prey. The situation is tense to say the least. With Garu being the way he is and the monsters not trusting him, a battle could break out at any moment. One thing is abundantly clear though. Garo and the monsters will not work together. Phoenix Man has to pick a side. He weighs his options. In the short term, siding with Goketsu's group would be more beneficial, as they have the strength and numbers advantage. But in the long run, Garo's ability to grow stronger with every fight is extremely useful. Phoenix Man plans to use him to grow his own strength. And so the bird monster makes a decision. He walks over to Goketsu and Garo nonchalantly. Alright, settle down everyone, I'm sure we can- Several swords suddenly surround his neck. Hellfire, Gale, and Sonic have all drawn their weapons on the bird monster. Nuh uh uh. Let the hero hunter decide for himself whether he wants to live or die. Phoenix Man gulps before slowly raising his arms into the air, indicating he surrenders. At the same time, Garo takes a fighting stance against Goketsu. Gentlemen, let's not be hasty. I'll back off. Phoenix Man sighs in defeat, before suddenly swinging his wings full force and knocking the three ninjas away from him with a surprise attack. Garo, hold out for a while on your own. I'll come to your aid as soon as I deal with the ninjas. He declares as he spreads out his wings and raises his claws. In response, the three ninjas enter their monster forms and raise their weapons. So, you've chosen to side with the human. Big mistake. Hellfire and Gale burst into action, charging at Phoenix Man head on with their blades ready to slice the monster up. Meanwhile, Sonic jumps into the air and throws a few exploding shuriken at the bird monster to back them up. Phoenix Man ducks to the side to avoid the explosions, but the two charging ninjas take this as an opportunity to swing their swords at him, forcing Phoenix Man to block their blades with his claws. Suddenly, Sonic appears behind him, ready to drive a sword into his back. In response to this, the bird monster suddenly leans backwards and blocks the attack with his beak. He then flaps his wings with all his strength, creating an intense gust of wind which forces the ninjas back a few meters. The monsters all pause for a moment, before all of them suddenly disappear from sight. The four fighters dash around the battlefield, exchanging numerous blows and creating countless afterimages.
Over the course of a few seconds, the battlefield becomes blurry as Phoenix Man and the ninjas cover it in after images of their battle. Meanwhile, Garo and Goketsu are at a standoff, while the action is going on around them. The tall monster slowly uncrosses his arms. I hear you are a student of the legendary Silver Fang. I am curious to see how you do battle. Don't compare me to the old man! Garo mutters before jumping up at Goketsu and aiming a punch at his face. The monster's eyes easily follow the human's movements, and he sidesteps out of the way of the attack before casually swinging an uppercut at Garo, who is now in midair and unable to dodge. However, the hero hunter is no slouch. He notices the punch incoming and uses one of his arms to redirect it at Goketsu's face. The monster's eyes widen a little, but due to the attack he threw being so casual, he's able to stop his fist inches before it crashes into his face. In that instance, Garo lands back on the forest ground and lunges at Goketsu's legs. Just as he reaches the monster's feet, he suddenly stops all of his momentum and jumps up, aiming to deliver an uppercut to his opponent's chin. At the last moment, Goketsu leans back, avoiding the hit. Straight away, the martial artist swings his head downwards, and his chin crashes into Garo's body, sending him flying to the ground. Thankfully, the hero hunter is able to land on his feet. Instead of backing off, he aims a roundhouse kick at one of Goketsu's legs with the intention of cracking the monster's bone. Goketsu looks at him in slight surprise. The relentlessness of this human is commendable. However, at the last moment, the monster leaps over the kick, easily avoiding it before shooting one of his legs down at Garo, aiming to stomp him. Garo's eyes widen, and he's just barely able to hop back quickly enough to dodge the blow but the force of it crashing into the ground knocks the human monster back a few meters. Understanding how much trouble he is in, Garo chooses to put some distance between himself and his foe. He tenses up the muscles in his legs before jumping backwards. Suddenly, his back hits a wall. Or rather, it hits Goketsu's leg. Garo's eyes widen in shock as he realizes that his opponent is now behind him. A moment ago, the monster was right in front of him. How did he get around him so fast? Teleportation? No, this guy doesn't seem to have such powers. It's just his physical speed. Sweat drips down Garo's face as he experiences what a top-tier dragon-level monster is like for the first time. How terrifying. I will admit, your skills far surpass most martial artists I've seen in my lifetime. However, I've seen your master fighting, and he is better than this. Goketsu utters before suddenly kicking Garo in the back. The human monster grunts in pain as he flies forward a few dozen meters before landing on the ground on all fours. Not a moment later, he feels Goketsu's foot stomp down on him and flatten his body. Garo feels several of his bones break and shatter. The giant monster looks down at him. What's the matter? I'm barely stepping on you. Get up within three seconds, or I will crush you. Goketsu says and Garo grits his teeth. This thing, it's mocking him. And that's unacceptable. A glimmer of anger appears in the hero hunter's eyes, and he feels a surge of power coursing through his body. Don't you dare mock me! He shouts before suddenly standing up with such force that Goketsu's foot is launched a few meters into the air. The monster's eyes widen. Before he can say anything, Garo dashes out from underneath his leg and jumps at his waist with speed far greater than anything he's shown thus far. Caught off guard, the four-eyed giant can't react in time and Garo delivers a furious blow to his stomach, following it up with more attacks to the abdomen, before Goketsu regains his bearings and launches a hand at him, intending to grab the human monster. However, to Goketsu's surprise, Garo grabs onto one of his fingers and springboards off of it, lunging at the giant's face. A fraction of a second later, the monster martial artist feels a fist collide with his chin, and his head is tilted upwards. Right after the punch, Garo raises his legs up to his chest in midair and kicks them both out at Goketsu's chin, 
delivering a powerful blow and pushing himself away from the monster's face. The hero hunter flips in the air before landing gracefully on his feet. How do you like that, you piece of garbage? Goketsu stumbles back a few steps before regaining his balance and slowly shifting his head downward to look at the hero hunter. To Garo's surprise, he doesn't see any blood or bruising on his face. It's like he never even hit him. What's this? Have you been holding back? No, that doesn't seem to be the case. Did you grow stronger just now? Interesting. It appears you were more of a monster than I originally thought. Damn right I am. Garo smirks, but that smirk soon disappears when Goketsu looks at him unamused. That is unfortunate for you. I won't have to hold back as much now as I did before. Garo's jaw drops. This guy was holding back? No, that can't be. Prepare yourself, boy. Goketsu declares as he takes a fighting stance. Garo gazes upon it and can't spot any openings. That stance is a clear sign of vast martial arts knowledge. Just who is this guy? What did Phoenix Men call him when they first arrived? At that moment, a terrifying realization hits the hero hunter. That's right, Goketsu. Now he remembers. The first ever winner of the Super Fight Tournament. A world famous martial artist. Not as well known as Silver Fang, but still up there in the big leagues of the fighting community. He was said to have died fighting a monster. Of course, now Garo can see that that wasn't true. Seems he turned into a monster instead somehow. In any case, this is bad news. Not only is this guy powerful, but he is also a master martial artist. Garo gulps and squats down into his own battle stance. Well then, let us begin. Goketsu leaps at the hero hunter at an unbelievable speed. The next thing Garo knows, he's flying through the air and crashing into a tree, shattering it into a million pieces. He gasps in shock. What the hell happened? He didn't even see the monster moving. Before he can think anymore, he sees Goketsu dashing at him again. Just barely, Garo is able to kick off the ground and dodge to the side fast enough to avoid the giant's attack. But he is soon hit by a follow-up blow from Goketsu. A massive uppercut to the gut. The monster's fist crashes into Garo's body and rocks his bones, leaving the hero hunter numb. Goketsu then raises one of his fists into the air and sends it crashing down on Garo with enough force to break a few more bones and launch the hero hunter into the ground. Garo coughs up blood as he desperately tries to stand up, but as soon as he's back on his feet, he feels Goketsu's foot collide with his leg and shatter its bones. With one last grunt, Garo falls to the ground. With several broken bones in his arms and legs, he can't move. Goketsu glares down at him. Is that all? How disappointing. For a student of Bang's, you certainly don't live up to his legacy. I plan to face him someday. I wonder what he will say when I present your corpse to him. I say that is not going to happen. Get away from him at once, creature. Garo's eyes widen. Old man? Bang and Bomb step into the forest clearing, causing Goketsu's eyes to widen. He lets out a low, rumbling growl. So you really did lead heroes to this location after all. At the same time, Phoenix Man lands on the ground on the opposite side of the battlefield, with a few cuts on his wings and limbs. The three ninjas touch down near Goketsu as well. They all have cuts, bruises and other minor injuries on their bodies. Gale looks at Goketsu. Seems you're right, 
Those bastards really did lead heroes to our location. Hey, it wasn't intentional. So what? It still proves you're incompetent. What did you? Phoenix Man is interrupted when one of his wings suddenly falls to the ground, having been sliced off of his body. One, two, three, four... Five monsters! And the Hero Hunter! This place is a gold mine! Atomic Samurai steps out of the shadows behind Phoenix Man, who grunts in pain and turns to face the new threat. Atomic Samurai... I've been looking to settle the score with you. The two warriors stare each other down. At the same time, Bang looks at Goketsu. Something about him seems familiar. That hair. Bang's eyes narrow, and Goketsu notices it. Do you recognize me by any chance? I am not entirely sure to tell you the truth. Something about you is definitely familiar, but I don't think we've ever met before. No, we have not. But my name should ring a bell. I am Goketsu. Goketsu? What happened to you? You seemed like such a promising young man back in the day. I even considered approaching you to offer a place at my dojo. But then I heard you had died. What really happened? Goketsu scoffs. How nice of you. Well, I suppose telling you won't hurt. I did indeed face off against a powerful monster, and was defeated. However, instead of killing me, he offered the chance to become a monster myself. And I took it. Bang's eyes narrow. The possibility of there being a monster who can turn others into monsters is certainly worrying. Unbeknownst to him, that threat has already been handled long ago. Is that so? Did he force you, or did you do it of your own free will? Free will. I see. Then it's a good thing I did not have the chance to teach you. You were rotten from the start. Harsh words for someone who can't seem to keep his own students from going rogue and trying to imitate monster behavior. Goketsu motions at Garo, who is still lying on the ground in front of him. Bang does not respond. In any case, I have always wanted to face you in battle. Let us see whose methods are more effective. Your training, or my monsterization. Goketsu takes his fighting stance. Bang responds by taking off his shirt and entering a battle stance of his own. Come! Atomic Samurai and Phoenix Man stare each other down, both in a fighting stance, ready to pounce on their enemy at any moment. The bird monster's eyes flinch when four figures step out of the shadows behind the samurai. The Council of Swordsmen. Of course they would accompany their friend to the battlefield. Come on, Kamikaze. Don't go hogging all the fun for yourself now. Let us join in too. No. You four go help the old masters with their opponents. I believe in their abilities, but they're currently in a four-on-two situation. I feel that those three humanoid monsters are pretty strong, and the big guy too. Atomic explains, all while not shifting his gaze away from Phoenix Man for even a moment. The four swordsmen think the situation through for a moment before Nichiren nods. Okay, just don't get yourself killed here. The old master says as he starts walking toward the other side of the battlefield. The other three council members follow suit. However, Phoenix Man notices something from the corner of his eye. Just for a brief second, he tilts his pupils toward the group of swordsmen and away from Atomic Samurai. In that instance, Atomic readies himself to rush at Phoenix Man and slash his neck. 
but before he can start moving, he notices the monster's lips contort into a smirk. Getting a bad feeling, the swordsman stops himself from attacking. What's gotten into you? Why are you smiling like that? He asks cautiously and Phoenix Man turns his gaze back at him. Oh, it's nothing really. I just discovered something very funny. No need to concern yourself with it. Atomic Samurai raises an eyebrow. Seriously? Are you trying to crack jokes here? Please, enlighten me on this discovery of yours before I slash your neck open. Well, if you insist. I just find it funny that you're traveling with a monster of all things. This leaves Atomic Samurai confused. What in the world is this thing talking about? Involuntarily, he looks over at the Council of Swordsmen walking away from him. Suddenly, his heart goes cold. Guys, duck! Nichiren, despite being caught completely by surprise, trusts his former pupil completely and ducks down to the ground right away. The other two swordsmen are just a fraction of a second too slow. Their bodies suddenly freeze, and in the next instant, their heads roll off of their bodies. Tch, why do you have to ruin the surprise? Haragiri shouts to Phoenix Man as he draws back his blade, with which he just decapitated two of his comrades. His skin begins morphing. His hair rises into the air. Ears become elongated, and his skin becomes rough, turning a disgusting shade of brown. A third eye appears on the swordsman's forehead. Sorry, I just couldn't resist the temptation. Phoenix Man shrugs and Haragiri glares at him for a moment before turning to face Nichiren, who's already gotten back to his feet and unsheathed his sword. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter anyways. I'll clean up this scrub while you take care of the annoying samurai. Deal? Deal. Atomic Samurai and Nichiren watch on in shock and disbelief. Two of their longtime comrades are dead and by the hand of a third longtime comrade no less. Haragiri, what is the meaning of this? Atomic shouts before Phoenix Man suddenly lunges at him at full speed, hoping to take advantage of the hero's shock. Can you really afford to worry about others right now? The monster shouts as he swipes a claw at Atomic, forcing him to block the attack and focus on the target in front of him. Phoenix Man lets out a gleeful grin as he sees the bloodshot look in Atomic Samurai's eyes. I don't know what's going on, but I'll make all of you monsters pay for this with your lives! Watch yourself, Atomic Samurai. This rage is unbefitting of a hero. At the same time, Nichiren clashes blades with his longtime friend. What the hell happened to you? Isn't it obvious? I've reached new heights by abandoning my humanity. On the other side of the battlefield, Goketsu takes his battle stance against Bang and Bomb. Let us see whose methods are more effective. Your training, or my monsterization. Bang responds by taking off his shirt and entering a fighting stance of his own. Come! On command, Goketsu launches at Bang, not holding anything back from the very start. The old man stands his ground as the giant swings a massive fist at him. Moving calmly, like a stream of water, Silver Fang raises one of his arms and gently redirects the blow away from his body. The monster's punch lands on the ground, shaking the entire forest clearing and cracking the earth beneath them. Swiftly, Goketsu draws back his fist and at the same time launches another punch at Bang, followed up by another one, and then another one, and another one. The giant monster unleashes a barrage of devastating attacks on the old master, who perfectly redirects every single one away from himself. After just a couple seconds of this, the terrain around the two warriors is decimated and a giant crater is formed from all the punches. 
a dust cloud rises into the air. At the same time, Bang's older brother, Bomb, jumps into the air to attack Goketsu while he's assaulting his foe. But just as the old master readies a fist to punch the giant monster, two figures suddenly appear on either side of him. Bomb barely has enough time to react as two swords are swung right at him. Thinking fast, he expertly swirls his body in midair to dodge the blades and gets a look at his attackers. Two monsterized ninjas, Hellfire and Gale, have come to aid their ally. Let those two battle it out uninterrupted. We'll play with you in the meantime. Gale utters before swinging a wide kick at the martial artist, who raises an arm to block it. Not a moment later, Hellfire swings his sword at Bomb from behind. Noticing this, the old master grabs a hold of Gale's leg and swings him at Hellfire. The ninjas collide with one another and are sent flying back a few meters. Bomb prepares this opening to strike Goketsu, but a third ninja, Sonic, rushes at him from below, forcing Bomb to throw the idea of helping his brother out the window. The martial artist exchanges a few punches with Sonic in midair before the two of them land on the ground and the two other ninjas dash back into the battle. The old martial artist jumps back to avoid being surrounded, but his foes give him no time to breathe at all, as they rush at him immediately. Seeing no other way out of this, Bomb takes a fighting stance. Very well. I shall slay you here and now. Meanwhile, Goketsu pulls back both of his fists and takes a step back from Bang. Seeing that regular blows won't work on the old man, the giant decides to change up his strategy. He jumps into the air and shoots out one of his legs at the old martial artist. Bang jumps into the air to avoid being hit, but the kick crashes into the ground, shaking the entire forest. Huge chunks of debris, rocks and whole trees are launched into the sky. Cracks appear all around the battlefield and many combatants lose their footing. Atomic Samurai, Phoenix Man, the Ninjas, the Swordsman, Bomb. Everyone is forced to leap off of the ground and continue their battles in the air, using the chunks of earth and the sky as temporary footholds. Meanwhile, Gokitsu lands back on the ground and looks around. All the dust and debris makes it hard to see where Bang went. There's no way he was crushed in that last attack. He has to be lurking somewhere. Goketsu's eyes start darting around, examining every chunk of rubble in the air around him. Without warning, Silver Fang lunges at the giant's back from behind one of the pieces of rock, aiming to slam a fist into the back of a Goketsu's neck. Unfortunately for the old martial artist, Bang's enhanced sense of hearing picks up on his movements and he turns to face his foe just fast enough to block his attack and launch a counter-strike. A swift chop to Bang's side. Taken by surprise, the old master is hit and sent crashing into the ground. Not wasting a second, as soon as Goketsu sees where Bang landed, he launches a leg at the spot, trying to crush Bang with a devastating kick. Silverfang recovers just fast enough to notice the incoming attack and get back to his feet before redirecting the kick to the side and making Goketsu lose his balance by doing so. Bang then sprints at the monster and before it can react, he drives a strong punch into the giant's nose. This combined with the previous act of disrupting Goketsu's balance makes the monster topple over. His back hits the ground and Bang takes advantage of this by rocketing at the creature from above with the intent to drive a kick into one of his eyes. Thinking fast, Goketsu swings both of his hands at the incoming human missile and claps them together, smushing his opponent in between his palms. Bang grunts in pain as the power of the clap makes his bones ache. Damn it, he made an oversight. He thought making the monster fall to the ground would stun him for a bit, but it seems Goketsu was truly experienced and did not let such a minor setback disrupt his focus on the enemy. The giant's arm muscles bulge as he attempts to crush Bang in between his palms. In return, the old man tenses up every muscle in his body to withstand the pressure being placed on him. Realizing he won't get anywhere like this, Goketsu suddenly separates his arms, freeing Bang. But a mere fraction of a second later, he sends a powerful kick at the martial artist's back. Bang, still stiff from the previous struggle, can't react in time and the monster's knee crashes into his back, 
making the old man cough up some spit and sending him flying. Quickly, Goketsu flips onto his stomach and hops back to his feet before sprinting after his opponent. Meanwhile, Bang regains his bearings and lands on his feet. He slides a few meters before coming to a halt. The moment he stops his momentum, he sees Goketsu already above him, ready to drive a fist down onto the old man. However, this time Silverfang is prepared for the attack. He quickly redirects it into the ground before hopping onto the monster's extended arm and running up to his face on it. Once Bang reaches the monster's shoulder, he intends to jump off of it and aim a punch at the giant's neck, right at one of the arteries. Goketsu's eyes widen. Right as Bang gets onto his shoulder, he quickly lifts it and presses it to his neck, hoping to squish his opponent in between his massive shoulder and neck. Not falling for tricks like that again! Bang shouts as he grabs a hold of one of Goketsu's shoulder spikes and throws himself off of the monster's shoulder before he could get caught. Maybe not, but you've left yourself wide open. Goketsu shouts triumphantly as Bang is now in midair and vulnerable. The giant launches a powerful punch at Silverfang, but to his surprise, the master easily redirects the blow, even from this position. Do not be so sure, creature. As the two martial artists continue their battle, elsewhere, Bomb is getting attacked from all angles as the three ninjas chase him around the battlefield. Without a sword, the martial artist does not have any way to block his opponent's blades, so he's forced to keep dodging their every move, jumping from rock to rock, using the debris still in the air as footholds and as cover. Eventually, this starts to annoy the ninjas. Maybe we should split up? One of us can hold off this geezer while the rest go assist Goketsu or kill the other heroes. No. This man might be a coward, but his movements are fluid and radiate skill and experience. If we split up, he'll pick us off one by one. Tricky old bastard. Hellfire informs Sonic before Bomb suddenly lunges at him from behind a nearby piece of rubble. Hellfire curses. He let himself be distracted. The old martial artist winds up one of his arms and shoots it at Hellfire, who blocks it with the blunt side of his sword. Unexpectedly, the blade suddenly snaps into pieces and several gashes appear on Hellfire's arm. The monster screams out in pain. Bomb smirks slightly. Since when is fighting smart against three opponents considered cowardly? The martial artist asks before kicking Hellfire away. In that instant, Sonic and Gale jump at him from both sides, but with there being two attackers now instead of three, Bomb has a much easier time countering their attacks. He swiftly catches and breaks Sonic's blade before turning to Gale and driving an elbow into his nose, breaking it as well. While both ninjas are still surprised, Bomb takes the opportunity to snatch both of Gale's blades from his hands and throw them as far away as he can manage. Before long, the ninjas regain their composure, and both attack Bomb with punches and kicks, which the old master is able to block and parry with much less difficulty than the blades previously, since he doesn't need to have to worry about getting cut now. The three warriors clash in midair as they fall to the ground. As soon as their feet touch the forest floor, the combatants all jump away from each other, and the two ninjas regroup with Hellfire. Gale rubs some blood off of his broken nose, as Hellfire attempts to do the same for his arm, but he soon finds that his arm is completely sliced apart. It will be useless in the battle from now on. Just what kind of weird martial art does this old fart use to be able to mangle his arm like that? Are you guys good to continue? Yes, what about you? My arm is busted up, but I'll be fine. More importantly, this bastard is smarter than he looks. He waited for the perfect chance to get rid of our weapons. We've lost a crucial advantage. Never mind that. We can fight with our bare hands. Right. Let's hit him with all we've got. Seeing that his foes are ready for round two, Bomb takes his fighting stance. He huffs a bit. His old age is starting to catch up to him. Stamina-wise, Bomb is not going to hold up very well. He needs to finish this quickly. Now that the ninjas have lost their blades, that shouldn't be too difficult.
Meanwhile, Atomic Samurai clashes with Phoenix Man. The two warriors match each other blow for blow, blocking and parrying each other's attacks as the debris launched into the air at the beginning of the battle is finally falling back down to the ground and landing all around them. The two of them have to be careful to not let any huge rubble crash into their heads. By now, Phoenix Man's wing has completely regenerated, and he uses his claws, as well as the sharp tips of his wings, to swipe at Atomic Samurai, and put as much pressure on him as possible. With two arms and four wings, that's six appendages in total for Atomic to watch out for. The Swordsmaster elegantly maneuvers himself around all of them, dodging and parrying attacks with unreal levels of mastery in the art of swordsmanship. Witnessing this skill firsthand, Phoenix Man can't help but feel some respect for the samurai. But at the same time, he also feels annoyed. Nothing he does is getting through to Atomic. The monster has to think of something new and different. That's when he suddenly spreads out his wings and flies into the air. Ever faced a flying foe before, Atomic Samurai? Phoenix Man laughs before lunging at the hero from the sky at an enormous speed. Atomic is taken aback, but not caught off guard. He raises his sword to block the incoming attack, but right as the bird monster's claw is about to collide with the samurai's blade, Phoenix Man swirls to the side and flies past the swordsman, brushing one of his razor-sharp winds against the swordsman's side. Kamikaze grunts as a gash appears just under his ribs. Not good. Phoenix Man flies a few dozen meters before turning around and lunging at the hero again. Ignoring the blood gushing out from his wound, Atomic Samurai raises his blade. He keeps a close eye on the opponent, watching to see what direction he'll go in this time. Wrinkles appear around Kamikaze's eyes as he strains his senses to their limits. He cannot allow himself to be hit like that again. At the last moment before impact, Phoenix Man swirls to the side again, but this time Atomic Samurai is able to react in time and block the monster's attack. This pattern repeats multiple times, with Phoenix Man backing off and charging in, backing off and charging in. He's inflicted a serious wound already. Now all he has to do is wear his opponent down and let him bleed out. Shouldn't be very difficult. He just has to keep Atomic occupied enough to not allow him to treat his injury. Meanwhile, Atomic Samurai is in a bad spot. He can't really even go for any kill shots since, unless the monster is completely destroyed, he can just come back stronger than before. The Atomic Slash is his only real chance at victory, and even then, it's only a chance. He could cut the monster up into a thousand tiny pieces, but who knows what the limit of Phoenix Man's rebirth ability is. He might need to be completely annihilated in order to actually die. What if the Atomic Slash isn't enough? The damned monster might come back even stronger than he is now, and at that point, nobody here would even stand a chance. What a pain. As the action is going on all around the battlefield, below ground, Garo's limb body has fallen into one of the large cracks in the earth. Beaten and broken, bleeding, with several of his shattered bones piercing his internal organs, having fallen from quite the distance on top of that. The hero hunter's body is giving out on him. His vision is starting to fade. Garo curses under his breath. If something doesn't change fast, he's going to die. There's nothing he can do. Nothing he can change. He can't accomplish his goals anymore. Not like this. He really is about to bleed to death in some miserable hellhole. Not to mention that he had to be saved by the old man just to get this far. How pathetic. How infuriating. No, it cannot end like this. It cannot end like this. Garu screams out. Through sheer willpower, he starts moving. As he thinks about his goals and how to achieve them. As he thinks about what kind of evil he truly wants to commit. Garo's body starts changing. His bones snap back into place. His wounds close up. Monsterization is beginning to take full effect. And Garo's limiter is starting to break.
Unaware of this, Bang continues his battle with Goketsu. The two martial artists dash around the battlefield at faster than light speeds, exchanging hundreds of blows, parrying, blocking and redirecting each other's every attack flawlessly. In the chaos, seconds seem to turn into hours as the two warriors start perceiving time differently. So much is happening in such a short amount of time. Punches, kicks and parries start blending together into one blurry hurricane. From the side, only after images of the battle can be seen. Bang grunts as he barely dodges a kick from an unexpected angle. Gokutsu groans when one of Bang's punches manages to land on his side. The martial artists are really pushing each other to the limit. Bang realizes that if things go on like this, he'll be the one to tire out first. He'd like to avoid using the awakening breath, as it would drain his very life essence. And Silver Fang wants to save what little time he has left as a fighter to reach out to his lost student, Garo. The old master really does not want to risk spending the last of his strength dealing with this monster. But if he doesn't, and things drag out too much, he'll have to resort to the awakening breath anyway. There's no point in waiting until then. If Bang uses his trump card now and finishes the battle quickly, he might still have enough gas in the tank left for Garo later. And so the master makes up his mind. He jumps into the air high above Goketsu and takes a deep breath. Out of nowhere, a figure lunges at Bang from a blind spot and slams a fist into his ribs. Silverfang's eyes widen in shock from the sudden pain. Where'd this come from? He looks down and sees Garo, but he looks different somehow. Don't count me out of the battle yet, old man. The hero hunter smirks before driving his fist deeper into his master's side. Bang feels a couple of his ribs snap and ram into one of his lungs. Coughing up blood, the martial artist composes himself and kicks his pupil away. Both master and student land on the ground. Bang clenches his side while Garo stands up tall, looking... different. More monstrous. His hair is blood red and spiked up. His eyes are both crimson. And perhaps the most noticeable change is a black spiral running all across his body. Garo looks at himself in disbelief. Somehow all of his broken bones have healed. Unbeknownst to him, this is due to his accelerated monsterization. Goketsu looks at the human monster from the side. How are you able to stand? I broke at least a few dozen bones in your legs. Have you monsterized further? Maybe. Who knows? Garo smirks as he turns to face the giant. But that doesn't really matter now. I'm here for a rematch. While Garo gloats, Bang is still in disbelief. What in the world is going on with his pupil? Is he really becoming a monster? How? On top of that, the old master's broken ribs are pressed against his lung. If he tries to take a deep breath now, they'll pierce that lung. Which means he can only take quick and shallow breaths. It also means no more awakening breath. He'll have to fight carefully too. Damn it, this is bad. A rematch, you say? You seem confident for someone who just lost. Besides, I still have to finish off Silverfang. I can play with you later. Oh please, that was only a warm-up. And ain't nobody killing the old man but me. Garo smirks and Goketsu grows irritated. Very well. I shall kill you and then him. The giant crouches down and jumps at Garo, who does the same. The two monsters collide their fists in the air, and to Goketsu's surprise, Garo is able to withstand the impact, which, just minutes ago, would have shattered his entire upper half. The kid's growth is insane. 
The two monsters fly by each other and land back down on the ground before both bouncing at one another with intent to kill once again. Goketsu swings his massive fist down on Garo, but the human monster dodges and counterattacks by jumping at the giant's face and attempting to kick him in the nose, only for Goketsu to block the attack with his other arm. The two of them fight like this for a while, Garo zipping around and taking advantage of his opponent's size, while Goketsu uses his size for his own benefit as he smashes both his arms into the ground and creates a massive cloud of dust. With four perceptive eyes, he's able to pick up on the slightest of movements and somewhat see through the smoke, while Garo is left blinded. Just barely, Goketsu notices Garo in the fog and lunges at him with a wound up fist. Before the hero hunter can realize what's going on, the giant's punch crashes into his body and sends him flying out of the smoke. Goketsu quickly jumps after the human monster and catches up to him in midair before swinging both his arms down in a double X handle and slamming Garo into the ground hard. Hard enough to form a crater. Goketsu then lets himself free fall down on Garo from the sky, landing another devastating hit. Bang watches on from the side. He can't let his pupil get thrashed around like this. He has to do something. Taking as deep a breath as he can without impaling his lungs, the old martial artist dashes at Goketsu, who notices the monster incoming and prepares to fight him. However, one of the giant's legs is suddenly lifted off of the ground by Garo, and he loses his footing. At that moment, Silverfang slams a fist into Goketsu's chin, and then a jab into one of his eyes before the monster is able to regain his footing and attacks Bang with an uppercut. But the old martial artist just redirects the attack back into Goketsu's own face, causing him to hit himself and fall over. Before Bang can take advantage of his opponent's vulnerable state, Garo rockets at him from below. Silver Fang turns to face his disciple and the two of them exchange several hits in midair before Goketsu hops back to his feet and launches a fist at both of them. Thinking fast, with both of his arms preoccupied by Garo, Bang extends one of his legs out and uses it to redirect Goketsu's blow away from himself. He then quickly grabs one of Garo's arms with both of his hands and swings his pupil around before throwing him at Goketsu. Both monsters are surprised, but they both quickly recollect themselves and Garo extends one of his legs at Goketsu, aiming to land a devastating kick on him. Meanwhile, the giant shoots a fist out of the young man, hoping to crush his bones once again. The two warriors clash in the air, and after a few intense seconds of struggling, due to Garo not having any ground to stand on and Goketsu having firm footing, the giant is able to swat the hero hunter away. Because of this struggle, Bang is able to land back down on the ground and rush at Goketsu before he even knows it. The old master drives a strong kick into the monster's foot and is able to crack one of the giant's bones. Goketsu grunts in pain, but such meager damage will not hinder him. He shoots a hand out to squash Bang, but the master is quick on his feet and jumps back in time to avoid it. However, what he is not able to avoid is a surprise punch from Garo right into his back. The old martial artist spits up blood as he's sent flying into the ground. Just barely, he's able to tense up his muscles to the point that the impact with the ground does not shake his internals at all. For now, his lungs are safe. But how long Bang will be able to go before he has to take a deeper breath is anyone's guess. Hey, what's all the noise about? A familiar voice comes from behind some trees. Bang, Goketsu and Garo all look over in that direction. For a few moments, nothing happens. But then, Goketsu sees something unexpected. From behind the trees emerges a giant six-eyed hound, with a figure in yellow riding on top of it. A uh, overgrown rover? What are you doing here? Are you talking to the dog? Shouldn't you address the owner instead? Saitama jumps off of the monster hound and lands on the ground with a slight thud. Saitama! What are you doing here? Why does everybody keep asking that? And what is up with people today in general? First Boros comes to the lab without his disguise and tells me to watch over Rover. Seriously, he thinks he's the boss of me or something. Ordering me around like that? Next time I see him, I'll punch him. 
Anyway, after that I got bored, so I went to walk Rover around my favorite forest and boom, you're all here tearing it up. What's wrong with you people? Uh, apologies. We were just tracking the Hero Hunter and then ended up running into some monsters. Would you mind helping us out? If it means you'll stop tearing apart my forest, then sure. Who do I have to beat up? Say to my ass as he does some stretches. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a figure rushes at him with great speed. Saitama! Sonic sprints at his target with bloodshot eyes. I finally found you! I've grown far stronger than I was the last time. Through intense training and monsterization, I've risen above the ceiling of humanity. And now, I'll show you all I've got! Prepare to die by my hand! Sonic is interrupted when Saitama quickly leans back with his arms extended and accidentally smacks Sonic away while performing his stretches. Sorry, what was that? I didn't quite hear you. Screaming in pain, the ninja flies at massively faster than light speeds right at Goro. Before the martial artist has time to react, Sonic crashes into him and both men are sent flying so fast that they disappear into the horizon in under a second. Bang and Goketsu's eyes bulge out of their sockets. G Garo! Alright, done with the stretches. So, who do I got a punch all, dude? Flabbergasted, Bang and Goketsu stare at the horizon in shock before turning to Saitama. Who are you? I'm the professional hero, Saitama. And you look like a bad guy. The baldy takes a step toward Goketsu. Shaken by what he just witnessed, the giant takes a step back. At that moment, Saitama hears the sound of a stream behind him and turns around, only to see Rover peeing on a tree. Hey! No peeing in the park! Saitama yells at the dog monster and starts running toward him. Rover, thinking his master's friend wants to play chase, runs off in the opposite direction. Hey! Come back! And just like they appeared, Saitama and Rover vanish back into the forest, leaving Bang and Goketsu confused like never before. Meanwhile, Hellfire and Gale wonder where Sonic ran off to. He said he'd seen something and then just dipped. What in the world? Why did he just abandon them? In any case, the two ninjas don't have time to think about that, as Bomb is now going on the offensive. With the battle having turned into a 2v1, it's a lot easier for the martial artist to make progress. Slowly but surely, he is driving Hellfire and Gale into a corner. The two of them realize things aren't going well for them. With their weapons gone, they can only rely on close quarters combat. And with that being bomb specialty, that's less than ideal. After a few minutes of intense battle, Hellfire and Gale manage to regroup with one another for a few seconds. Hey, things are looking bad. What do we do? Retreat? Keep fighting. As long as that old man is still standing, he won't let us get away. We need to tire him out and then make a run for it. Easier said than done. Hellfire responds before taking a stance. A few dozen meters in front of them, Bang takes a few deep sighs. If you think it'll be that easy, then I've got some bad news for you. He takes a fighting stance of his own, and the three combatants jump into action. Hellfire and Gale rush at the old martial artist with everything they have, putting their lives on the line. Punches, kicks, claw slashes. Bomb is able to track their movements and fluidly block, parry and counter each one of their attacks without much trouble. But with the two of them going at absolute top speed, the old martial artist is beginning to feel the pressure. Nearby, Nichiren and Haragiri cross blades. Why? Why would you abandon your comrades and your own humanity? Is your lust for power really that great? Because as a human, I wasn't good enough. No matter how much I tried, no matter how many hours I put into honing my mind and body, I could never catch up to you or Kamikaze. I pushed myself to my limit and beyond day in and day out, but the gap between our natural talents was simply too much to overcome with mere training. All my blood, sweat and tears, 
All of my years of dedication and suffering. Tearing myself apart in brutal training. All of it was for nothing. So I abandoned it all. To hell with your talent. To hell with my useless efforts. By giving up my humanity as a monster, I was able to reach you. No, I was able to surpass you. Haragiri screams as he blows Nichiren away. The old swordsman crashes into some rubble. Haragiri stands tall before him, with a sword raised, ready to slice his former friend down. Nichiren raises his head to face the monster his friend has become. And yet, you fail to realize what it is that made me and Kamikaze stronger than you in the first place. Huh. <laughs> Explain. Maybe our natural talents had something to do with it. Maybe not. But I know damned well that that wasn't the main reason for our success. I had people around me. Strong, trustworthy people. My master. Two of our friends who you took down today. And many others. I only grew strong because I had them to help me do so. We sparred. We talked. We helped each other up in times of need. A single person can achieve great things. But those things will never measure up to the heights a strong group of people can reach. That's why when Kamikaze came around, I trained him alongside various other masters and students. He had natural talent, of course. But he was also dedicated, strong-willed. And most of all, he had other people to help him rise. The two of us constantly trained together, along with other members of the Council. Meanwhile, you were working in isolation. That's why you were always the weakest among us. We tried to get you to see it, to join us, but you didn't listen. You only have yourself to blame for your weakness. Haragiri's body starts trembling with fury. So you're saying teamwork and friendship and hard work is the key? Is that it? Are you serious? Don't give me that crap. He murmurs before swinging his blade at Nichiren's neck with the intent to decapitate him. To his surprise, at the last second, the old man manages to raise his sword and block the incoming attack before quickly jumping away and landing back on his feet. Feel free to disagree. I do not care any longer. You are a monster now. And you must be stopped! Right here! Right now! I shall cut you down with my own blade! Nichiren shouts before lunging at his former friend and slashing at his waist. Haragiri swiftly blocks the attack and answers in kind. The two swordsmen clash with all their might. Surprisingly, they seem to be around even, despite Haragiri's monsterization. Nichiren and Haragiri dash around the battlefield, exchanging hundreds of slashes with each other. Swing, block, parry, swing, thrust, parry, swing. The two of them go through hundreds of different moves and combinations as they try to skewer each other with everything they have. Putting all their immense skill gained through decades of intense training on display. At the same time, Bang and Goketsu resume their battle and soon, a giant barrage of blows from Goketsu sends huge chunks of rubble flying into the sky once again, forcing the two swordsmen to abandon the ground and continue their battle in the air among the boulders. The same happens with Bomb and the ninja duo, who jump from rock to rock to keep themselves afloat. Due to the unstable battlefield, Bomb is able to separate Gale from Hellfire and kick him away toward the cracked surface of the earth beneath them, leaving him in a one-on-one -on -one against the flame ninja. The worst possible scenario for the latter. Hellfire does his best to defend himself, but it's no use. Against Bomb's martial arts, and with one of his arms already injured, Hellfire Flame doesn't stand a chance, and soon he is blown into pieces. At the same time, Nichiren and Haragiri battle in the sky, jumping from rubble to rubble, clashing in midair with their blades, slicing huge chunks of rock just so they can reach their opponent easier. At one point, Haragiri manages to knock Nichiren's sword out of his hand, and goes in for the kill, 
only for the old master to unexpectedly kick him in the stomach and launch him away before going back to pick up his weapon. Moments later, the rubble crashes down on the ground and the battle resumes among the debris. Both swordsmen yell out as they rush at each other at top speed, with the tips of their blades aimed at each other's hearts. Neither one stops, neither one tries to dodge. This will be the final clash between longtime friends. One last lethal clash. Haragiri and Nichiren both pierce each other's hearts and lean against each other, shoulder to shoulder, coughing up blood. However, even in this predicament, the monster swordsman smirks. <laughs> you fool. An injury like this is fatal to you, but to me, it is merely a flesh wound. I am a monster, remember? I'll heal quickly. Which is why I'm not done yet! Nichiren declares before suddenly gripping his sword tightly with both arms and driving upward. Haragiri screams out in pain as he's sliced in half from the heart up. His head is split into two, and his body drops limply to the ground. Nichiren takes a few deep breaths before collapsing next to his former friend. He grips his heart as he feels the warm embrace of death drawing ever closer. However, the swordsman refuses to die. Not yet. There is still something he must do. He tries to stand up, but the pain in his chest is too great and he falls back down, coughing up more blood. But, as luck would have it, Fate seems to smile upon the dying old man, as Baum soon comes rushing to his side. He crouches down next to the swordsman. Nichiren, what happened? How hurt are you? I'm fine, but I don't have long to live. What happened to your opponents? One ran off in the middle of the battle. I killed the second one, but the third used the time I spent on killing his comrade to run away. We should be safe for now, though. I see. Then please, get me to Atomic Samurai. I have something to give him before I go. It's important. Very well. Bomb sighs before scooping the old man up in his arms and heading off to search for Atomic. While they search, Atomic Samurai is fighting for his life against the unorthodox fighting style of his opponent. Phoenix Man continues using his flight advantage to attack the swordsman in all sorts of ways never before encountered by him. Attacks not just from four sides, but from above too. And the bird monster can move freely through the air however he wants, whenever he wants, wherever he wants. He doesn't need to touch down on the ground at all. This makes him hard to predict. Phoenix Man is undeniably dictating the flow of the battle and all Atomic can do is keep defending. He does try attacking on occasion, but that usually ends up with him getting slashed. By now, there are nearly 20 different cuts all over his body. Arms, legs, sides, back, even a couple on his head. Still, the battle has been going on for quite some time and Phoenix Man has performed nearly 200 charges at this point. The fact that only a tenth of them slip through shows how incredible Atomic Samurai's skill really is. He's up against an entirely new fighting style he's never encountered before, and yet he's still able to combat it, albeit barely. By now, the swordsman is starting to reach his limit. With all those cuts, including the one deep one in the side, he's losing too much blood. It is only a matter of time until he cannot go on any longer. And Phoenix Man knows this. You know, it's been fun. I enjoyed our little scuffle. But you must face it. You're simply wasting time. There's no way for you to beat me. You'll collapse at any moment now. Please. Just die already, so I can go help out my companion. You mean the Hero Hunter? How'd you become pals in the first place? Atomic Samurai grunts. 
<laughs> oh no, no, no. I'm not falling for that one. You will not get me to waste time by monologuing. Well, it was worth a try at least. Kamikaze chuckles to himself. However, despite this facade, the swordsman can feel that what the monster said before is true. He is going to die if things go on like this. And the worst thing is, there is really nothing he can do about it. Still, the swordsmaster will not give up. He'll keep fighting to the bitter end and buy his comrades as much time as possible. On that note, Phoenix Man lunges at him once again. Thanks for the fun, but I'm done with you. The bird monster shouts and prepares to skewer his enemy. Right as he's about to reach Atomic, a figure sprints out of the woods. Before Phoenix Man can change his trajectory, the figure reaches him and kicks him away. Atomic Samurai sighs in relief as he sees Bomb land next to him. That relief is soon replaced by confusion, and then concern as he sees Nichiren in Bomb's arms. Before he can ask what happened, the old martial artist lays the swordsman down on the ground next to Atomic and turns to face Phoenix Man. I'll buy you some time. Bomb states before lunging at the creature. Kamikaze nods before turning to his master. Master, I killed Haragiri, but at the cost of my own life. You are the last of the Council of Swordsmasters, Kamikaze. Here, take this, before it's too late. Nichiren takes out his necklace, crosses his fingers, and a portal opens up inside the necklace. From it, the old swordsman pulls out a blade. Kamikaze takes it with both hands and looks at the sword in awe. So this is it. The legendary Sunblade. A secret sword forged on a long lost continent, passed down from generation to generation within the Council of Swordsmen. Nichiren, knowing he doesn't have much time left, speaks. As your master, I have watched you grow into a fine swordsman. Please, take care of the council, and find the Moonblade, wherever it sleeps. I swear I will. Good. Give my regards to Spring Mustachio too, will you? Of course. Nichiren grips Kamikaze's hand one final time, before closing his eyes. His life fades away peacefully. Kamikaze sighs before letting go of his master and gripping the Sunblade tightly. He realizes that if he wants to win against Phoenix Man, this sword is his best option. He tries to draw the blade, but it doesn't budge. That's when Atomic remembers that the sword itself is alive, and can only be drawn by those who he deems worthy. He starts asking what kind of spirit and character the sword requires to be drawn and comes to the conclusion that he needs intense concentration. He blocks out all of his senses, imagining a still water mirror beneath his feet. The sounds of the battle between Bomb and Phoenix Man, the loud crashes coming from afar where Goketsu and Bang are fighting. All of it vanishes, and all that remains is the sword. In the face of such intense concentration, the Sunblade responds. In an instant, the atmosphere around the entire battlefield changes. The air becomes hot and dry, as if all humidity has vanished from the surrounding area. Everyone stops their battles. Bomb turns to look at Atomic Samurai, and what he sees makes his eyes widen. Standing in the middle of the battlefield, surrounded by flames, Kamikaze stands tall with a burning blade fused into his hand. Something about him has changed. Bomb can see no pupils in his eyes, only a bright, flaming light. The swordsman winds up his hand, and for some reason, Bomb's instincts start screaming for him to get away, and he doesn't object to them. The old martial artist jumps to the side, away from Phoenix Man, 
And as soon as he does, Atomic Samurai bursts forth at a ridiculous speed. Phoenix Man's eyes go wide as he just barely manages to dodge the swordsman's swing. The tip of the samurai's blade touches the ground, and in that instance, a huge chunk of earth is instantly evaporated behind Phoenix Man. The monster spreads his wings and flies into the sky, horrified. If that blade so much as touches him, it might actually end his life. Quickly, Atomic jumps after his prey, and Phoenix Man once again just barely manages to avoid a lethal blow, but the Sunblade briefly makes contact with one of his arms. Instantly, the hand bursts into flames that burn as hot as the sun itself. Phoenix Man acts quickly, and rips his own burning arm off so the fire won't spread. He watches as his appendage disappears into flames as soon as he severs it from his body. The bird monster swings his wings and flies away from the burning swordsman, but to his shock, Atomic Samurai suddenly kicks off of the air itself and lunges at him with incredible swiftness and speed. How? How is that possible? Phoenix Man screams in horror as the swordsman appears right in front of him and raises his arms. Hold on, please, we can talk this through! The monster pleads, but he can see no mercy in Kamikaze's burning eyes. Vanish into nothingness, monster. Atomic says before his blade bursts into flames so intense that the surrounding trees catch on fire. In Inferno Slash! Kamikaze brings the sun blade down on Phoenix Man, slicing him clean in half and making his body burst into flames. Unable to say another word, the two halves of the monster fall to the ground and burn into ashes within seconds. Atomic Samurai lands on his feet and sheathes his sword. As soon as he does, the man collapses from fatigue. He coughs up a bit of blood, but thankfully, Bomb rushes to his side and holds him up. He quickly pulls out some bandages from his back pocket and starts patching the hero up. Where did you get those? In battle, you never know when you'll need to help out a friend. More importantly, if we act quickly, you will live. Forget about me. I can wrap those bandages myself. Based on the noise, Silverfang is still fighting. Go help him finish his battle. Alright, thank you. Bomb stands up. He looks over at where Phoenix Man fell one last time. There, he sees nothing but a pile of ashes, burning ever so slightly. If the monster is able to come back from this, then there is truly no force in the world that can put him down. Though there don't seem to be any signs of resurrection going on. Maybe the old master is just being paranoid. Or maybe... For the briefest of moments, the flame becomes brighter and more intense before dying back down. For that brief moment, Bomb's heart nearly jumped out of his chest. He's still worried about a possible resurrection. Hey, maybe you should come along, just in case. Bomb says while staring at the ashes. Atomic Samurai follows the direction of his gaze and realizes what the old martial artist is worried about. Fine. I don't want to be near that pile of ash anyway. Stinks like burnt chicken. Kamikaze stands up, and with help from Bomb, the two of them quickly wrap some bandages around his most dangerous wounds and rush to Bang's side, who is currently engaged in a fierce battle against Goketsu. Silver Fang realizes that the sounds of battle around them have stopped, which means the other fights are over. He prays that it's his teammates that ended up victorious. If that is the case, and if they're in good enough shape to fight, they should be here any minute. If he can hold out just a bit more without having to utilize the awakening breath, then all will be well. But if not, the old master's thought process is interrupted when Goketsu nearly lands a kick on his body. What's the matter? Are you running out of gas, old man? Goketsu taunts, but in reality, he has also noticed the absence of other sounds of battle. 
which means his teammates either won and are coming to help him, won and are too exhausted to help him, or they could have been defeated. If they were in good enough shape to help him, they would have likely already arrived. A couple of minutes have already passed since all the noises stopped. They should be here by now if they were in fighting shape, which means they likely won't be coming at all. But the same applies to the opposing side. They should be here by now too, but they're not. Maybe they're patching up wounds or something. In any case, Goketsu knows his team was outnumbered from the start. Who knows what actually happened. The monster begins thinking of ways to get out of here unscathed. With the condition Silverfang is in, it's likely that if Goketsu simply started running, he could get away. But then again, Bang is injured. This is his best chance to kill the old man. However, somehow, that doesn't sit right with the monster martial artist. The injury Bang sustained was inflicted by a surprise attack from Garo, not himself. As a martial artist, Goketsu still retains some honor and a sense of pride. Pride which would not be satisfied if he won now. And so, the monster makes his choice. He suddenly stops fighting and puts some distance between Bang and himself. I have to admit, this was a fun battle, Silverfang. But to beat you in your current condition would not be satisfactory for me. Not like this. Heal your wounds and train some more. We will meet again someday to finish our fight. The monster turns around. His words confuse Bang greatly. Are you serious? After all that? I am. The monster says, but before he can jump away, two figures emerge from the forest. Bomb and a rather beat up atomic samurai. Bang lets out a sigh of relief. His friends made it. Goketsu on the other hand simply grunts. That was a very touching speech and all, but we can't really let you get away, creature. Atomic Samurai raises his regular sword, with the sunblade sheathed on his hip. He tries to look more lively and confident than he really is. In truth, he will not be of much use in this fight, not in the shape he's in. Bang is tired out as well. The only real heavy hitter left is Bomb, and he's also quite exhausted. On second thought, maybe it would have been best to let the monster go for now and regroup. The hero's fatigue does not go unnoticed by Goketsu either. You seem to be rather tired to be spouting such words. He takes a fighting stance, and Bomb does the same. Are you good to fight, little brother? Barely, but I can lend some backup. Very well. Further away, where Phoenix Man fell, the tiny flame burning on his ashes suddenly expands. Within the span of a single second, a huge fire erupts from the tiny flame and engulfs a huge part of the forest. Over where Bang and Goketsu are, everyone feels a wave of heat echo throughout the battlefield, and all their skin suddenly receive light first degree burns. Everyone grunts in pain. Out of the ashes where Phoenix Man once burned, an enormous tornado of scorching hot flames erupts into the air. The cloudless sky is suddenly covered by dark clouds, which block out the sun, leaving the gigantic tornado as the only light source for miles upon miles. In the epicenter of the blazing hurricane, a figure rises from the ashes and ascends into the sky. Everyone covers their eyes to avoid being blinded by the immense light given off by the phenomenon. From within the tornado of flames, the figure rises above the clouds and the tornado explodes into a huge inferno, instantly disintegrating the entire forest. All the corpses on the battlefield are incinerated. Bang, Bomb, Atomic, and Goketsu are just barely able to avoid catching on fire by lifting chunks of earth before themselves to block the wave of flame and heat. 
The huge fire continues for a few more moments before quickly dying down. From above the clouds, a burning silhouette descends to the land like a god from the heavens, surrounded by trails of fire. Everyone watches on in shock and horror as the figure lands on the ground and the earth beneath it starts to melt. Suddenly, the flame covering the creature's body dies down, revealing the body underneath. Gone is the golden skin of Brilliant Eagle, replaced by scorching hot, crimson red feathers that span the monster's entire body. His wings are now accented by fire coming off of the tips of their feathers. The bird monster's arms are now more muscular and covered in feathers like the rest of its new body. Phoenix Man's beak has been fused into his lower jaw, and the monster's humanoid face has been replaced by a black void, with piercing, burning eyes at the front. Brilliant Eagle Phoenix Man is no more. Now, there is only... Saitama looks back at the forest he exited a few minutes ago, only to see a ginormous fire tornado rampaging across it, blowing and burning away entire chunks of the terrain. And now the weather has gone well too? They didn't predict this in the forecast. What's going on today? The baldy says in an exasperated tone and prepares to head toward the tornado, but just before he can do that, a scream from the other end of the street catches his attention. They're coming from where Rover is sitting. A few people seem to have noticed the giant monster hound and started screaming for dear life. Hey, guys, it's fine. The dog's friendly. Saitama says before a figure flies past him and crashes into the creature. The figure swiftly bounces off the monster hound's nose and lands on all fours. It's Watchdog Man. Saitama has just brought a monster into City Q. Rover shakes his head, a little confused. I don't know what you are, but you're pretty strong if you survive that last attack without a scratch. I won't go easy on you. The hero mutters before attacking Rover again. The monster hound, viewing this as a game, starts running around the street and playing with Watchdog Man. Aw, oh, great. Now I'm watching a dog fight. Saitama turns to look at the forest again, and again the tornado is nowhere to be seen. The weather seems to be back to normal, apart from the cloudy sky. The hero then notices a sale sign on a nearby shop and shrugs. If it stopped, it stopped. Maybe someone got to it before he could. Bang, Goketsu, Bomb and Atomic Samurai all stare at the new incarnation of Phoenix Man. A crimson red abomination, burning so hot that everything it comes into contact with melts. Phoenix Man himself can't believe how much power he has now gained. He looks down at his hands before clenching one of them into a fist and turning away from the group of heroes and monster before him. He turns around and finds a nearby tree stump, which was sturdy enough to not be completely blown away by the monster's entrance after his resurrection. Phoenix Man raises a hand, before punching the air in the tree's direction. In an instant, the stump, along with a huge chunk of earth in its direction, vanish, and a huge shockwave of hot air hits the group nearby. Bang looks at the damage caused by that single punch. Several kilometers of earth, erased in an instant. It's astonishing. And frightening. If that punch had been aimed at them, they would have died instantly. The old martial artist sneakily moves one of his hands behind his back, into his back pocket, where he presses a button on a transmitter employed by the Hero Association. The button he presses is a signal for help. He just hopes someone powerful enough gets here in time, and that no low-ranking heroes show up. If they did, they would just add to the number of casualties. This monster is unlike anything the heroes have encountered thus far. The speed with which it threw that punch, 
the power of it, the heat emanating from its body. Very few, if any, heroes could hope to get close to it without burning up. Elsewhere, Boros and Tatsumaki have just finished their talk and prepare to go to the Hero HQ, but Tatsumaki's S-Class Hero communication device suddenly lets out a signal. A call for help. Tatsumaki looks at the device and her eyes widen slightly. It's coming from Bang. But he's with Atomic Samurai, isn't he? What could possibly threaten that duo to the point that they're asking for backup? Only one way to find out. Boro says as he stretches his arms and back. I suppose so. Let's go. Meanwhile, Phoenix Man stares at the damage his punch caused in astonishment, before a spark of excitement crosses his eyes. This body... It is unbelievable. How did I evolve so much with only a single resurrection? I feel completely unstoppable now. <laughs> I don't know why exactly this happened. Maybe it was because of how much damage I received. For a moment, I actually feared I was going to die. In any case, Atomic Samurai, thank you for this power. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I gained it because of you. You granted me the strength I need to finally take down the Hero Association in its entirety. As thanks for that... Phoenix Man suddenly vanishes from everybody's sight and appears a few dozen meters behind them, as close as he can get without burning them alive. I shall let you make a choice. Everyone's eyes widen as they realize where he is. This creature is so fast it's scary. None of them could follow its moves at all. The Firestorm monster allows that realization to sink into their minds. His message is clear. Any attempt to escape would be futile. The choice goes as follows. You serve under me as I create an organization to take over the world, or you die. If you choose to die, well, you die. If you choose to serve me, I will make you executives in my organization, and I shall grant you a means to become monsters like me. With me as the leader, we shall recruit more heroes and monsters and eventually create a great organization to rule over the world and bring upon a heaven on earth the likes of which has never been seen before. Phoenix Man finishes his speech, but to his surprise, the heroes present don't look amused. Nor are they clapping. They don't seem like they'll be willing to accept the deal. Even Goketsu looks at the bird monster a bit weirdly. Ugh, fine. These people aren't worth it anyway. He'll just kill them and move on. Phoenix Man raises an arm and winds up a punch intending to blow all four of them into oblivion. All right, be that way. I hope you can ponder over your choices in the afterlife. Just then, someone comes flying at the battlefield from the sky. A large figure crashes in between the heroes and Phoenix Man. For a moment, Bang thinks it was someone like Darkshine or Tank Top Master. But as the dust settles, he sees that the newcomer has blue, shell-like skin and bright spiky hair. For a moment, he thinks that this might be the new guy who joined the S-Class recently. But upon further inspection, though there is a lot of resemblance, this is clearly a monster. Not good. They're already in enough trouble as it is with the Phoenix creature. They don't need any more threats showing up. The blue-skinned monster stands up slowly and looks around. He takes the situation in before his single eye settles on Phoenix Man. I take it he is the reason you sent out a distress call, Silver Fang? The monster asks while examining the fiery creature standing before him. Bang furrows his eyebrows. How do you know about the signal? You'd need to have a Hero Association communicator for that. 
the old man says before he hears a voice behind him. Hey, why did you just leave me on the cliffside? I thought we were going together. The second ranked S-Class hero flies past Bang's group and floats right in front of Boros with an angry expression on her face. You're the one who refused to let me carry you as I jumped from the canyon because, and I quote, it would be embarrassing. You're at fault here, not me. Can you imagine how humiliating that would have been for me? Being carried here like some damsel? No thank you. Boros rolls his eye. What was I supposed to do? Slow down when there are heroes who are possibly about to die? Tatsumaki opens her mouth to speak, but she can't find any rebuttal. Fine. It doesn't seem like I missed anything anyway. The Esper says before Bang calls out to her. Terrible tornado! You know this monster? Tatsumaki peers over Boros' shoulder and looks at the old man. He looks exhausted and banged up. I do. The two of us will handle things here. You three scram and get yourselves to a hospital or something. The Esper says before turning to look at Goketsu, who's standing by and simply waiting to see what'll happen next. By now, the monster has recognized Boros as the alien who killed Orochi and wiped out the Monster Association all on his own. And for some reason, he's with the second ranked hero? Things are not looking good for Goketsu. Right now, there are three creatures before him who could end him in an instant. The giant's life is in very serious danger. He's feeling cautious to say the least. What's the deal with this guy? Tatsumaki asks Bang's group while looking at Goketsu. He's a dragon level monster. On the stronger end too. Be cautious with him. Are you forgetting who I am? A mere dragon level threat won't even scratch me. Watch. She declares confidently and raises a finger before pointing it at a Goketsu. Hold on. Boros places a hand on her arm and lowers it back to her side. I want to keep that thing alive for a bit. I recognize him. He was with that monster association I told you about. A few of their members had some information I want. He might be one of them. Tatsumaki raises an eyebrow. What are you talking about? I'll explain later in more detail, but for now, just know that there is an entity which calls itself God. The leader of the Monster Association had something to do with it, and one of the Association's executives also had some knowledge of it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take either one of them alive. I'm hoping this guy might know something. Tatsumaki looks at Boros, understandably confused, to which the alien sighs. Look, I told you, I'll explain later. Please just keep him alive for now. He asks Tatsumaki, and after a moment of thought, she nods. Okay, and since you only need him to remain alive long enough to talk, it's alright if I mangle his limb so he can't get away, right? The green-haired Esperas, and before Boros can respond, she raises one of her fingers and twirls it in the air. At that moment, Goketsu's arms and legs twist in an unnatural way and are completely broken. The giant groans in pain and collapses to the ground, unable to make a move. That's fine with me. Boros says before turning to Bang, Bomb, and Atomic, who are still standing nearby. Didn't you hear what Tornado said? Go get your wounds treated. The three men look at the situation. Tatsumaki clearly has trust for this monster, and she was easily able to mangle Goketsu, so things seem to be under control now. They should be good to leave. There's just one thing they need to warn the duo about. Atomic Samurai raises his head to meet Boros' gaze. Be careful with that fire monster. His ability allows him to come back to life from the brink of death stronger than before. His appearance changes and his power grows wildly. We sliced him into pieces and he came back. I burned him into ash and he still came back. You need to somehow find a way to deal with him without killing him. Boris's eye widens slightly. 
the ability to overcome death and gain power from mortal injuries. This could be interesting. Meanwhile, Phoenix Men has been observing the two newcomers ever since their arrival. The first opponent he notes is, of course, Tatsumaki, the number two hero, one of the biggest obstacles to his plans. Though, with this newfound power of his, the Flay Monster is relatively confident in his ability to take her down. Now, the other opponent he has to face is a bit more worrisome. Phoenix Man immediately recognizes him as the alien who destroyed the Monster Association and flipped a continent. He was nearby during the battle, after all. This guy is clearly dangerous. Are you done bickering amongst each other? I'm getting bored here. The Flay Monster's voice catches everyone's attention. Boros turns to the three injured men behind his back. Thanks for the info. Now go already. They nod and start walking away. At the same time, Tatsumaki floats a few meters closer to Phoenix Man. Hey, Boros. You got all the fun with that water monster, so this fire creature is mine, got it? Sure. Just don't die. I can sense that he's quite powerful. Boros answers. He's not too concerned with not going first here. If Tatsumaki beats this monster, it means he wouldn't have been a worthy opponent for him anyway. In response to this, Tatsumaki smirks and raises her hands. I'm well aware. You're not the only one who can sense energy here. Shield, no! Boro shouts to the Esper, confusing her for a moment before she sees Phoenix Man's fist appear mere inches away from her face. In a fraction of a millisecond, the monster closed the distance between them and is aiming to take her head off right off the bat. Boros prepares to jump to Tatsumaki's rescue, but at the last possible moment, the Esper manages to manifest a shield of energy. The flame creature's punch collides with the green bubble around Tatsumaki and sends it flying. The Esper groans in pain as her body is rocked inside her shield. Before she can stop her momentum, Phoenix Man appears behind her and kicks the bubble instantly making it switch direction and fly the other way. Tatsumaki is forced to pour a lot of power into her defense as Phoenix Man catches up and punches the bubble once again. He starts flying around the battlefield at insane speeds, bouncing Tatsumaki's bubble around. With each blow, the Esper feels her shield getting chipped away. On top of that, with each change in direction, her body crashes into the inside of her shield. Within just a single second, Phoenix Man performs over a thousand punches and kicks on the energy ball and leaves Tatsumaki badly bruised and beaten. However, the Esper is not one to go down without a fight. She screams out and a massive shockwave of psychic energy bursts out from her shield, knocking Phoenix Man away for a moment. Who do you think you are? She shouts before suddenly feeling her shield crack. Within the next instant, the flame monster's hand breaches her energy sphere and his fingers start reaching for the Esper's face. Tatsumaki looks on, awestricken for just a fraction of a fraction of a second before unleashing another powerful energy wave and forcing the monster back. Without saying another word, the Esper extends a hand toward Phoenix Man and clenches it tightly, attempting to crush him with a psychic attack. To her shock and horror, the flame creature notices this action and moves out of the way of the energy before it can even manifest. Previously, Tatsumaki considered this to be an unblockable attack. After all, when her fist is fully clenched, the energy appears in nearly an instant. For it to be dodged so casually, just how fast is this monster? Before she can think any more, Phoenix Man pulls one of his arms back and his hand catches on fire. He then quickly punches the air and sends a ball of flame hurling at the number two hero, who barely has enough time to put up another shield to block it. However, once the attack collides with it, the psychic barrier shatters into pieces. Thankfully, it was at least strong enough to scatter the flame so it doesn't burn Tatsumaki to a crisp. In the briefest of moments after the Esper's defense is neutralized, Phoenix Man appears above her and winds up a kick. Once again, the hero just barely manages to put up a shield, but the monster's leg is strong, and he blows the barrier to pieces easily. 
The shockwave from the attack sends Tatsumaki flying into the ground. She crashes with enough force to knock the air out of her lungs. Phoenix Man looks down on his opponent from above. I knew I was strong, but to be able to defeat you of all people... I really didn't thank Atomic Samurai enough for forcing me to evolve like this. But alas, playtime is over. Now you die. The flame monster says before lunging at Tatsumaki, who is still lying on the ground, completely stunned, unable to do anything to stop her incoming demise. For a brief instant, her life starts flashing before her eyes. That is until a hand suddenly grabs Phoenix Man's wrist. That's enough. Boros declares as he grips Phoenix Man's wrist tightly and throws him away from the downed hero. The bird monster lands on the ground a few dozen meters away. Meanwhile, Boros turns to Tatsumaki. He's clearly too strong for you. I'll take it from here. The alien says with a smirk on his face. This thing... It might actually provide him with a relatively fun battle. Tatsumaki coughs up a little blood as she tries to recover from the beating she's received. Be careful. This is not threat level dragon at all. This is something far, far greater than that. He's far stronger than that water monster too. Do not let it grow in strength, no matter what. She warns the alien who simply gives her a thumbs up before turning to Phoenix Man. Not bad, Bird Boy. Tornado over here is one of the strongest people on the planet as far as I can tell. And you didn't even break a sweat with her. You're pretty strong. Just pretty strong, huh? I know you wiped out the Monster Association, but man, at least show a little concern. And why would I do that? You are no threat to me. Phoenix Man growls a little, but before he can respond, Boro starts talking again. Wait a second. How do you know I wiped out the Monster Association? I don't remember sharing that information with any monster. Because I was there. You wouldn't remember me, of course. I looked completely different back then. But we did meet each other eye to eye for a moment before your attention was directed at another monster. Some shiny creature with a tentacle on his head. Really? Wait, don't tell me! You were that silly looking bird that tried to sneak away without me noticing, weren't you? Phoenix Man clenches his fists and a vein appears underneath the feathers of his forehead. That's it! I will not stand for these insults any longer! The flame monster lunges at Boros and slashes at his face with his large claws. He gashes Boros across the eye and the force of the impact makes the alien lean back and turn away. No! Tatsumaki screams in horror as a gleeful spark appears in Phoenix Man's eyes. Let's see how you fight without your sight, Cyclops. The monster says smugly before his expression shifts into one of surprise as a few cracks appears on the claw he used to slash the alien. What? The smugness leaves Phoenix Man's voice as his fingers shatter into a dozen pieces. At the same time, Boro slowly turns his face back at his opponent. And there's not a scratch on him. The alien smirks. It is at that moment Phoenix Man first realizes that this is not going to be easy. My turn. The alien utters and before the fly monster can even react, he drives a fist into Phoenix Man's chest, obliterating his entire ribcage and launching the creature away. The bird monster flies dozens of kilometers, smashing into trees, rocks, cliffs and hillsides while screaming in pain. Soon, he crashes into a huge mountain hard enough to blow the entire thing into the air. This finally provides enough of a break to stop Phoenix Man's momentum, and the mountain soon falls on top of him, trapping the monster underneath thousands of tons of rubble. 
Tatsumaki looks on, completely awestruck, and as Boro simply tells her to stay back and jumps after his opponent. The alien lands a few meters away from the mountain of rubble, and soon enough, notices that the rocks on top of the flame monster are melting. The entire mountain turns into magma, which soon evaporates, leaving Phoenix Man's body exposed. Boros makes a mental note. This creature is so unfathomably hot that just by existing he tarnishes the terrain around him. He definitely cannot be allowed to stay on Earth for long. Of course, to Boros, who survived in the hellish environment of his home planet, this is the equivalent of a match burning. Meanwhile, Phoenix Man struggles to breathe. His entire midsection has been annihilated. Bones, lungs, the heart, it's all gone. A mortal injury. The flame monster's body twitches a few times before regenerating the lost organs and standing back up, good as new. His opponent is strong, but now Phoenix Man feels new strength flooding his muscles. Now he can... A punch suddenly lands on the monster's face, breaking his skull into pieces and sending him flying again. Phoenix Man is launched thousands of meters, crashes through a few more mountains and lands in a canyon far away from any civilization. He groans in agony, but his resurrection soon kicks in and his face goes back to normal. Once again, the monster can feel himself growing stronger. If this continues, he should catch up to his opponent soon, although it hurts like hell every time he dies. Phoenix Man sits up and looks at the sky above the canyon. Soon, he notices a figure rocketing at him from above and is able to jump out of the way just in time before Boros lands on the ground where Phoenix Man was mere moments ago. The landing seems more like a meteor impact as the force of it rips the ground and walls of the canyon to shreds. Phoenix Man looks on in disbelief. What are you? How is a creature as freakishly strong as you allowed to roam free on this earth? Me? I'm the dominator of the universe, and at the moment, you are my entertainment. Phoenix Man trembles in fury. How dare- A knee to the chin shatters his lower jaw before he can even finish his sentence. Less talking, more fighting. Boro smirks before leaning back and winding up another punch while Phoenix Man staggers backwards and clenches his broken jaw before noticing that incoming punch. He raises both his arms to block it, but the alien's fist plows straight through his hands, breaking through his guard and crashing into his face, mutilating it even more. The force of the impact throws Phoenix Man out of the canyon and into a ravine. Soon, Boros lands next to him and gives Phoenix Man some time to resurrect, before grabbing his face and dragging it across the wall of the ravine in brutal fashion. Once the alien has had enough of dragging Phoenix Man around, Boros puffs out his chest and shoots an energy blast at him, blowing apart the entire ravine and sending the monster into the sky. After flying for a few seconds, the flame creature crash lands in a desert. Once again, Boros catches up to him moments later, giving him just enough time to resurrect and heal his wounds. You're making this too easy. How many more times do I have to kill you for you to reach my level? Shut up! Phoenix Man shouts and charges at Boros, going on the offensive for the first time since the start of the battle, much to the alien's amusement. The flame monster rockets at Boros and winds up a wide kick. I'll make you pay for your insults! Phoenix Man slams his foot into Boros' face, hoping to crack his skull as revenge for all the times Boros did it to him. However, the monster overestimated his current abilities, as his kick collides with the alien's face and doesn't even make him flinch. You've certainly got the right attitude, but there's still a ways to go before you can make threats like these to me. Boros quickly rockets his foot at Phoenix Man's face with a roundhouse kick, and before the monster can even think of trying to block or dodge, his head is blown into pieces. His body falls to the ground, and Boros patiently awaits for him to resurrect. It doesn't take long for the monster's head to regrow, and for him to look up at Boros with deep hatred in his eyes. What are you trying to do? 
You know killing me is pointless. We'll just go on like this until I reach your level and then surpass you. That's the idea. The alien smirks and kicks Phoenix Man yet again, launching him into the air. The bird monster flies a few hundred meters before spreading his wings and stopping his momentum. Boros looks up at him with a smile on his face. Nice! You survived an attack! He laughs and lunges after the flame monster, who raises his hands and prepares to fight. You're a fool! Phoenix Man utters before the alien reaches him and winds up a fist. This time, the flame monster finds himself able to track Boros's movements and quickly flaps his wings to push himself out of harm's way, dodging the alien's punch. I can see through your moves now, moron! Phoenix Man declares triumphantly as he counterattacks Boros by punching him in the cheek. But despite the monster's confidence, the bones in his own fist crack from the impact with the alien's skin as Boros seems completely unfazed. You think I'm trying here? This is nothing but a warm-up! The alien declares and sends a punch at Phoenix Man twice as fast as any of his previous attacks were, leaving the monster no time to react at all. Boros's fist collides with Phoenix Man's face and sends him flying. The force of the blow is so great that the bird monster visibly sees the sky around him becoming darker and darker as he flies through time zones and crashes thousands of kilometers away from where he was previously. Now he finds himself in a distant tundra. Before he can even get up, he feels Boros's feet smash into his stomach and obliterate some of his organs in his spine. The battle continues with Boros enjoying himself as he breaks Phoenix Man down, killing him over and over again in increasingly brutal ways to trigger as much growth as possible. And he does see progress in the monster. Punches that would have easily shattered bones at the start of their battle are now only doing minor damage to his opponent. How fun! However, despite this, he also notices something else. The monster's increases seem to be getting smaller as the fight goes on. Still, as the two combatants fly from city to city, time zone to time zone, climate to climate, Boros finds himself enjoying the battle very much. Eventually, the two of them end up above a populated city. Boros frowns, and Phoenix Man notices. Is something wrong? No, but let's go somewhere else. I don't want civilian casualties. This surprises Phoenix Man a bit. The alien is concerned about civilians? Interesting. So, what you're telling me is it would be pretty unfortunate for you if those people down there in the city got hurt, right? Don't even think about it. Boros warns the monster, but it's too late as Phoenix Man's fists light on fire. Don't you dare! Whoops! Phoenix Man laughs as he punches downward and the flame ball on his fist is thrown to the city below. Instantly, Boros lunges at the fire, intending to stop it from reaching the city. Good. Phoenix Man raises his claws and prepares to attack Boros when he's distracted. Unfortunately for the monster, he once again overestimated his own abilities. Boros speeds up and quickly catches the flame ball before throwing it back at Phoenix Man, who easily dodges out of the way. You think you can use my own attack to hurt me? The flame monster chuckles, but soon regrets it as Boros slams into him with a tackle. Let's take this somewhere else. The alien shouts before using his latent energy to propel himself through the air and speed up. The two monsters are engulfed in flame and energy as they rocket away from the city at massively faster than light speeds. Phoenix Man feels the air around them getting colder. Moments later, they crash land in one of the most sparsely populated places on Earth. The South Pole, Antarctica. Phoenix Man quickly throws Boros off of himself and hops back to his feet. But just as he does, Boros slams a fist into his cheek, knocks him to the ground and stands over him. That's better. Now we can fight without me having to worry about keeping everyone out of harm's way. Phoenix Man grunts in agony and anger. Boros grabs him by the head and lifts him into the air before throwing him into a glacier. 
The flame monster's body crashes into the ice and starts melting it at an astonishing rate. Before the entire mountain can be turned into water, Boros flies at Phoenix Man and drives a fist into his stomach. And then another one. He keeps punching Phoenix Man, pushing him deeper and deeper into the glacier until they reach its other side and Boros kicks Phoenix Man out of the ice. The flame monster grows in agony as he lands on the ground and his body slides a few dozen meters before coming to a halt. Boros lands a few meters away from his prey. You know, even if you're not on my level yet, this is still pretty fun. It's not every day I get a punching bag capable of repairing itself so quickly. Boros chuckles, and rage fills Phoenix Man once more. Both of his arms light up with a fire hot enough to start melting snow in a several kilometer radius. The flay monster turns to Boros and raises both of his hands into the air. He yells as he fires a massive beam of heat at his enemy. Flames as hot as the sun engulf a huge area as Phoenix Man gives all he has to scorch Boros alive. He continues firing the beam for a dozen seconds before calming down. Steam covers the battlefield. When Phoenix Man doesn't see or hear anything through the steam for a few seconds, he smirks. Go to hell, you insufferable jerk. Make me! Boros responds as a hand comes shooting out of the smoke and grabs Phoenix Man's head. The monster starts panicking and clawing at the alien's arm, but it's no use as Boros slams a fist into his stomach before letting go of his face and letting the force of the punch send Phoenix Man flying into another cliffside. Phoenix Man coughs up blood as he falls to his knees. He looks up and sees Boros slowly walking toward him in the distance. So calm, so nonchalant, it makes Phoenix Man tremble with rage. You cocky son of a... I'll blast you into pieces! Phoenix Man rages as his entire body lights on fire. His feathers heat up to a temperature they've never been at before. The glacier behind him instantly turns into steam as the aura around the flame monster intensifies. Then Phoenix Man concentrates all that heat into his palms. Let's see you survive this! Phoenix Man starts punching the air, sending blasts of fire at Boros. The flame monster grunts as he punches the air thousands of times over each punch sending a giant ball of blazing hot energy at the alien. All those blasts start colliding with Boros's body, causing massive damage to the environment and making huge parts of the polar ice cap melt. Still, through all this blasting, Boros does not even flinch and simply continues walking until he reaches Phoenix Man, who can't believe his eyes. How? How is this creature so unbelievably strong? It doesn't make sense. Phoenix Man shakes in fury and fear as he stops sending out blasts. It's simply useless. Boros looks down on his enemy. Are you done? Phoenix Man's only response is a defiant attempt to shove his claw into the eye on Boros's chest. But the alien easily catches and breaks his hand, before using his other arm to grab Phoenix Man by the waist and throw him into the air. I think it's time to end the warm-up. Boros mutters to himself as a giant wave of energy bursts out of his body. He then jumps after the flame monster and appears right above him, before punching him back down to the ground. As soon as Phoenix Man crashes into the ice, Boros appears right next to him and punches him in the face, sending him flying. While the monster is in the air, Boros lunges at him and delivers a fury of blows to him, breaking bones and obliterating organs before kicking Phoenix Man into the air once again. He jumps after his prey and punches him once again, sending him flying higher. Boros catches up to the monster again and kicks him even higher, into the stratosphere. Satisfied that he got Phoenix Man high enough, the alien appears above him and drives both his hands into his opponent's chest before letting out a surge of energy and sending him flying at the ground at groundbreaking speeds. Burrow smirks and rockets down, flying past Phoenix Man's falling body and swirling in the air a few times before flying up at Phoenix Man and slamming a devastating knee into his stomach. 
Energy swirls around the two combatants as Boros laughs in delight at finally getting to let some of his real power loose once more. Phoenix Man screams in agony as his body can't withstand the impact. His feathers are vaporized by heat so intense that even he, a flame creature, can't tolerate it. His skin and muscle fibers split apart and his spine snaps. The bird monster shrieks as his body is split in half at the waist. The two halves of his body both rocket to the ground with momentum from his previous fall and crash into the ice knocking two massive craters into Antarctica's surface. Satisfied with the results of his assault, Boros lands on the ground next to Phoenix Man's lower half and grabs one of his legs. Heal yourself. Boros says nonchalantly as he throws the monster's lower body close to his top half so he can recover easier. After a few moments of waiting, Boros notices Phoenix Man's body glowing. For a moment, the light becomes blinding and Boros has to turn away. When he turns back, he sees Phoenix Man standing in the snow, furious. You. He clenches his fists. Veins pop out underneath his feathers. His muscles tremble and his eyes radiate hostility like never before. Phoenix Man's mind flashes back to his old life. Before he became a monster, back when he was just a performer for a TV show. Even back then, all the mockery he had to go through, people making fun of his downfalls. When his show shut down, people laughed. They laughed at his misfortune. Even after he turned into a monster, he wasn't respected. Other monsters laughed. And now this, this alien, even he is mocking him. All the insults. All the mockery. This unfair strength of yours. I hate it all. Then how about you stop crying and actually do something about it? That's it. The final straw. Phoenix Man lets out a blood-curdling scream and jumps high into the air. He spreads his wings and clenches his fists tight. You! You! I will kill you! Forget creating the perfect organization! To hell with humanity and monsters! I'll destroy this entire god-forsaken planet! This gets Boros to perk up. Surely this thing doesn't actually have enough power to do something like that, right? Phoenix Man screams and a massive flame erupts from his body. The monster tenses up every muscle in his body and an orb of pure, concentrated heat begins forming around him. Quickly, it expands into a gigantic sphere of energy, which is bright enough to light up the sky in the entire southern hemisphere. Glaciers crumble and melt into water which is soon blown away from the epicenter of the heat. Boros loses his footing and is forced to emit small amounts of energy from his feet to keep himself afloat in the air. Meanwhile, Phoenix Man continues screaming as the sphere of blaze expands. Back where Tatsumaki is resting after her brief but intense battle with Phoenix Man, the ground starts trembling. She looks up to see a huge light far away in the horizon, and moments later, a huge gust of wind comes from that direction, making her shield her face. Bang! Bomb and Atomic Samurai, having just reached a hospital, feel it too. The trembling of the earth makes the buildings shake. An earthquake? That's impossible! We're nowhere near any tectonically active areas! Far away from anyone, in another dimension, the number one ranked hero is suddenly summoned by one of his comrades. Blast! Come take a look, now! Hmm? What's wrong? The Earth! It's shaking! What? You mean like an earthquake? Those are pretty common, you know. No, not like that. I mean the entire planet is shaking! What? How is that possible? I don't know, but the epicenter seems to be in Antarctica. 
Blast frowns. What in the world is going on? Boros looks on as the sphere of energy stops expanding and suddenly starts getting smaller, more concentrated. Phoenix Man condenses the giant bomb into an orb of the size of a small building. He pants as he holds it with both hands above his head. This is all of my power and fire condensed into a single attack. There is absolutely no way you can survive getting hit by it. And don't even think of dodging. If this orb collides with the planet's surface, you can say goodbye to the Earth. Boros tenses up. This creature is not bluffing. The alien can sense that the amount of power in that singular point is more than enough to obliterate the entire world. Now, let me see you block it. Phoenix Man smirks and launches the sphere at Boros. The alien stands still for a moment before a smirk appears on his face. You really outdid yourself this time. This is your full power, you say? All right then, I shall respond with mine. Boros declares before landing on the nearest glacier. A moment later, a huge burst of energy is emitted from his body. Lightning radiates all across the South Pole and beyond as Boros powers up to the limit of his release form. His hair spikes up even more than usual as he bends his knees and braces himself for a massive jump. You seriously think you can block it head on? Phoenix Man asks in disbelief and fear. Boros does not answer. He tenses up his muscles and kicks off of the ground. The ice beneath his feet crumbles from the force as the alien rockets at the blazing orb and winds up a punch. He roars as he drives his fist into the power sphere and a fierce clash between his hand and the intense power of the orb ensues. Boros grunts as he puts his all into his fist for the first time in ages and screams out before his hand breaches the surface of the sphere. Boros then sends some of his energy into the ball and ignites it, blowing Phoenix Man's attack into a billion tiny pieces. Phoenix Man can't believe his eyes. No, no! He yells, but before he can think of doing anything else, Boros rockets at him from the epicenter of the explosion and grabs his face. This is getting way too destructive. Let's take the battle out of this world. Boros says as he spins in the air to build up momentum and throws Phoenix Man into the sky. The bird monster's body is launched thousands. No, tens of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from the planet. He flies at speeds never before seen in this part of the galaxy and crashes into something hard. Phoenix Man tries to yell out in pain, but he finds himself unable to breathe. He feels so light too. Just where the hell is he? The flame monster stands up, and to his horror, he realizes where he is. On the low natural satellite of Earth, a celestial body Phoenix Man has seen so many times at night and dreamt of going to as a kid. The Moon. A figure crashes into the planetoid surface nearby, but before the dust can settle, Phoenix Man passes out from oxygen deprivation. At the same time, Boro stands up, having just jumped here himself. He looks around the barren terrain before turning his gaze at the Earth. It looks so oddly peaceful from here. And of course, the moon does trigger some light deja vu for Boros, though he's never been here himself per se. A few moments later, Phoenix Man starts glowing and resurrects once again. He opens his eyes and feels that he no longer needs to breathe to survive. Thank God for that resurrection ability. Still, to be thrown to the moon, the monster never would have guessed that this is how his day would be going. He spots Boros nearby. Welcome to outer space, Earthling. Boros says playfully. Phoenix Man frowns and clenches his fist. 
he rushes at Boros, who easily catches the fist before breaking the flame monster's arm and shoving an elbow into his face hard enough to shatter his skull once again. I will admit that Heat Sphere from earlier was impressive. I had to struggle a bit to deflect it. However, you needed to pull all your energy into a single point and still get outmatched by a single punch from me. Face it, you don't stand a chance. Yeah, yeah, keep talking. Once I've grown enough to kill you, I'll make sure your death is slow. Phoenix Man declares as he charges at Boros again. But again, the alien easily kills the monster with a single strike. That won't work. Why not? Phoenix Man screamed before attacking Boros and getting killed once again. Because you can't grow infinitely. Boros declares as he smashes Phoenix Man's skull in another time. This goes on for a whole minute. Phoenix Man charging in, getting killed, resurrecting, charging in, getting killed, and so on. Soon enough, Boros grows bored of this and grabs the monster's face before shoving him into the ground. What is going on? Why am I still not stronger than you? Phoenix Man yells out in frustration. Stop thrashing around and I might just explain it to you. Boros says as he rams a foot into Phoenix Man's chest and presses him to the moon's rocky surface. The bird monster tries to break free, even flaps his wings in hopes of generating enough force to slip out from under the alien. Boros is having none of this, as he quickly grabs and rips off all of Phoenix Man's wings, causing him to scream out in pain once more. The flame monster groans a little more, before finally surrendering and letting his arms drop to his sides. See, was that so bad? What is going on? Why am I still not caught up to you? Boros sighs before looking Phoenix Man dead in the eyes. Nineteen. Huh? Nineteen. That is the number of times I've killed you already. Which means you've also grown stronger 19 times since the start of this battle. And at first, your growth was very noticeable. If I punched you from the start of the battle the way I just punched you a few seconds ago, your past self wouldn't have just died. He'd have been blown to pieces. However, ask yourself this. How much stronger have you gotten over all the deaths after you tried to destroy the Earth? Boros asks and gives Phoenix Man some time to think. The monster looks to be in thought, but doesn't respond. Perhaps he's starting to realize what's going on too, but doesn't want to admit it to himself. So, Boros does it for him. Feels like nothing, right? No increase at all. Well, that's not entirely true, you did grow a little bit stronger. But it's nothing compared to the increases you were receiving at the start of our fight. This time, Phoenix Man feels the need to respond. But why? Why would my resurrection ability be yielding lesser results now than it was before? Because you're getting close to the limits of your potential. I've seen it happen many times with various races. Do you have any clue how many planets I've been to? How many people I've killed? How many fighters have come to me looking for revenge over the years? I've seen and faced many opponents and allowed them to live for various reasons. Many of them eventually came back to me for a rematch. I got to see people struggling. Desperately trying to grow strong enough to defeat me through various means. And I can tell you this. Each and every one of them eventually hit a plateau. They reach the bottom of the barrel when it comes to their potential. Once a person hits their limit, they cannot grow any stronger. This is what has happened to you. I've also been told that your appearance is supposed to change every time you evolve, but obviously that hasn't occurred in this battle. 
which probably means that this is your peak form. You cannot evolve past it. You can grow a bit stronger, but not enough. You have more potential than most, there is no doubt about that. In fact, had we fought back when I first came to Earth, I'm not sure if I could have defeated you without resorting to my ultimate trump card. At the very least, you would have forced me to go beyond my current form and given me a good fight. But time has passed. I've been growing stronger. And while you are at the limit of your potential, I am only beginning to tap into mine. So no matter what happens from now on, no matter what you do, you can never defeat me. Understand? Phoenix Man can't believe what he is hearing. The limit of his potential for growth? He wants to deny it. He wants to find some reason to call Boros a liar. But he cannot. The evidence is right there. He supposedly evolved numerous times since being thrown to the moon, but grew very little. Almost not at all. And what was that about Boros being pushed above his current form? Does that mean this isn't even his full power? Does he have something above the level of strength he's currently using? That's absurd. Ridiculous. And yet, Phoenix Man has no reason to doubt that what the alien is saying is true. This unfairness. It makes the monster want to tear up. All the suffering he went through. All the scheming, trying to talk Garo into helping him, fighting the heroes and even fellow monsters. All the torture he went through in this fight against this damned alien. All of it was for nothing. Boros can see defeat in Phoenix Man's eyes and lifts his foot off of the monster. I can see that you've come to see things the way they are. Now what should I do with you? The alien brings a hand to his chin and thinks while walking around the moon near where Phoenix Man is lying. He'd like to keep this monster around as a sparring partner, but if Phoenix Man burns everything around him just by existing, that might not be possible. Besides, this guy is still way stronger than anyone on Earth aside from Boros himself, Saitama, and maybe King. That Blast guy too, maybe. Who knows. But the point is that Boros would have to constantly watch Phoenix Man's every move and make sure he doesn't cause any harm, which would be tedious. What if Phoenix Man still holds a grudge and just decides to nuke the Earth out of existence when Boros isn't looking? That is unfortunately a real possibility. In the end, Boros decides he'll talk to Phoenix Man, evaluate his mental state, and then decide what to do. And so the alien turns to his defeated opponent, but what he sees is... unexpected. Phoenix Man is still lying on the ground where Boros left him. He's not moving at all, actually. His eyes seem to be glazed over, like there isn't even a glimmer of hope left in them. Phoenix Man's entire journey was for nothing. His plans shattered, his pride ripped to pieces. He has no reason to live anymore. And that is reflected in the hopelessness in his eyes. Boros face bombs. Perhaps he went too hard on the monster. He takes a step closer to him, but before he can say anything, a cold chill suddenly runs down the alien's spine. His eye widens, and he looks around. Something in the vacuum around him has changed. For some reason, Boros feels a sense of dread as tingles run all over his body. Out of nowhere, a cloud slowly forms on the moon. Wait, a cloud on the moon? What's going on? Wake up, my child. Phoenix Man hears a voice ring across the planetoid. He slowly looks around and sees two gigantic legs on either side of the battlefield. And yet, despite this obviously shocking view, the monster barely reacts. Meanwhile, Boros is still looking at the cloud confused. He doesn't hear anything, nor does he see the massive feet coming from it. 
Phoenix Man. A single hero is reducing your ambitions to nothing. But there is a way to salvage them. The voice continues talking. But yet again, Phoenix Man barely reacts until a figure appears before him. A humanoid with a face resembling the surface of Jupiter. The figure extends a hand to Phoenix Man. No father would ever watch their child suffer such defeat. The figure speaks as it brings its palm closer to Phoenix Man. Take my hand. And I shall grant you the power to make all your ambitions a reality. Phoenix Man, not knowing what else to do, slowly raises his hand. He brings his trembling fingers to God's palm. And... He takes it. A huge light erupts from Phoenix Man's body, blinding Boros for a few moments. The alien's eye goes wide. This power, he sensed it before. He could never forget it. God. A terrifying realization hits Boros as he remembers what God said during their last meeting. It is only a matter of time before I find a vessel capable of holding enough power to kill you. No! Boros shouts before gripping his hands into fists. Damn it, he didn't even consider that God might intervene. The alien powers up to his max once again and lunges at Phoenix Man at full speed. I have to kill him before the transfer of power is complete. Boros thinks to himself and rockets at his foe. He winds up the strongest punch he can muster and swings at Phoenix Man. To his horror, a hand catches his fist. The light dies down, revealing a new monster. Phoenix Man, Cosmic Fear Mode. Boris's eye widens in shock. Surprised? Phoenix Man asks before pulling Boros in closer and delivering a furious gut punch. The alien keels over in pain. Pain he hasn't felt since his last battle with Saitama. The god monster then swings him by the arm and throws him away. Boros lands on all fours, and blood starts gushing from his mouth. Quickly, he regenerates his internals and looks at the newly reborn Phoenix Man. His body has morphed back into something similar to what it looked like when he was in Brilliant Eagle mode, but instead of golden skin, it's covered in the vast void of space, filled with stars, galaxies, and nebulas all over his body and the aura coming off of him. It gives Boros chills. This creature's power is like a never-ending ocean. Boros feels a similar sensation to the one he felt when he first laid eyes on Saitama. A bottomless pit of energy. Though this time, it was born not from hard work, but from despair and sorrow. Boros feels its pressure all over his skin. Phoenix Man raises an arm and looks at himself as if examining his new body. Boros can't help but wonder if Phoenix Man's consciousness is still in there or not. The monster soon clenches its fist, which bursts on fire. But not just any fire. Fire with the texture of the cosmos like cosmic energy itself is flowing through it. The creature looks up at Boros. Cosmic Resurrection Fist. Form 1. Desolation. Phoenix Man utters before punching the air in Boros' direction, sending a huge shockwave of cosmic flame at the alien, who quickly takes a wide stance and brings his arms in front of his face. The wave reaches Boros, and the alien feels his shell-like skin peel away. He groans in agony, as his skin is completely vaporized, exposing the muscles underneath. Thankfully, the wave passes before it can deal any more damage to his body. Boros barely remains standing as his body regenerates. 
he looks around and sees a giant flat space around himself. Not the usual wasteland of the moon, but straight up nothingness. No stones, no craters, no dust. Just pure emptiness for hundreds of miles. If this were to be used on Earth, the effects would be devastating. Desolation. The attack definitely lives up to its name. Boros takes a fighting stance as he prepares for the fight of his life. Meanwhile, Phoenix Man looks at his hand. Strange. This was supposed to kill you instantly. It seems I wasn't able to give this vessel as much power as I would have liked. Phoenix Man, you defective failure. Your mind was so broken that you couldn't even register what I was telling you. You reached out for my hand out of pure desperation, not actually knowing what I had promised you. You did not accept the deal fully. But no matter. This should still suffice. Phoenix Man utters to himself, though clearly, this isn't actually Phoenix Man talking. Not anymore. Suddenly, a black hole-like portal appears in between Boros and Phoenix Man, and a man steps out. Yo, Mr. God, Mr. Alien. My name is Blast. Boros turns to face the newcomer. He said his name was... Blast? Wait, the number one hero? He's here? And he called this new form of Phoenix Man God, too. He knows about God? Boros looks at the man in disbelief and eyes him up and down. The power radiating from him is certainly impressive enough to be on the level of what the number one ranked hero should be. Blast? Yep. And you must be Boros, the self-proclaimed dominator of the universe. I've heard of your exploits, and I can't say I'm very happy to see you here on Earth. Blast says as he drops his smirk. Boros looks at the hero confused. He, an Earthling, knows of his existence? Humans haven't even figured out space travel yet. How on Earth does this guy know who he is? Questions for later. Right now, they have bigger problems at hand. I've been on this planet for a while now. Lots has changed. I was fighting a monster in order to protect the Earth, but now it has received incredible power. I can sense that you're strong. We should team up to defeat it. At least for now. Blast turns to Boros with an unsure expression on his face. You, fighting to protect a planet? You seriously expect me to believe that? I told you, lots has changed. While the two heroes bicker, Cosmic Flame Phoenix Man looks at the situation. This is a perfect chance to squash two of the bugs who are constantly meddling with his plans. Perfect. He raises his arm and points a palm at the two men before him. Form 3. Black Hole. He mutters, and a sphere of gravity appears in his hand. In the next instant, everything around the cosmic horror starts getting sucked in. Blast and Boros feel the pull immediately, and dig their heels into the moon's surface. Unfortunately, the rocks underneath them start getting pulled in as well, and they both soon lose their footing. Forget our squabble for now. Let's focus on taking this thing down first. Boros shouts to Blast who quickly thinks the situation over and determines that this vessel of God is obviously the greater threat here. Fine, let's go. Blast responds before spreading his hands out and clapping his fists together before forming a sphere of energy in his palms and launching it at the black hole in Phoenix Man's hand. Dimension Cannon! The hero yells out, intending to teleport the black hole into another time space entirely. However, Phoenix Man quickly extends his other arm and catches the portal in his palm. Blast's eyes widen in shock as the cosmic creature effortlessly grips his attack with his fingers and crushes it, scattering the energy. I am God. 
I rule over the cosmos. Your pitiful spatial manipulation pales in comparison to mine, human. Phoenix Man declares as the pull of the black hole increases further, making it increasingly difficult for Blast and Boris to stay away. I'm not sure what you just tried to do here, but I have an idea. If I use my full power, I might be able to shatter the black hole, but I can only use it in short bursts. Once I power up, we'll have only about a minute before I run out of steam. Shatter a black hole, huh? Let's try it. Bless responds and the two heroes get ready for an all-out assault. The number one hero claps his hands together, and for a few moments, the gravity around Boros and himself becomes lighter, and the pull weakens. I'll keep the gravity at bay for a few moments. Power up! Right! Boros says before squatting down. He places a hand on the ground and tenses up every muscle in his body. Suddenly, an enormous shockwave bursts out of him, and his skin starts turning a shade of white. His hair grows in length, and lightning-like marks spread across his body. Meteoric burst! Boro shouts as he unleashes his maximum power for the first time since his battle with Saitama. The entire moon shakes as Boro springs off of the ground and at the same time, Blast stops restraining the gravity around them. Propelled forward by his own speed and the gravity of the black hole, the alien lunges at Phoenix Man and winds up his first truly full power punch in this fight before shooting his fist at the black hole and shattering it into pieces instantly. Phoenix Man's eyes widen as he winds up an arm of his own to counterattack. But just as he launches a punch at Boros, the alien responds in kind and shoots out a punch of his own. The two behemoths collide causing devastating, widespread damage to the moon. Blast has to shield his face from the force of the impact as Boros plows through Phoenix Man's hand and tears through his arm before flying past the cosmic creature, having destroyed his entire left side. Before the monster can recover, Boros quickly turns around and flies at Phoenix Man again. The monster turns around and raises his free arm. Form 5. Hypernova. A punch to the back of the head stops him from finishing his mantra. It's Blast, and he's hit Phoenix Man with a strong gravity knuckle. Before the monster can recover, Boros reaches him and drives an uppercut into his chin. Phoenix Man stumbles backwards and is once again hit in the back of the head by Blast. The two heroes start pummeling Phoenix Man with all they've got, breaking bones and creating a few cracks in his cosmic shell. The monster struggles to defend himself as he's hit from all directions. Boros and Blast hop around him, each delivering furious blows all over his body and working surprisingly well together before Boros kicks Phoenix Man in the chest and sends him flying. Blast follows up by bringing his hands together and firing a dozen projectiles at Phoenix Man. Small shards of cosmic energy fly at the monster and dig into his cosmic shell, creating more cracks. However, as Boros and Blast run toward Phoenix Man, the god monster quickly regenerates all the damage, including his lost arm, and charges at them with increased speed. Boros collides with the creature and they lock hands, trying to push each other back. Blast jumps into the air and fires a few more cosmic shards at his opponent, but they break on impact with his body. What? Blast's eyes widen, and Boros can also feel his power getting matched unlike before. What's going on? Phoenix Man suddenly kicks off the ground and crashes one of his knees into the alien's face, causing him to stagger backwards. The god monster prepares to throw a follow-up punch, but Blast intervenes and directs Phoenix Man's attention at himself while Boros quickly regains his bearings and jumps back into the fight. The two heroes once again work together to deal as much damage as possible. But to their surprise, the monster is able to keep up now and blocks most of their attacks without much issue. Phoenix Man, while fighting, blocking and dodging blows, begins to murmur. Form 2, Storm. He says and a huge burst of cosmic rays shoots out of him, knocking Blast and Boros away. Boros covers his face with his arms as Blast forms a shield around the two of them. I need to know. What were this monster's abilities before he received cosmic power? God often takes attributes a vessel has and enhances them beyond the limit. 
And if we know what this monster was like before, we can figure out what it can do now. Blast shouts as the cosmic storm slowly but surely withers his shield. He was called Phoenix Man, and his ability was to return from the dead. Every time he received lethal damage, he would be reborn stronger than before. But we haven't inflicted any fatal wounds yet. Boros responds, and Blast thinks for a moment. Maybe it's not just lethal damage that makes him stronger now. What if it's just any damage? Blast asks, and Boros frowns. Seems likely. This is bad news. How are we supposed to win? We have to take the cosmic shell off of his body. If we can do that, the monster should return to normal. Easier said than done. But I have a move that could do that. He's not strong enough to withstand it yet. Or at least he shouldn't be. I'll need a little bit of time to charge it though. And I'll only have one shot. If it misses, I'm all out of gas. I've got to buy you time. Got it. Blast sweat drops, and right at that moment, his shield finally breaks, and the two heroes are exposed to the storm. Go! Blast shouts and rockets at Phoenix Man, shooting energy from his boots to propel himself through the storm and get closer to Phoenix Man. However, the cosmic monster pays him no attention, and instead charges straight at Boros. You think I don't know what you're plotting? God is omnipresent. I can hear everything you say. The creature declares as he reaches Boros, and the two of them get into an exchange of blows. Phoenix Man quickly puts Boros on the back foot, delivering several powerful blows and forcing the alien to use his regeneration capabilities. More importantly, Boros has no chance to start charging his cannon. Thankfully, Blast appears behind Phoenix Man and attempts to drive both of his fists into the top of the monster's head. Unfortunately, the cosmic monster sees this coming and quickly wraps two of his wings around his head like a shield, blocks Blast's attack, and blows him away before grabbing at Boros with both hands and driving a knee into his chest. The creature then grips both of Boros' shoulders and throws him up into the wide horizon of space before jumping after him and bringing both of his palms to Boros' stomach. Form 5. Hypernova. A hypernova. The most violent star death of all. Hundreds of times more powerful than a supernova. A small orb of heat appears right next to Boros' stomach. A miniature star. Its core collapses, and an enormous shockwave rips through its outer layers before bursting out of the star and engulfing Boros in black dust and white energy, more intense than anything he's ever felt before. His body begins disintegrating as the incredible force of the attack blows him away. The alien is launched hundreds of thousands of kilometers, all while screaming in pain as his body is torn apart. Down on Earth, Tatsumaki looks up into the sky and sees a bright dot appear in the distance. The dot gets bigger and bigger, and a moment later, crashes into the Earth a few hundred meters away from the Esper, forming a decently sized crater. Tatsumaki cautiously gets up and floats over to the crater to investigate, and what she sees freaks her out quite a bit. A single eyeball. That is all that's left from Boris's body. A few seconds pass before the eyeball starts twitching and flesh and bones start forming around it. Within a matter of seconds, Boros regenerates his entire body before quickly dropping out of meteoric burst and reverting back to his released form. Boros? What the hell happened to you? Tatsumaki shouts as she descends into the crater. Did you play around too much, you damned fool? Don't tell me you let your advantage over the phoenix creature slip away. I didn't. God intervened. Boro says as he slowly sits up. Remember, I told you about an entity calling itself God. The battle was won, and then it intervened. Gave the monster a ton of power. It's stronger than me now. Blast is currently still on the moon fighting it. He won't be able to hold out for long. 
I need to get back up there. Boro says as he tries to get back to his feet, but his legs give out on him and he collapses to his knees. Damn it, he spent too much energy. He'll need time to recover. Tatsumaki, hearing about Blast, asks what in the world happened up there, and, having nothing better to do, Boros gives her the rundown. At the same time, back on the moon, Blast can't believe his eyes. A hypernova so close to the Earth should be devastating. The planet should be cosmic dust by now. And yet, it isn't somehow. Confused? Phoenix Man asks as he lands back on the moon's surface. Despite how it may seem, I do not wish to destroy the Earth. It will be a beautiful place once I erase all of the humans who corrupt it. So that wasn't a real hypernova then? Blast asks as a sweat drop rolls down his forehead. He tries to sense for Boris's energy, but can't get a hold of him. Did he die? Or is he simply out of power? It's hard to say. No, that hypernova was 100% the real deal. I just condensed it into a smaller, less destructive form. The cosmic creature explains before clenching a fist. Form 1. Desolation. He says before firing the same massive wave of cosmic flame at Blast that he fired against Boros earlier. Blast prepares to deflect it, but before he can do that, a portal opens up in front of him and sucks up the fire. Two figures land on either side of the number one hero. Quite the predicament you find yourself in, Blast. A divinity on this scale is rare. We shall lend you a hand. A humanoid lion and a human-looking woman stand side by side with Blast, who looks at them a little concerned. I appreciate the help, but what about the dimensional seal? We left some of our strongest guys to keep it sealed tight. They can make do without us. Alright, be careful. He's got- We know. We've been watching the battle from another dimension. Okay then, let's go. The three figures collectively charge at Phoenix Man. More pests that need to be crushed. Form 6, Nebula. Back on Earth, Tatsumaki uses their psychic powers to hold Boros up. What now? I need to recover. But that might take too long. I'm not sure how much time we have. And even if I do make it back in time, Meteoric Burst takes a lot out of me. I can only do so much in a minute. Besides, it shortens my life every time I use it. Ugh. I don't know what to do. Boros grunts in frustration. This is the first time he's felt so... powerless. Tatsumaki thinks for a few moments before a glimmer of hope lights up in her eyes. Fubuki! She can utilize her psychic powers to enhance the bodies of her subordinates. She can also heal. What if she could somehow enhance your body and heal it at the same time constantly? Would that make it easier for you to maintain the form? Maybe. I've never tried anything like that before. But it might just work. Just then, the two heroes see a massive cloud of cosmic energy, filled with miniature stars around the moon in the distance. Things don't look good out there. Then we must hurry. Wait. Blast won't be able to hold him off by himself for long. He needs some help. What are you suggesting? It's not like we have anyone else capable of going up there and helping him. Even King can fight out in space, right? No. But there is one. Huh? Who? The man who defeated me when I first came to Earth. Boros says before closing his eye and focusing on his senses, trying to feel Saitama's power somewhere on the planet. Meanwhile, Tatsumaki looks at Boros in surprise. I thought Blast was the one who defeated you. No. Boros mutters as he searches. 
Soon enough, he spots Saitama's energy. And it's close too. There, in that direction. Boro says as he points to the nearest city. Take us there. Don't boss me around. Tatsumaki murmurs, but knowing that the fate of the entirety of humanity may be at stake, she uses her psychic powers to lift Boros off of the ground and flies with him to where he's pointing. Within a few moments, they arrive to their destination, and there, they see Rover running around with a man dressed in a doll costume. Tatsumaki looks at Boros unamused. Don't tell me you were beaten by frickin' Watchdog Man. No, the man we're looking for is in that building. Boros points at the supermarket. Tatsumaki, curious, floats them both down to the ground and enters the building with Boros floating behind her. She looks around, but sees no one remarkable. Just a few civilians and a guy in a dumb-looking excuse for a hero costume. Wait, that's the same guy who insulted her in the S-Class meeting that one time. She still hasn't made him pay yet. Uh, whatever, now's not the time. Well, where is he? That's the guy. Boros points at Saitama before waving at him. Hey, Saitama, we have an emergency. He calls out and Tatsumaki gives him the side eye. I think you got hit in the head a little too hard. Tatsumaki murmurs as Saitama walks over to the two of them. He looks angry. There you are! What are you thinking walking around without your disguise? What if the heroes discover who you are? Also, why'd you leave your pet with me? Now he's causing problems all over the place and I have to be the one to take care of it. Way past that, buddy. Boros points at Tatsumaki. I'll explain later, but I'm on decent terms with some of the heroes, at least for now. Boros says before giving Saitama a very quick rundown on what happened on the moon. And that's what happened. I need to recover for a while. Do you think you could jump to the moon and help us out against the monster? Sure. If he was able to mess you up like this, then maybe he could actually survive a few punches. Meanwhile, Tatsumaki looks at both of them, completely speechless. Wh what are you talking about? How is this normal guy gonna jump to the moon? And isn't he human too? How's he gonna breathe in space? Trust me, Saitama's no normal guy. Boros answers. At the same time, Saitama exits the shop and crouches down. Suddenly, Boros comes to a realization. Wait a moment, maybe you shouldn't... Saitama kicks off of the ground, causing massive shockwaves to ripple across the town. Windows shatter and streets crack as the ground is forced to take the brunt of the jump. Tatsumaki looks on, wide-eyed, completely speechless. Boro sighs. He really needs to learn to control his strength a bit better. Up on the moon, Blast and his comrades are just holding out against their godly opponent. The entire moon is covered in a miniature nebula. Things aren't looking good. He can control everything within this space. What do we do to counter this? I've got an idea, but first we have to- A crack suddenly appears in the nebula above them. Everyone looks up, confused. Phoenix Man seems to be the only one in the know. So he's come. The creature utters, before the crack widens and the entire nebula is quickly shattered. A man lands on the surface of the moon near Blast Team and rubs his head. What the- my head bumped into something on the way here. Sure hope I didn't break a satellite or something. Saitama says. In reality, the thing he bumped into was the outside shell containing the nebula around the moon. Blast and his team look at Saitama in shock. Who are you? My name's Saitama. I'm a professional hero. Burroughs told me you needed help, but I can see you have some friends here now. Still, I kinda wanna try fighting the dude who messed Boros up. Might be pretty fun. The Baldi says. Blast can't believe his eyes. Why would that alien send some random guy up here? 
Then again, this random guy just jumped to the moon, scattered a miniature nebula, and can somehow breathe here apparently. He's clearly not normal. While well, Blast is stuck in thought, Saitama turns to Phoenix Man. So, you're the one I've been told about, huh? I am. And I also know a lot about you. The fist that has turned against God. You've caused me quite a bit of trouble already. I will not miss this chance to get rid of you. The monster declares and starts walking toward the group of heroes, who all get ready for battle. No offense, but could you guys back off for a minute? Kevin Baldi asks the other heroes, and before they can respond, he starts walking toward Phoenix Man. What is he? How is a human able to survive out here? Not sure. But let's see what happens for now. If he seems in trouble, we'll jump in and help. Got it. Saitama and Phoenix Man continue walking toward one another, until they're only a meter apart. Saitama looks up at the taller monster and smirks. Never seen a monster as sparkly as you before. Enjoy the sparkles while you can, hero. Saitama, surprised that the monster isn't going on a monologue, widens his smirk. Well, you've piqued my interest a little. But let's see if he can survive a normal punch. He says as he clenches a fist, before swinging it at Phoenix Man. The cosmic monster quickly raises an arm and prepares to catch the punch with one hand. The attack lands, and the resulting shockwave blows huge chunks of rubble off of the moon's surface. Blast Cape flutters in the wind as he and his comrades look at the clash in shock. But as the dust settles, Saitama's eyes widen. He sees five fingers gripping his fist. His normal punch has been blocked. I've been watching you for a long time. I know how strong you are. You finish most of your battles in only a single blow. But that will not happen here. Phoenix Man says as he winds up a bunch of his own. Saitama's smirk grows even wider. Nice, you're strong. He says as he raises his other arm and winds up another normal punch. The two monsters rocket their fists at each other and their punches collide, causing a massive shockwave to ring across the moon. Saitama and Phoenix Man draw their fists back, and the creature lets go of the baldi's other hand. Not a moment later, they both start throwing dozens of punches at one another. Their fists collide numerous times, sending enormous shockwaves across the moon and blowing Blast's group away. How is this possible? Blast shouts as the two behemoths start fighting for real, exchanging hundreds of blows, blocking and tanking through each other's attacks as they seem evenly matched. For the first time in ages, Saitama feels some excitement rise within him as his normal punches are being matched. Consecutive normal punches. Saitama yells out and unleashes a fury of fists at Phoenix Man, who quickly plants both his feet firmly on the ground and starts blocking every punch. He groans as a few cracks appear on his fingers and palms, but as the clash ends, the cosmic monster rushes at his enemy with a wound up fist. Form 7, Meltdown! He screams out as he punches Saitama right in the face. As soon as his fist collides with the baldi's cheek, it lights up and a huge explosion bursts out of it. The hero spits up drool and flies thousands of miles in an instant before circling around the moon and appearing behind Phoenix Man. Saitama yells out in pure joy as he drives a punch into the monster's back and launches him forward a few kilometers. The cosmic being soon stops his momentum and quickly regenerates the shell around his hands, which were still damaged from the consecutive normal punches. That's better. Phoenix Man utters before jumping at Saitama. The two warriors dash around the moon's surface, clashing numerous times and devastating the barren terrain. This time, Phoenix Man is moving slightly faster than his opponent. He gets in more punches. Whenever he lands a blow, Saitama flies a little further back than Phoenix Man does when he gets hit. Blast observes this and curses under his breath. The monster got stronger again. But... It didn't happen when he got damaged. 
After the cracks in his hand appeared, he didn't show any increase in speed. It just happened now. So why now instead of when he took the damage? As Blast tries to connect the dots, Phoenix Man throws Saitama to the ground. The caved baldy lands on his feet, and Phoenix Man lands near him before his body lights on fire. Form 4, Acceleration Phoenix Man shouts and starts running circles around Saitama, with each lap getting faster and faster until all that can be seen from him is just a blur. Moments later, he suddenly switches his trajectory and rockets at his foe with incredible force built up from all that momentum. Saitama reacts just in time to raise both his hands in an X-Guard and block the punch, but the force of it launches him away. The hero flies around the moon a dozen times before crashing into its surface and rolling around the planet a couple more times before finally coming to a halt. He sits up and rubs his hands. Damn, that actually stung a bit. For what seems like the tenth time in the last couple minutes, the hero smiles. Things might actually get serious. Back on Earth, Boros and Tatsumaki have flown to the hospital where Fubuki is resting after the battle with Evil Ocean Water. The doctors are less than welcoming to Boros, but after Tatsumaki yells at them, they back off and the two heroes walk into Fubuki's hospital room. They explain the situation to her and what they came here to do. After getting over the shock of it all, Tatsumaki's little sister speaks up. So let me get this straight. You want me to heal Boros and then enhance his body so we can better handle his power? Healing will not be necessary. I've already done that myself. But that enhancement is greatly needed. I suppose I can try, but I don't think it'll work. The power gap between the two of us is immense. I don't know if I have enough energy to help you. Fubuki says, a little disheartened, but then Tatsumaki comes up with an idea. Though she hates it from the bottom of her heart, she has no choice but to say this. Then, could, could you teach me how to use my power to enhance another person's body? I think I could pull it off if I knew how to. Fubuki can't believe her ears. Tatsumaki? Asking to be taught something? How can this be? The situation really must be dire if she's willing to do something like this. And so, Fubuki does not refuse. I can try, but let's head outside for more space. And while you two work on that, I'll take some time to recover as much energy as I can. Boro says, and the three of them get to work. Saitama yelps slightly as Phoenix Man's foot crashes into his cheek. Phoenix Man grunts as Saitama drives an uppercut into his gut. The two monsters lay the bee down on each other as Blast and his teammates watch on in awe. How can there exist a human on Earth who can clash with a divinity of this level evenly? Saitama, for his part, revels in the battle. It's been forever since he's faced an opponent who could take normal punches and keep going without trouble. If this goes on, he might even have to use some serious moves on this guy. Just as Saitama thinks that, Phoenix Man delivers a strong punch to his side. Form 2, Storm! A huge cosmic storm erupts from the fist embedded in Saitama's side and knocks him away. The top half of Saitama's outfit is ripped to shreds as he slides on the ground for a few dozen kilometers and clenches his side. Again, he feels an ache. He's feeling the blows he receives, and he couldn't be happier about it. However, God is no fool. He can tell Saitama isn't going all out yet, and he realizes that if the Baldi were to go full force, he would probably be able to break his cosmic shell before he could grow any stronger. And the deity has a plan to get rid of him before that can happen. When first possessing Phoenix Man, God had to decide what powers he would give his body. Unlike with Garo, who could adapt to and become one with the flow of the universe and master all its powers at once, Phoenix Man was not such a suitable vessel. So God had to select a set number of abilities he would give beyond just enhancing the monster's regular strengths. That's what the forms are. And the tenth form is specifically reserved for dealing with Saitama, and Saitama only. 
The battle continues for about half an hour before finally Saitama gets tired of being on the back foot. After all, he isn't going all out yet, and deliberately letting himself get tossed around is becoming old. Saitama's face becomes more serious, and he clenches one of his fists. Thanks for the fun, but I've had my fill. The Baldi says, and Phoenix Man takes this as his cue to act. He swirls his hands in the air, and they both start to glow. Then, Phoenix Man dashes in close to Saitama and winds up both arms. Form 10, Wormhole. Phoenix Man exclaims and slams both of his palms into the hero's stomach. As soon as he does, a portal appears right behind Saitama, and the force of the blow pushes him inside. The hero looks around confused as he's sucked into a wormhole. A tunnel, with two ends at separate points in space-time. The cosmos flies past Saitama at ludicrous speeds as he's sent incredibly far away from the moon in no time flat. He is expelled from the other end of the wormhole, into the vacuum of space, and before he can figure out what's going on, the wormhole closes before his eyes, leaving him alone in the void. Blast and his comrades look stunned as their end of the wormhole closes too, and Phoenix Man stands tall. Dangerous individuals like him are the ones you have to watch out for the most. That's why I've made contingencies. What just happened? I am not entirely sure, but based on the name of his attack, it's safe to say that the man was sucked into a wormhole and expelled at some distant location in space. Is it possible to know where? I can try to trace his location, but it'll take time. We'll buy you as much time as we can. You're the best of us when it comes to sensory capabilities. Go and find him. Roger. The woman responds and flies into space to put some distance between herself and the battle to make it easier to concentrate. Meanwhile, Blast and his lion friend both rush at Phoenix Man, trying to divert his attention, and before the monster can go after their teammate, the two of them reach him and begin throwing blows his way. The god monster has an easy time keeping his attackers at bay, but they are enough of a nuisance for him to start fighting them. At the same time, Fubuki and Tatsumaki train to help Boros. The training consists mostly of Boros standing still in his released form as Fubuki tries to get Tatsumaki to enhance him. And progress is made. Tatsumaki is able to learn the basics of body enhancement and manages to use it on the alien. However, due to her being a novice, it takes a lot of energy and she has to continuously make physical contact with Boros to be able to keep his body fortified. Uh, it's no use. If I have to be in contact with him the entire time, how's he gonna fight? And how am I going to go into space? Uh, it's useless. No, this is working. If you could keep it active, I know I could fight in Meteoric Burst a lot better and a lot longer. I have an idea. Would you be able to coat yourself in energy to reflect cosmic radiation and form a bubble around your head to keep air in? Well... Yeah, I suppose I could. Good. Then we can still do this. You surround yourself with energy, trap some air and a shield around your head, and... Once I transform, grab onto my hair. You'll be on my back as I fight. I'll try my best not to let you get hit at any point. If you start running out of energy, tap my shoulder twice and I'll let some of my energy flow into you. Just as I did back when we fought the water monster. And before you say anything, no, that won't hinder me. Refilling your reserves barely puts a dent in mine. And if you start running out of air, tap my shoulder three times. I'll know to jump to the earth briefly to let you get some fresh air into your shield before going back into the battle. Would you be alright with something like this? Boros asks and Tatsumaki thinks for a few moments before nodding. Are you sure? I can't guarantee your safety up there. If one hit from that monster gets to you, you will die. I will do my best to prevent that, but the risk is still there. Tatsumaki thinks for a few more moments before nodding again. I know, but if we lose here, then I'll die anyway. So instead of dying quietly, I at least want to make a difference. 
Fubuki looks at her sister with worry and pride in her eyes as Boros nods. Very well then. Meteoric burst! Boros declares before bursting into his ultimate form. The force of the transformation blows Fubuki away. Meanwhile, Tatsumaki forms a skin tight shield around herself to keep radiation from killing her, and a bubble of energy around her head to get herself some air to breathe in space before walking over to Boros and grabbing onto his hair tight. As soon as she touches the alien, she feels the aura surrounding him surround her as well. Now, instead of pushing her away, the aura presses her to his back, so it'll be easier to hold on to him during the fight. At the same time, she uses her psychic power to enhance Boros' body, and the alien can feel the effect taking place. He feels the stress on his muscles fade, and the pain he's usually in when using this form becomes dull. Perfect. This is actually working. You ready? Boros asks, and Tatsumaki gives him a thumbs up. In response, Boros crouches down. Let's go! Meanwhile, Blast and his teammate are struggling to hold on against Phoenix Man. The monster is considerably stronger than them and manages to block and counter all of their moves with relative ease. At the same time, Blast's companion up in space starts to panic. I can't find him anywhere in the galaxy. Try expanding the search radius then. Blast yells before getting launched away by an attack from Phoenix Man. His lion friend soon meets the same fate as he's slammed into the ground. The god monster looks up at the woman floating in space. As if I would allow you to locate him after the trouble I went through to get him away. Phoenix Man says as he points a hand at her. Form. A figure suddenly lands right in front of Phoenix Man. The monster looks down to see who it is, and just as he does, he gets a fist slammed into his face. The monster staggers backwards as another punch collides with his beak. Due to Phoenix Man not being a perfect vessel, his omnipresence isn't complete. If he's not focusing on something, he doesn't see it. And he wasn't focusing on the events on Earth. That's how Boros got the jump on him. Phoenix Man recollects himself, and the next time the alien attempts to punch him, he blocks the blow. Blast looks at Boros and spots something on his back. Or rather, someone. Wait, is that... Tatsumaki? His eyes widen in shock. What the hell is she doing here? Boros quickly looks around and doesn't spot Saitama anywhere. Also, there are two more people here for some reason? Eh, doesn't matter. But Saitama's absence does have him concerned. No way he actually died, right? In any case, Boros doesn't have much time to dwell on it as Phoenix Man goes on the offensive, forcing Boros to start blocking and dodging his hits. The two monsters start brawling and, due to Boros' body not being constantly in pain, being less strained and due to the near-death experience he just went through, the alien is now substantially stronger and faster than he was at the start of the battle. And he puts this power to use as he and Phoenix Man rocket around the moon at massively faster than light speeds. They speed up to the point that all that can be seen from them are flashes of light, which often clash with one another, causing shockwaves to ripple across the moon. Meanwhile, Blast's companion in space finally spots Saitama. Found him! He's in the Andromeda Galaxy! What? Can you teleport that far? I'm not entirely certain. I'll have to perform several consecutive teleportations. I'll do my best. She says before disappearing. Blast then turns to the battle Boros is waging. The alien seems to be doing well for himself for now, but Blast still thinks his power-up is extremely temporary and decides to help out. He dashes closer to the combatants. At the same time, Phoenix Man punches Boros in the gut hard and launches him into space. Boros, punch in front of yourself, now! Blast calls out and the alien, without much thinking, does as he's told. A portal opens up in front of him and his fist goes through it. At the same time, a portal appears right next to Phoenix Man's cheek and the punch crashes into his face. Upon realizing what just happened, Boros smirks. Nice one! 
The alien chuckles and lunges at the portal before emerging from its other side on the ground and rocketing at Phoenix Man. Far away, in the empty space of the Andromeda Galaxy, Saitama is still confused on what exactly happened. He doesn't know where he is or where the Earth is. Fortunately, a woman suddenly appears before him. Quick, grab my hand! She tells him, and, not knowing what else to do and recognizing this girl as one of Blast's friends, the Baldi takes her hand before they both vanish. On the moon, Boros clashes fists with Phoenix Man when Tatsumaki taps his shoulder twice, a signal she's running low on energy. Up until now, the Esper has been holding on for dear life quietly. Boros jumps away from his foe before letting a tiny portion of his energy run freely from his body into Tatsumaki's, refueling her reserves. She gives him a thumbs up and Boros lunges at Phoenix Man again. A portal opens up before him and Boros doesn't hesitate to rocket straight into it. He appears right behind Phoenix Man, but the cosmic monster expected such a trick this time and is able to dodge the blow before aiming a claw at Boros' back, right at Tatsumaki. Crap. He's figured out their strategy already. Boros quickly turns around and takes the blow to his chest, protecting the Esper by taking a big hit himself. However, he also uses this as an opportunity. While Phoenix Man's claw is still embedded in his chest, he charges up a powerful blast and shoots it at his hand at point-blank range. The cosmic monster quickly pulls his hand back, but it gets a bit singed. The monster is about to regenerate the small injury, but before he can, Boros jumps at him with a kick. At the same time, Blast's companion finally returns to the moon with Saitama in hand. There. I brought him back. The woman utters before passing out. Teleporting to Andromeda and back really wore her out. Blast leaves her to his lion companion to take care of as he yells for Saitama to go join Boros against their godly foe. The Baldi, still a bit confused but not questioning it, nods and lunges at the battle. Just as Phoenix Man is about to drive a punch into Boris' face, he himself finds a fist crash into his cheek as Saitama delivers a strong normal punch to his beak. The monster slides backward a few kilometers before starting to regenerate the hand Boros singed. No you don't! Blast shouts and quickly teleports a gravity knuckle into Phoenix Man's side hitting him unexpectedly and stopping his regeneration. Not a moment later, Saitama and Boros catch up to him and force him into an exchange of blows. Blast watches the fight closely and sees no increase in Phoenix Man's power or speed. I knew it! He only gets stronger after receiving an injury and then healing it. He needs a little time to heal. Don't let up and keep attacking! Break his monster's shell before he has the time to repair it! The number one hero yells out to his comrades and they both nod. Good work figuring that out! Boros compliments Blast before focusing on doing exactly what the number one hero told him to do. Come on Saitama, full throttle! The alien smirks and speeds up to the max. Saitama quickly matches the speed. Don't tell me what to do. The two heroes attack Phoenix Man relentlessly and the monster struggles to defend himself as they punch, kick and blast him time and time again. He tries to block his opponent's blows, but he's hit left, right and center as Boros and Saitama work together for the first time in their lives. Pieces of Phoenix Man's cosmic shell begin flying off as Saitama unleashes consecutive normal punches on his chest and stomach. A moment later, Boros blasts him in the face forcing him to raise his arms to protect himself, but the heat and power of the energy emitted from the alien is enough to chip away at his arms and create several cracks. Don't mock your creator! Phoenix Man declares as a giant orb of energy forms around him. Form 5, Hypernova! He screams as a burst of energy erupts from his body, forcing Boros and Saitama to jump back. In particular, Boros worries about Tatsumaki and jumps over to Blast. Can you make a portal to shield us? I can try. Blast says before clapping his hands together and opening a spherical portal around the three of them. Any parts of the explosion that come into contact with it are sent far away into space. 
Meanwhile, Saitama takes the brunt of the attack head on. Phoenix Man, seeing no one near him after the blast dies down, prepares to initiate regeneration. But a portal opens up before him and Boro shoots out of it and drives a punch into the monster's face. Not a moment later, Saitama punches the top of his head from above. Come on, let's finish this. Blast yells and bumps his fists together. Veins appear on his forehead as he pushes himself to the limit and opens dozens of portals all around Phoenix Man. Boros and Saitama quickly get the memo. The alien lunges at Phoenix Man, delivers a punch to his gut and jumps into a portal, emerging above Phoenix Man and driving another fist into his head before retreating into a portal again. Saitama does the same. They start dashing around, going from portal to portal, rocketing past Phoenix Man millions of times in seconds, attacking him from all directions and retreating before he can block or counter. Blast keeps switching which portals are linked to each other, so their attack patterns become completely unpredictable, leaving the cosmic monster no leeway to act at all. All he can do is do his best to guard as Boros and Saitama pummel him. Little by little, punch after punch, kick after kick, Phoenix Man's cosmic shell breaks off of his body. Shards of it are flung into space before slowly disintegrating into cosmic dust. Tatsumaki feels herself running low on air, but she knows if Phoenix Man was given any chance to heal with this much damage, he would likely become too strong to stop. So she endures and counts on her comrades to finish the battle quickly. Finally, Phoenix Man has had enough. He screams out and a huge energy wave erupts from his body, knocking Saitama and Boros back, as well as destroying all the portals around them. The cosmic monster rises into the air as energy swirls all around him. Form 9! Gamma Ray Burst! Phoenix Man yells as an orb of energy forms around him, ready to explode. Now, both of you, attack him with all you've got! Blast shouts, and his teammates oblige. They both wind up a single fist each. Killer move! Serious series! Serious punch! Collapsing star! Roaring fist! Boros roars as all the energy in his body is directed into his fist, and both heroes jump at their enemy at the same time in perfect synchronicity. Blast extends his hands in front of himself and uses a form of magnetism to propel them even faster than they were going before. At the same time, he forms a human-sized portal above Tatsumaki and before she can react, she's teleported back to Earth. Your job here is done. Go get some rest. Blast mutters with a proud smile on his face. At the same time, Phoenix Man unleashes all the power he's built up, launching a point-blank gamma ray burst at his enemies. Saitama and Boros both shoot their fists out at the same time and clash with the attack for a moment before completely overpowering it and reaching Phoenix Man. The monster yelps as both heroes reach him and slam their combined attack into his face. A huge shockwave is felt all across the solar system as the two punches are driven into Phoenix Man and the cosmic shell on his face shatters. Phoenix Man's body is launched far into space, and the cosmic shell around him falls apart completely, breaking into pieces and turning into cosmic dust. I have... lost. Phoenix Man utters as the godly power leaves his body, putting him back in control. Deep inside, he was conscious the whole time. When the cosmic armor fully vanishes, the bird monster is back to his brilliant eagle state. He floats freely in space and accepts his defeat. Here, floating in this vacuum, looking at the vast ocean of stars surrounding him in all directions, Phoenix Man feels oddly at peace with his defeat. Perhaps he can just remain here, relaxing in the void for an eternity not worrying about anything. That sounds... kind of nice. That is until a set of fingers grips his hand. I'm not leaving you here. 
Burroughs says before flying back to the surface of the moon with Phoenix Man and quickly dropping out of meteoric burst. The alien collapses onto one knee, having spent all of his energy. Phoenix Man falls to the ground next to him, landing on his back. He looks up at the alien. Are you going to kill me again? That depends entirely on you. What do you intend to do if you live? Phoenix Man thinks for a few moments. In that time, Saitama lands on the moon's surface a few meters away, and Blast walks over to the group. That was pretty fun. You've gotten stronger, Boros. Saitama smiles. Meanwhile, Blast focuses on their defeated opponent. Good. It seems his shell is broken. God's influence has been lifted. Now we should be able to deal with this guy easily. You said he can come back to life, so killing won't do much. I'll trap him in another dimension. Hold on. I have a couple things I want to ask him. Why? If it's about God, you can ask me. I've been fighting him for a long time. No, it's not related to that. Boro says and turns to Phoenix Man. So, what do you plan to do now that you've lost? Honestly, I have no clue. All I wanted was to become strong so I could create a place for myself to live happily, without discrimination or mockery or dishonesty. I've seen the darkness that resides in this world. I've suffered because of it. I just wanted to rise above it all and prove that I was worthy of everyone's respect and fear. Nice spiel. Now you can go with that lifted off your chest. Wait. Boros tells Blast and turns to Phoenix Man again. I can tell you're not mindless like some monsters. You think like a human. So I have an offer. Why not join my crew? Phoenix Man and Blast both stare at Boros in disbelief. What? You've got to be kidding. He's the monster who threatened to kill us all. Not really. That was God. But he accepted God's deal. I take responsibility for that. I broke him down and made him vulnerable to God's influence. As things stand now, I doubt he would accept the deal again. Right? He looks at Phoenix Man. What's the point? I lost all hope of ever achieving my goals. Just let me die. You dumbass! Boros slaps Phoenix Man on the cheek, surprising everyone. You don't need to be stronger than everyone to gain respect. Just become a hero and start saving people. You'll see, they'll start loving you in no time. But won't they think I'm a monster? Look at Watchdog Man. He's a guy in an animal costume and so are you. And people love the guy. You do just fine. The Hero Association would never agree to this. Boros turns to Blast. They will, because they already agree to give me a chance, even after figuring out that I'm an alien. At least according to Tatsumaki. Blast blinks a few times. That reminds me. What was Tatsumaki doing up here? How long has she known you? Boro sighs. There's a lot Blast doesn't know. The alien says they should get back to Earth, and there he will explain everything to the number one hero in front of Tatsumaki and Saitama. They can verify whether his story is true. And so, that's what they do. Blast comrades say goodbye and go back to their dimension. And Blast teleports everyone to Earth where he teleported Tatsumaki. The alien, alongside Caped Baldi and Terrible Tornado, explain Boris' story to Blast. And then the question of Phoenix Man's fate rises once more. You seem like a changed person, Boros. I've seen you risk your life for Earth today. But what about him? How can we be sure he won't turn on us? 
Who cares if he does? Right now, he's no threat to us. Tatsumaki could take care of him by herself, no problem. Uh, that's not entirely true. I might not look like I did before taking God's power, but I'm still just as strong as I was before transforming. I'm just weakened right now. Okay, fine. I, Saitama, or you can take care of him, no problem. Boro Stell's Blast. Besides, Phoenix Man, like I already told you, there is a way to achieve your goals without harming anyone. Do you agree to become a hero if I let you live and not hurt another human again? Phoenix Man thinks for a while. Yes, I agree. Alright, but remember, one step out of line and I will end you. Yes, yes, I get it. So what do you say, Blast? The number one hero remains quiet for a few moments. Fine. But I'll be watching. Fair enough. I don't want to interrupt the moment, but we still have some loose threads to tie up. We still have to speak to the Hero Association about you, Boros. And we also have to go take care of that four-eyed monster from earlier. Tatsumaki says and Boros nods. You're right. We also have to go get Rover. He's still running around somewhere. I'll get going now, too. I'll stop by the Hero Association headquarters and put in a good word for you. Thanks. And hey, Saitama, could you take Phoenix Man to Kaseno's laboratory? There you go again, acting like the boss of me. No, no, I'm just asking a favor of a friend. Boro sweat drops. Eh, whatever. As long as you get to be a hero so you can buy me that new house you still owe me. Yeah, right, new house. And so the group splits up. Boros and Tatsumaki go scoop up Rover and then search for Goketsu. They find him exactly where they left him. The giant's injuries are far too great for him to move anywhere. Back to finish me off? Not really. Tell me, do you know anything about the entity which calls itself God? It sometimes interacts with people and gives them power. God? No, I have no idea what you are talking about. Okay. Time to die, then. Tatsumaki points a finger at Goketsu, but once again, Boro stops her from killing him. Wait a moment. He says before turning to the monster. What kind of monster are you? You don't seem like a mindless beast. Goketsu looks at Boros, unsure of what the alien is planning, but he decides to answer honestly. I am a former human martial artist. I became a monster after losing to the monster king, Orochi, and being given the chance to gain higher power. Ah, Orochi, I remember him. So, you still think like a human, right? If I tell you you can live as long as you don't cause trouble, you'll understand what I mean and abide by my rules, right? Tatsumaki's eyes widen. You can't be serious. Why would you want to keep this guy around? At this point, I'm starting to think you're gathering an army to take over the world or something. Oh, please. If I wanted to take over the world, I'd do it myself. This guy is far too weak to be of use against people like you. Then why? Boros looks off into the distance. No reason in particular. I suppose I'm just feeling a little nostalgic. Back in the old days, I used to have three generals who served under me. This guy, Phoenix Man and Rover, could be like my own little crew, you know? To remind me of the good old days. Tatsumaki looks at Boros with a raised eyebrow. I thought you hated the old days. But, whatever. I can kill this guy whenever. Do what you want with him. Thanks. Boro says and turns to Goketsu. So, do you accept? I don't have any other choice but to accept. Great. 
But remember, one step out of line and you're dead. Tatsumaki, could you snap his limbs back into place? I'm a fighter, not a healer. Tatsumaki scoffs. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I'll see if Doc Fukuseno can heal him. But anyways, thanks again. Yeah, yeah. I mean it. Thank you for all you've done. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to join the fight again. And besides, something tells me that it's only because of you that the S-Class agreed to hear out my side of the story. Tatsumaki turns away. Whatever, it's no big deal. Boros can't see that while she's saying this, the Esper is hiding a wide smile on her face. Some time passes, and eventually, Tatsumaki and Boros arrive at the Hero HQ. Everyone seems wary as they see a monster passing by their hallways. But no one shows any outward hostility. Eventually, the two heroes enter the main meeting room, and are greeted with a surprising sight. There is a large table set up, and most of the S-Class is sitting at said table. Even Bang and Atomic, still injured, but looking rather well, all things considered. Genos has been let out of his cell beneath the Euro HQ, and is also sitting at the table. Perhaps the most surprising thing is that Saitama and Blast are here too. At the end of the table sits Sitch, Sekingar, and Busho. Welcome, Tornado. Boros. Sit down, please. The two heroes do as they are told. Both of them are a bit tense. There is no need to be worried. Blast has come to me bearing some interesting news. I'd like to hear all the details from you two later, but it seems Boros here has helped save the planet, correct? More than once, sir. Boros responds and sits chuckles, a bit awkwardly. I'd like to hear about the other times at a later date. But for now, I think your actions have proven beyond reasonable doubt that you are on our side. If the first and second ranked heroes are vouching for you, I don't think anyone could do anything about it, even if they wanted to. As such, Boros, you have earned your place at the table. I will be glad to accept you into our ranks as a hero. Sitch pauses for a few moments before continuing. In light of recent events, I have thought quite a lot about how we handle things around here. And after talking to Blast in private, I have decided that some things need to be explained to all of you S-Class heroes. I will let Blast take over from here. Every single hero in the room looks at Blast curiously. This mysterious man, a legend among legends, is here for the first time since the formation of the Hero Association. They are all very much interested in what he has to say. The number one hero steps forward and begins talking. As you already know, I am the S-Class Rank 1 Hero Blast. It is good to finally see you all in person. I am sure many of you have wondered where and why I disappeared. I assure you, there was good reason for it. For the past 20 years, I have been fighting an entity known as God. Blast goes on to explain several key things. How God operates. How he gives people and monsters power. How he can take it away. How he can influence the minds of vulnerable people. He tells them about his own ventures in fighting God, and how he encountered him for the first time directly when fighting Elder Centipede. How he refused the deal of power. Boros interjects as well, quickly explaining about the Monster Association, about the prophecy with Orochi, and Homeless Emperor's power. And of course, he also tells them about how God contacted him and tried to offer him power. Blast then continues his story, about how up until now he thought that hiding the truth from everyone would reduce the risk of monsterization among the S-Class. But now, after recent events, it is clear that even with that, God finds a way to manifest in this world. 
So, just between the S-Class, there can be no more mysteries. God is a very real danger to all of their existence, and BLAST encourages everyone to do their best to become as strong as they can possibly be. For when the time of Shibaba's prophecy comes, they will need everyone at their best. Bless swears to keep fighting with his team and update the S-Class whenever he finds out anything new. And he apologizes for keeping them in the dark for so long. After this speech, Sitch takes over once more. As you can see, we are in desperate need of countermeasures against God. And so... Blast, some association higher-ups and myself have decided that some reconstructing of the hero association is in order. Every S-Class hero will be moved up one rank. Which means Tatsumaki is now the new number one ranked hero. King is second, Silverfang is third, and so on. A few gasps fill the room. Wait, if I'm number one, what happens to Blast then? Don't tell me he's retiring. Tatsumaki asks, as confused as everybody else. That's what we are about to get to. In order to combat God, a new class of hero is to be created. An unofficial, secret class. We do not want panic to rise among the masses, so we're keeping God's existence among us for now until we can find better countermeasures. This secret will be named the God Slayer Unit, and include three individuals who have proven to be beyond the capability of the entire S-Class put together. These men shall all share the position of S-Class, rank zero, and will be the ones we send out in response only to attacks from God. The first one up is Blast. He has been fighting God the longest, and has proven capable of combating his vessels. He will be the captain of this special unit. Next one up is Boros, who, alongside Blast and his comrades, helped take down the Vessel of God that appeared today. He has repeatedly proven himself strong enough to be on this team, and has encountered God directly twice already, so his position here should not be questioned. And finally, the third member of the squad, recommended by Blast, the hero who has yet to show us his full power, but has demonstrated it to blast and earned his respect. Caped Baldy, Saitama. Everyone's eyes widen. Who's the Saitama guy? That's when Mr. Caped Baldy stands up from his chair. You mean I get to be part of this special task force of yours? What's the pay? Higher than the S-Class. Sweet. Okay, I'll join up. Seriously? This twerp? I refuse to believe he's as strong as you say as he is. It's true. He did help us fight off God today. He is also the hero who beat me when I first arrived on Earth. Back then I wasn't so generous. You all would have died if he hadn't intervened. I can also confirm his power. He jumped from the Earth to the Moon like it was nothing and fought alongside Boros and Blast against God's vessel. Everyone quiets down. Bang then speaks up. I know it may be hard to believe, but trust me, I saw his power with my old eyes too. He shattered the meteor that was scheduled to hit City Z. Genos joins in too. Master Saitama has also slain numerous disaster-level demon and dragon-level monsters since I met him. He is definitely the real deal. Everyone thinks hard. Bang, Boros, Tatsumaki, Genos, and Blast are all vouching for Saitama. But it all just sounds so... unbelievable. That's when Boros smirks. Still don't believe us? Then how about we go outside and give you a demonstration? Saitama, you up for a spar? If that'll get these people to believe I'm actually strong, sure. Before we go, I have a question. Shouldn't King be considered for the Godslayer unit as well? Zombie Man asks and Sitch nods. Yes, we did consider him. But with Blast officially retiring, 
We need a few public pillars to keep the association up. King is crucial for that. Therefore, we cannot remove him from the public eye. Consider him an unofficial fourth member of the Godslayer unit while still being in the S-Class. I understand. Zombie Man says, satisfied with the answer. Meanwhile, in another dimension, God is left to his own thoughts after Phoenix Man's defeat. Surprisingly, he doesn't seem bothered by today's loss at all. Phoenix Man was a defective vessel. In the end, it matters not that he lost. Soon, a new, much more powerful vessel shall appear. My only concern is that he might become too strong and win against humanity without needing my blessing. On the other side of the planet, where it's currently nighttime, near the battlefield where Phoenix Man first attained his Firestorm form, a figure crawls out from under the ground. It's a beat-up ninja, Gale. After the death of Hellfire, he hid underground and waited for the chaos around him to end. Thankfully, everyone's attention was too focused on Phoenix Man to spot him. The ninja stands up and starts walking to the nearest forest. Once he reaches the line of trees that was far enough away from Phoenix Man's resurrection to not be burned to a crisp, he sighs. Rest in peace, partner. I swear I shall avenge you. I'll keep training, and eventually grow stronger than anyone. The ninja murmurs to himself, before a chuckle from deep within the woods catches his attention. He quickly takes a fighting stance. Who's there? He shouts into the darkness. A few seconds pass, before he sees Sparkle is in the distance. Show yourself! Gale shouts, and soon, a figure emerges from the woods. It's a tall, shiny humanoid with platinum skin. Who are you? I must admit, seeing you of all people scramble to become the ruler of this world was entertaining. The figure says, ignoring the question. Stay back, or I will kill you where you stand! Gale declares, but the figure just chuckles. But, as fun as your escapades were, you forgot one thing. This world does not belong to you. It is not yours to take. The figure vanishes from sight, and in a moment, Gale's eyes widen as a hand lands on his shoulder, and a voice whispers into his ear. It's mine. Gale starts sweating. This thing is way faster than he is. And now that it's so up close, his ninja instincts are screaming that it's way stronger too. Alright, I admit you're stronger. Please, I can join you and help you achieve your goals. He says with a desperate smile. The figure behind him chuckles again and lets go of his shoulder before walking in front of him. Yes. You will join me, but not in the way you think. Platinum S says before opening his mouth wide. Gale's eyes widen. Wait, what are you doing? Platinum S starts leaning in closer to his prey. No, wait, please! After a few minutes, Platinum S stands up and wipes the blood off of his mouth. Just as I suspected, stronger fighters make for better sustenance. Perhaps I should start going after some of the S-Class heroes soon. He says before looking up at the moon. Boros, you crazy bastard. 
A fight on the moon so high scale that I could see it from here. You never cease to amaze me. But now that you've shown me your full power, I'm certain I can surpass you. The S-Class heroes, Sitch, Sekingar, and Busho line up in a distant canyon far away from civilization. In fact, it's the same place where Genos first fought Saitama, where Boros first fought Genos, and where Tatsumaki spoke to Boros. In the middle of the canyon, the bald hero and the alien stand before each other. Suddenly, Boros powers up, Lightning radiates across the battlefield, and an intense aura forces all the S-Class heroes to shield their eyes. What incredible power! There's no way that Baldi can withstand even a single punch from this guy! Flashy Flash shouts. At the same time, Boro smirks at Saitama. Just like old times, huh? Indeed. I can tell you've gotten better. Let's see how many punches you can take this time. <laughs> That's the spirit, Saitama! Let's go! The two heroes burst at each other, and both wind up a fist. They clash, and the screen fades to black. And that is it for today! I hope you enjoyed this part, and this series as a whole. It's been a ton of fun working on it, thinking of ideas, writing, and so on. I've spent countless hours on it, it's super long. And it's been a very rewarding journey for me, and I hope it was for you too. Now, to be clear, this isn't the end of the story. I have a whole entire arc planned after this, as that little teaser at the end may have, you know, sort of showed already. But I went to take a break for a bit, uh, to focus on other things, while also waiting to potentially get more stuff from the manga to include into the story as well. But regardless of that, that has been it for me today. I wish you an excellent rest of the day. But anyways, thank you for sticking around all the way to the end. And see you next time. Goodbye.